Chapter One of The Untilled Field. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Untilled Field by George Moore. In the Clay. The keen morning air excited the dog's instinct. He hunted the rats through the long grass that grew about the canal with more than usual eagerness, and Rodney watched with more than usual admiration the summer trees reflected in the still water and the white clouds showing through the branches. He thought of his work. His memory of his work was as pleasant as the morning, and he lingered until the first boat passed through the lock and with a mind happy as the clouds, he walked to his studio, thinking of Lucy's beautiful face that he had succeeded in modelling. But when he turned into the mews in which his studio was situated, he saw the woman who he employed to light his fire standing in the middle of the roadway. He could not see her face, but she seemed like one alarmed, and the doors of his studio were wide open. He hastened his steps, and he would have run if he had not been ashamed to betray his fears to the charwoman. I'm afraid someone has been into the studio last night. The hasp was off the door when I came this morning. Some of the things are broken. Rodney heard no more. He stood on the threshold looking round the wrecked studio. Three or four casts had been smashed, the floor was covered with broken plaster, and the lay figure was overthrown. Rodney saw none of these things, he only saw that his virgin and child was not on the modelling stool, and he hoped that the group had been stolen, anything were better than that it should have been destroyed. But the group, now a mere lump of clay, lay on the floor and the modelling stand lay beside it. "'I cannot think,' said the charwoman, "'who has done this. It was a wicked thing to do. Oh, sir, they have broken this beautiful statue that you had in the exhibition last year,' and she picked up the broken fragments of a sleeping girl. "'That doesn't matter,' said Rodney. "'My group is gone. But that, sir, was only in the clay.' May I be helping you to pick it up, sir? It is not broken altogether, perhaps. Rodney waved her aside. He was pale. He could not speak, and he was trembling. He had not the courage to untie the cloths, for he knew there was nothing underneath but clay. And his manner was so strange that the charwoman was frightened. He stood like one dazed by a dream. He could not believe in reality. It was too mad, too discordant, too much like a nightmare. He had only finished the group yesterday. He still called it his virgin and child, but it had never been a virgin and child in the sense suggested by the capital letters, for he had not yet put on the drapery that would convert a naked girl and her baby into the virgin and child. He had of course modelled his group in the nude first, and Harding, who had been with him the night before last, had liked it much better than anything he had done. Harding had said that he must not cover it with draperies, that he must keep it for himself, a naked girl playing with a baby, a piece of paganism. The girl's head was not modelled when Harding had seen it. It was the conventional virgin's head. But Harding had said that he must send for his model and put his model's head upon it. He had taken Harding's advice and had sent for Lucy, and had put her pretty quaint little head upon it. He had done a portrait of Lucy. If this terrible accident had not happened last night, the caster would have come to cast it tomorrow, and then, following Harding's advice, he would have taken a squeeze and when he got it back to the clay again, he would have put on the conventional head and add the conventional draperies and make the group into the conventional virgin and child suitable to Father McCabe's cathedral. 
This was the last statue he would do in Ireland. He was leaving Ireland. On this point his mind was made up, and the money he was going to receive for the statue was the money that was going to take him away. He had had enough of a country where there had never been any sculpture, nor any painting, nor any architecture to signify. They were talking about reviving the Gothic, but Rodney did not believe in their resurrections, or in their renaissance, or in their anything. The Gael has had his day, the Gael is passing, so he had said the night before last to Harding. They had a long talk about the Gael, and he had told Harding that he had given up the School of Art, that he was leaving Ireland, and Harding had thought that this was an extreme step, but he had said that he did not want to die, that no one wanted to die less than he did, but he thought that he would sooner die than go on teaching. He had made some reputation, and had orders that would carry him on for some years, and he was going where he could execute them, to where there were models, to where there was art, to where there was the joy of life, out of a damp religious atmosphere in which nothing flourished but the religious vocation. Good heavens, how happy I was yesterday, full of hope and happiness, my statue finished, and I going to meet Harding in Rome. The blow has fallen in the night. Who had done this? Who has destroyed my statue? He fell into a chair and sat helpless, like his own lay figure, like one on whom some stupor has fallen, and he was as white as one of the castes. The charwoman had never seen anyone give way like that before, and she left the studio quietly. In a little while he got up and mechanically kicked the broken pieces of plaster aside. The charwoman was right, they had broken his sleeping girl. That did not matter much. But the beautiful slenderness, the grace he had caught from Lucy's figure, those slendernesses, those flowing rhythms, all these were gone. The lovely knees were ugly clay. Yes, there was the ruin, the ignoble ruin, and he could not believe in it. He still hoped he would wake and find he had been dreaming. So difficult it is to believe that the living have turned to clay. In front of him there was the cheval glass, and overcome though he was by misfortune, he noticed that he was a small, pale, wiry, and very dark little man, with a large, bony forehead. He had seen, strangely enough, such a bumpy forehead, and such narrow eyes in a Florentine bust, and it was some satisfaction to him to see that he was the typical Italian. If I had lived three hundred years ago, he said, I should have been one of Cellini's apprentices. And yet he was the son of a Dublin builder. His father had never himself thought to draw, but he had always taken an interest in the sculpture and painting, and he had said before Rodney was born that he would like to have a son, a sculptor, and he waited for the little boy to show some signs of artistic aptitude. He pondered every scribble the boy made, and scribbles that any child at the same age could have done filled him with admiration. But when Rodney was fourteen he remodelled some leaves that had failed to please an important customer, and his father was overcome with joy and felt that his hopes were about to be realised, for the customer who professed a certain artistic knowledge praised the leaves that Rodney had designed, and soon after Rodney gave a still further proof of his desire for art by telling his mother he did not care to go to Mass, that Mass depressed him and made him feel unhappy, and he had begged to be allowed to stay at home and do some modelling. His father excused his son's want of religious feeling on the ground that no one can think of two things at once and John was now bent on doing sculpture. He had converted a little loft into a studio, and was at work there from dusk to dusk, and his father used to steal up the ladder from time to time to watch his son's progress. He used to say there was no doubt that he had been forewarned, 
and his wife had to admit that it did seem as if he had had some prevision of his son's genius how else explain the fact that he had said he would like to have a son a sculptor three months before the child was born rodney said he would like to go to the school of art and his father kept him there for two years though he sorely wanted him to help in the business there was no sacrifice that the elder rodney would not have made for his son but rodney knew that he could not always count upon his father's help and one day he realized quite clearly that the only way for him to become a sculptor was by winning scholarships there were two waiting to be won by him and he felt that he would have no difficulty in winning them that year there was a scholarship for twenty five pounds and there was another scholarship that he might win in the following year and he thought of nothing else but these scholarships until he had won them then he started for paris with fifty pounds in his pocket and a resolve in his heart that he would live for a year and pay his fees out of this sum of money those were hard days but they were likewise great days he had been talking to harding about these days in paris the night before last and he had told him of the room at the top of the house for which he had paid thirty francs a month there was a policeman on one side and there was a footman on the other it was a bare little room and he used to live principally on bread in those days his only regret was that he had not the necessary threepence to go to the cafe one can't go to the cafe without threepence to pay for the harmless bock and if one has threepence one can sit in the cafe discussing carpeau rodin and the mysteries until two in the morning when one is at last ejected by an exhausted proprietor at the head of numerous waiters rodney's resolutions were not broken he had managed to live for nearly a year in paris upon fifty pounds and when he came to the end of his money he went to london in search of work he found himself in london with two pounds but he had got work from a sculptor a pupil of dalou's a clever man rodney said a good sculptor it is a pity he died at this time Garvier was in a fair good health and had plenty of orders and besides rodney he employed three italian carvers and from these italians rodney learnt italian and he spent two years in london earning three pounds a week but the time came when the sculptor had no more work for rodney and one day he told him that he would not require him that week there was no work for him nor was there the next week or the next and rodney kicked his heels and pondered elgin marbles for a month then he got a letter from the sculptor saying he had some work for him to do and it was a good job of work and rodney remained with garvier for two months knowing very well that his three pounds a week was precarious fortune some time after the sculptor's health began to fail him and he had to leave london rodney received news of his death two years afterwards he was then teaching sculpture in the art schools of northampton and he wondered whether if garvier had lived he would have succeeded in doing better work than he had done from northampton he went to edinburgh he wandered even as far as inverness from inverness he had been called back to dublin and for seven years he had taught in the school of art saving money every year putting by a small sum of money out of the two hundred pounds that he received from the government and all the money he got for commissions he accepted any commissions he had executed bas reliefs from photographs he was determined to purchase his freedom and a sculptor requires money more than any other artist rodney had always looked upon dublin as a place to escape from he had always desired a country where there was sunshine and sculpture the day his father took him to the school of art he had left his father talking to the headmaster and had wandered away to look at a florentine bust and this first glimpse of italy had convinced him that he must go to italy and study michelangelo and donatello 
Only twice had he relaxed the severity of his rule of life and spent his holidays in Italy. He had gone there with forty pounds in his pocket and had studied art, where art had grown up naturally, independent of government grants and mechanical instruction, in a mountain town like Perugia, and his natural home had seemed to him those narrow white streets streaked with blue shadows. Oh, how blue the shadows are there in the morning, he had said the other night to Harding, and the magnificent sculpture and painting. In the afternoon the sun is too hot, but at evening one stands at the walls of the town and sees sunsets folding and unfolding over Italy. I am at home amid those southern people, and a splendid pagan life is always before one's eyes, ready to one's hand. Beautiful girls and boys, he said, are always knocking at one's doors. Beautiful nakedness abounds. Sculpture is native to the orange zone. The embers of the Renaissance smolder under orange trees. He had never believed in any Celtic Renaissance, and all the talk he had heard about stained glass and the revivals did not deceive him. Let the gale disappear, he said. He is doing it very nicely. Do not interfere with his instinct. His instinct is to disappear in America. Since Cormac's chapel he has built nothing but mud cabins. Since the cross of Kong he has imported virgins from Germany. However, if they want sculpture in this last hour, I will do some for them. And Rodney had designed several altars and had done some religious sculpture, or, as he put it to himself, he had done some sculpture on religious themes. There was no such thing as religious sculpture, and could not be. The moment art, especially sculpture, passed out of the domain of the folk tale, it becomes pagan. One of Rodney's principal patrons was a certain Father McCabe, who had begun life by making an ancient abbey ridiculous by adding a modern steeple. He had ruined two parishes by putting up churches so large that his parishioners could not afford to keep them in repair. All this was many years ago, and the current story was that a great deal of difficulty had been experienced in settling Father McCabe's debts, and that the bishop had threatened to suspend him if he built any more. However this may be, nothing was heard of Father McCabe for fifteen years. He retired entirely into private life. But at his bishop's death he was heard of in the newspapers as the propounder of a scheme for the revival of Irish Romanesque. He had been to America and had collected a large sum of money, and had got permission from his bishop to set an example of what Ireland could do in the line of Cormac's chapel. Rodney had designed an altar for him, and he had also given Rodney a commission for a statue of the Virgin. There were no models in Dublin. There was no nakedness worth a sculptor's while. One of the two fat, unfortunate women that the artists of Dublin had been living upon for the last seven years was in child. The other had gone to England and the memory of them filled Rodney with loathing and contempt and an extraordinary eagerness for Italy. He had been on the point of telling Father McCabe that he could not undertake to do the Virgin and Child because there were no models. He had just stopped in time. He had suddenly remembered that the priest did not know that sculptors used models that he did not know, at all events, that a nude model would be required from which to model a virgin, and he had replied ambiguously, making no promise to do this group before he left Ireland. If I can get a model here, I will do it, he had said to himself. If not, the ecclesiastic will have to wait until I get to Italy. Rodney no more believed in finding a good model in Dublin than he believed in Christianity. But the unexpected had happened. He had discovered in Dublin the most delicious model that had ever enchanted a sculptor's eyes. And this extraordinary good fortune had happened in the simplest way. 
He had gone to a solicitor's office to sign an agreement for one of Father McCabe's altars, and as he came in he saw a girl rise from her typewriting machine. There was a strange idle rhythm in her walk as she crossed the office, and Rodney, as he stood watching her, divined long tapering legs and a sinuous back. He did not know what her face was like. Before she had time to turn round, Mr. Lawrence had called him into his office, and he had been let out by a private door. Rodney had been dreaming of a good model, of the true proportions and delicate articulations that, in Paris and Italy, are knocking at your door all day. And this was the very model he wanted, for his girl feeding chickens, and for his virgin. And he thought of several other things he might do from her. But he might as well wish for a star out of heaven, for if he were to ask that girl to sit for him, she would probably scream with horror. She would run to her confessor, and the clergy would be up in arms. Rodney had put the girl out of his head, and had gone on with his design for an altar. But luck had followed him for this long while, and a few days afterwards he had met the pretty clerk in a tea-room. He had not seen her face before, and he did not know who it was until she turned to go, and as she was paying for her tea at the desk, he asked her if Mr. Lawrence were in town. He could see that she was pleased at being spoken to. Her eyes were alert, and she told him that she knew he was doing altars for Father McCabe, and Father McCabe was a cousin of hers, and her father had a cheesemonger's shop, and their back windows overlooked the mews in which Rodney had his studio. How late you work! Sometimes your light does not go out until twelve o'clock at night. Henceforth he met her at tea in the afternoons and they went to the museum together, and she promised to try to get leave from her father and mother to sit to him for a bust. But she could only sit to him for an hour or two before she went to Mr. Lawrence, and Rodney said that she would be doing him an extraordinary favour if she would get up some hours earlier and sit to him from eight till ten. It was amusing to do the bust, but the bust was only a pretext. What he wanted her to do was to sit for the nude, and he could not help trying to persuade her, though he did not believe for a moment that he would succeed. He took her to the museum, and he showed her the nude, and told her how great ladies sat for painters in the old times. He prepared the way very carefully, and when the bust was finished he told her suddenly that he must go to a country where he could get models. He could see she was disappointed at losing him, and he asked her if she would sit. You don't want a nude model for our blessed lady, do you? There was a look, half of hesitation, half of pleasure, and he knew that she would sit to him, and he guessed she would have sat to him long ago if he had asked her. No doubt his long delay in asking her to sit had made her fear he did not think her figure a good one. He had never had such a model before, not in France or in Italy, and this time he had done the best piece of work he had ever done in his life. Harding had seen it, and had said that it was the best piece that he had done. Harding had said that he would buy it from him if he got rid of the conventional head, and when Harding had left him, he had lain awake all night thinking how he could model Lucy's head, and he was up and ready for her at eight, and had done the best head he had ever done in his life. Good God, that head was now flattened out, and the child was probably thrown back over the shoulders. Nothing remained of his statue. He had not the strength to do or to think. He was like a lay figure without strength for anything, and if he were to hear that an earthquake was shaking Dublin into ruins, he would not care. Shake the whole town into the sea, he would have said. The charwoman had closed the door, and he did not hear Lucy until she was in the studio. I have come to tell you that I cannot sit again. But what happened? 
Rodney got up, and she could see that his misfortune was greater than hers. Who has done this? she said. Your costs are all broken. Who indeed has done this? Who broke them? What has happened? Tell me. They have broken the bust you did of me, and the statue of the Virgin. Has anything happened to that? The statue of the Virgin is a lump of clay. Oh, don't look at it. I am out of my mind. She took two or three steps forward. There it is, she said. Yes, there it is, he said. Don't speak about it. Don't touch it. Something may be left. No, nothing is left. Don't look at me that way. I tell you nothing is left. It is a lump of clay, and I cannot do it again. I feel as if I never could do a piece of sculpture again, as if I never wanted to. But what are you thinking of? You said just now that you could not sit to me again. Tell me, Lucy, and tell me quickly. I can see you know something about this. You suspect someone. No, I suspect no one. It is very strange. You were going to tell me something when you came in. You said you could not sit to me again. Why is that? Because they have found out everything at home that I sat for you, for the Virgin. But they don't know that. Yes, they do. They know everything. Father McCabe came in last night, just after we had closed the shop. It was I who let him in. And Mother was sorry. She knew he had come to ask Father for a subscription to his church. But I had said that Father and Mother were at home, and when I brought him upstairs, and we got into the light, he stood looking at me. He had not seen me for some years, and I thought at first it was because he saw me grown up. He sat down and began to talk to father and mother about his church and the altars he had ordered for it, and the statues. And then he said that you were doing a statue for him, and mother said that she knew you very well, and that you sometimes came to spend an evening with us, and that I sat to you. It was then that I saw him give a start. Unfortunately, I was sitting under a lamp reading a book, and the light was full upon my face, and he had a good view of it. I could see that he recognized me at once. You must have shown him the statue. It was yesterday you changed the head. You had not gone an hour when he called, and I had not covered up the group. Now I am beginning to see the light. He came here anxious to discuss every sort of thing with me, the Irish Romanesque, the Celtic Renaissance, stained glass, the possibility of rebuilding another Cormac's chapel. He sat warming his shins before the stove, and I thought he would have gone on for ever arguing about the possibility of returning to origins of art. I had to stop him. He was wasting all my day, and I brought over that table to show him my design for the altar. He said it was not large enough, and he took hours to explain how much room the priest would require for his book and his chalice. I thought I should never have got rid of him. He wanted to know about the statue of the Virgin, and he was not satisfied when I told him it was not finished. He prowled about the studio, looking into everything. I had sent him a sketch for the Virgin and Child, and he recognized the pose as the same, and he began to argue. I told him that sculptors always use models, and that even a draped figure had to be done from the nude first, and that the drapery went on afterwards. It was foolish to tell him these things, but one is tempted to tread on their ignorance, their bigotry. All they say and do is based on hatred of life. Iconoclast and peasant, he sent some religious besotted slave to break my statue. I don't think Father McCabe would have done that. He has got me into a great deal of trouble, but you are wronging him. He would not get a ruffian to break into your studio. Rodney and Lucy stood looking at each other and she had spoken with such conviction that he felt she might be right. 
but who else could do it except the priest no one had any interest in having it done except the priest he as much as told me that he would never get any pleasure from the statue now that he knew it had been done from a naked woman he went away thinking it out ireland is emptying before them by god it must have been he now it all comes back to me he as much as said that something of the temptation of the naked woman would transpire through the draperies he said that he said that it would be a very awful thing if the temptations of the flesh were to transpire through the draperies of the virgin from the beginning they have looked upon women as unclean things they have hated women women have to cover up their heads before they go into the churches everything is impure in their eyes in their impure eyes whereas i saw nothing in you but loveliness he was shocked by those round tapering legs and would have liked to curse them and the dainty design of the hips the beautiful little hips and the breasts curved like shells that i modelled so well it is he who blasphemes they blaspheme against life my god what a vile thing is the religious mind and all the love and veneration that went into that statue there it is only a lump of clay i am sure you are wronging father tom he has his faults but he would not do such a thing as that yes said rodney he would i know them better than you i know the creed but you did not finish your story tell me what happened when he began to suspect that you sat for the statue he asked me if i had seen the statue of the virgin in your studio i grew red all over i could not answer him and mother said why don't you answer father tom i could see from his manner that he knew i had sat for the statue and then he said he wanted to speak to father and mother mother said i had read enough that i had better go to bed and you went out of the room knowing what the priest was going to say said rodney melting into sympathy for the first time and then i waited on the stairs for a little while long enough to make sure that he was telling them that i had sat for the statue i heard the door open father came out they talked on the landing i fled into my room and locked the door and just as i locked the door i heard father say my daughter you're insulting my daughter you know father is suffering from stone and mother said if you don't stop i shall be up with you all night and so she was all the night i heard father moaning and to-day he is so ill the doctor is with him and he has been taken to hospital and mother says when he leaves the hospital he will turn me out of the house well said rodney great misfortunes have happened to us both it was a cruel thing of the priest to tell your father that you sat for me but to pay someone to wreck my studio lucy begged of him not to believe too easily that father mccabe had done this he must wait a little while and he had better communicate with the police they would be able to find out who had done it now she said i must go he glanced at the rags that had once covered his statue but he had not the courage to undo them if his statue had been cast the ruin would not be so irreparable it could be put together in some sort of way who could have done it but the priest it was difficult to believe that a priest could do such a thing that anyone could do such a thing it was an inhuman thing to do he might go to the police as lucy had suggested and the police would inquire the matter out but would that be of any satisfaction a wretched fine a few days imprisonment of one thing he was sure that nowhere except in ireland could such a thing happen thank god he was going there was at least satisfaction in knowing that only twelve hours of ireland remained 
Tomorrow evening he would be in Paris. He would leave the studio as it was. Maybe he might take a few busts and sketches, a few books and a few pictures. He must take some of them with him, and he tried to formulate some plan. But he could not collect his thoughts sufficiently to think out the details. Would there be time to have a case made, or could he leave them to be sold, or should he give orders that they should be sent after him? At that moment his eyes went towards the lump of clay, and he wished that he had asked the charwoman to take it out of his studio. He thought of it as one thinks of a corpse, and he took down a few books and tied them up with a string, and then forgot what he was doing. He and his country were two thousand years apart, and would always be two thousand years apart. And then, growing superstitious, he wondered if his country had punished him for his contempt. There was something extraordinarily fateful in the accident that had happened to him. Such an accident had never happened to anyone before. A most singular accident. He stood looking through the studio, unable to go on with his packing, thinking of what Harding and he had been saying to each other. The Celtic Renaissance, Harding believed, or was inclined to believe, that the gale was not destined to disappear, that in making the cross of Kong he had not got as far as he was intended to get. But even Harding had admitted that no race had taken to religion quite so seriously as the Celt. The Druids had put aside the oak leaves and put on the Beretta. There had never been a religious revolution in Ireland. In the fifth and sixth centuries all the intelligence of Ireland had gone into religion. Ireland is immersed in the religious vocation, and there can be no renaissance without a religious revolt. The door of the studio opened. It was Lucy, and he wondered what she had come back for. It wasn't Father Tom. I knew it wasn't, she said. Do you know who it was, then? Yes. My brothers, Pat and Tig. Pat and Tig broke my statue? But what did they do that for? What did I ever do to them? I saw them whispering together. I could see they had a secret. Something inspired me, and when Tig went out, I got Pat by himself, and I coaxed him, and I frightened him. I told him that things had been broken in your studio and that the police were making inquiries. I saw at once that he knew all about it. He got frightened, and he told me that last night when I went to my room, he and Tig had come out of their room and listened on the stairs. They did not understand everything that was said. They only understood that I had sat for a statue, and that the priest did not wish to put it up in his church and that perhaps he would have to pay for it, and if he did not, the bishop would suspend him. You know there has always been talk about Father Tom's debts. They got talking, and Tig said he would like to see the statue, and he persuaded Pat to follow him, and they climbed along the wall and dropped into the mews, and got the hasp off the door with the kitchen poker. But why did they break the statue? said Rodney. I don't think they know why themselves. I tried to get Pat to tell me, but all he could tell me was that he had bumped against a woman with a cloak on. My lay figure. And in trying to get out of the studio, they had knocked down a bust. And after they had done that, Tig said, We had better have down this one. The priest does not like it, and if we have it down, he won't have to pay for it. They must have heard the priest saying that he did not want the statue. Very likely they did, but I am sure the priest never said that he wanted the statue broken. Oh, it is a great muddle, said Rodney, but there it is. My statue is broken. Two little boys have broken it. Two little boys who overheard a priest talking nonsense and did not quite understand. I am going away tonight. Then I shall not see you again. And you said I was a good model. Her meaning was clear to him. He remembered how he had stood in the midst of his sculpture, 
asking himself what a man is to do when a girl, walking with a walk at once idle and rhythmical, stops suddenly and puts her hand on his shoulder and looks up into his face. He had sworn he would not kiss her again, and he had broken his oath. But the desire of her as a model had overborne every other desire. Now he was going away for ever, and his heart told him that she was as sweet a thing as he would find all the world over. But if he took her with him, he would have to look after her till the end of his life. This was not his vocation. His hesitation endured but a moment, if he hesitated at all. You'd like to go away with me, but what would I do with you? I'm thirty-five, and you're sixteen. He could see that the difference of age did not strike her. She was not looking into the remote future. I don't think, Lucy, your destiny is to watch me making statues. Your destiny is a gayer one than that. You want to play the piano, don't you? I should have gone to Germany to study, and I have no money. Well, she said, I must go back now. I just came to tell you who had wrecked your studio. Goodbye. It has all been an unlucky business for both of us. A beautiful model, Rodney said to himself as he watched her going up the mews. But there are other girls just as good in Paris and in Rome. And he remembered one who had sat to him in Paris, and this gave him courage. So it was two little boys, he said, who wrecked my studio. Two stupid little boys. Two little boys who have been taught their catechism and will one day aspire to the priesthood. And that it should be two stupid little boys who had broken his statue seemed significant. Oh, the ignorance, the crass, the patent ignorance. I am going. This is no place for a sculptor to live in. It is no country for an educated man. It won't be fit for a man to live in for another hundred years. It is an unwashed country. End of In the Clay Chapter Two, Part One of *The Untilled Field* by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Some Parishioners, Part One, Section One. The way before Father Maguire was plain enough, yet his uncle's apathy and constitutional infirmity of purpose seemed at times to thwart him. Some two or three days ago he had come running down from Kilmore with the news that a baby had been born out of wedlock, and Father Stafford had shown no desire that his curate should denounce the girl from the altar. The greatest saints, he said, have been kind and have found excuses for the sins of others. And a few days later, when he told his uncle that the Salvationists had come to Kilmore, and that he had walked up the village street and slit their drum with a carving knife, his uncle had not approved of his conduct, and what had especially annoyed Father Tom was that his uncle seemed to deplore the slitting of the drum in the same way as he deplored that the Kavanaghs had a barrel of porter in every Saturday as one of those regrettable excesses to which human nature is liable. On being pressed, he had agreed with his nephew that dancing and drinking were no preparation for the Sabbath, but he would not agree that evil could be suppressed by force. He had even hinted that too strict a rule brought about a revolt against the rule. And when Father Tom had expressed his disbelief at any revolt against the authority of the priest, Father Stafford said, They may just leave you. They may just go to America. Then you think that it is our condemnation of sin that is driving the people to America? My dear Tom, 
you told me the other day that you met a lad and a lass walking along the roadside and that you drove them home you told me that you were sure they were talking about things they should not talk about you have no right to assume these things you're asking of the people an abstinence you don't practice yourself sometimes your friends are women yes but father tom's anger prevented him from finding an adequate argument father stafford pushed the tobacco bowl towards his nephew you're not smoking tom your point is that a certain amount of vice is inherent in human nature and that if we raise the standard of virtuous living our people will escape from us to new york or london the sexes mix freely everywhere in western europe only in ireland and turkey is there any attempt made to separate them later in the evening father tom insisted that the measure of responsibility was always the same i should be sorry said his uncle to say that those who inherit drunkenness bear the same burden of responsibility as those who come of parents who are quite sane you cannot deny uncle john that free will and predestination my dear tom i really must go to bed it is after midnight as he walked home father maguire thought of the great change he perceived in his uncle father stafford liked to go to bed at eleven the very name of st thomas seemed to bore him fifteen years ago he would sit up till morning father maguire remembered the theological debates sometimes prolonged till after three o'clock and the passionate scholiast of manuth seemed to him unrecognizable in the assurient vicar-general only occasionally interested in theology at certain hours and when he felt particularly well he could not reconcile the two ages his mind not being sufficiently acute to see that after all no one can discuss theology for more than five-and-twenty years without wearying of the subject the moon was shining among the hills and the mystery of the landscape seemed to aggravate his sensibility and he asked himself if the guardians of the people should not fling themselves into the forefront of the battle men came to preach heresy in his parish was he not justified in slitting their drum he had recourse to prayer and he prayed for strength and for guidance he had accepted the church and in the church he saw only apathy neglect and bad administration on the part of his superiors he had read that great virtues are like large sums of money deposited in the bank whereas humility is like the pence always at hand always current obedience to our superiors is the sure path he could not persuade himself that it was right for him to allow the kavanaghs to continue a dissolute life of drinking and dancing they were the talk of the parish and he would have spoken against them from the altar but his uncle had advised him not to do so perhaps his uncle was right he might be right regarding the kavanaghs in the main he disagreed with his uncle but in this particular instance it might be well to wait and pray that matters might improve father tom believed ned kavanagh to be a good boy ned was going to marry mary byrne and father tom had made up this marriage the burns did not care for the marriage they were prejudiced against ned on account of his family but he was not going to allow them to break off the marriage he was sure of ned but in order to make quite sure he would get him to take the pledge next morning when the priest had done his breakfast the servant opened the door and told him that ned kavanagh was outside and wanted to see him it was a pleasure to look at this nice clean boy with his winning smile and the priest thought that mary could not wish for a better husband the priest had done his breakfast and was about to open his newspaper but he wanted to see ned kavanagh and he told his servant to let him in 
Ned's smile seemed a little fainter than usual, and his face was paler. The priest wondered, and presently Ned told the priest that he had come to confession, and going down on his knees he told the priest that he had been drunk last Saturday night, and that he had come to take the pledge. He would never do any good while he was at home, and one of the reasons he gave for wishing to marry Mary Byrne was his desire to leave home. The priest asked him if matters were mending, and if his sister showed any signs of wishing to be married. Sora sign, said Ned. That's bad news you're bringing me, said the priest, and he walked up and down the room, and they talked over Kate's willful character. From the beginning she did not like living at home, said the priest. I don't care about living at home, said Ned, but for a different reason, said the priest. You want to leave home to get married and have a wife and children, if God is pleased to give you children. Kate had been in numerous services, and the priest sat thinking of the stories he had heard. He had heard that Kate had come back from her last situation in a cab, wrapped up in blankets, saying she was ill. On inquiry it was found that she had only been three or four days in her situation. Three weeks had to be accounted for. He had questioned her himself regarding this interval, but had not been able to get any clear and definite answer from her. She and mother never stop quarrelling about Pat Connix. It appears, said the priest, that your mother went out with a jug of porter under her apron and offered a sup of it to Pat Connix, who was talking with Peter McShane. And now he is up at your cabin every Saturday. That's it, said Ned. Mrs. Connex was here the other day, and I can tell you that if Pat marries your sister, he will find himself cut off with a shilling. She's been agin us all the while, said Ned. Her money has made her proud, but I don't blame her. If I had had the fine house she has, maybe I would be as proud as she. Maybe you would, said the priest, but what I am thinking of is your sister Kate. She will never get Pat Connix. Pat will never go against his mother. Well, you see, he comes up and plays the melodeon on Saturday night, said Ned, and she can't stop him from doing that. Then you think, said the priest, that Pat will marry your sister? I don't think she wants to marry him. If she doesn't want to marry him, what's all this talk about? She likes to meet Pat in the evenings and go for a walk with him, and she likes him to put his arm around her waist and kiss her, saving your reverence's presence. It is strange that you should be so unlike. You come here and ask me to speak to Mary Byrne's parents for you, and that I'll do, Ned, and it will be all right. You will make a good husband, and though you were drunk last night, you have taken the pledge today and I will make a good marriage for Kate too, if she'll listen to me. And who may your reverence be thinking of? I'm thinking of Peter McShane. He gets as much as six shillings a week, and his keep on Murphy's farm, and his mother has got a bit of money, and they have a nice clean cabin. Now listen to me. There is a poultry lecture at the schoolhouse tonight, do you think you could bring your sister with you? We used to keep a great many hens at home, and Kate had the feeding of them, and now she's turned agin them, and she wants to live in town, and she even tells Pat Connix she would not marry a farmer, however much he was worth. But if you tell her that Pat Connix will be at the lecture, will she come? Yes, your reverence, if she believes me. Then do as I bid you, said the priest. You can tell her that Pat Connix will be there. Section 2 After leaving the priest, Ned crossed over the road to avoid the public house. He went for a walk on the hills, and it was about five when he turned towards the village. 
On his way there he met his father, and Ned told him that he had been to see the priest, and that he was going to take Mary to the lecture. Michael Kavanagh wished his son Godspeed. He was very tired, and he thought it was pretty hard to come home after a long day's work to find his wife and daughter quarrelling. I am sorry your dinner is not ready, father, but it won't be long now. I'll cut the bacon. I met Ned on the road, said her father. He has gone to fetch Mary. He is going to take her to the lecture on poultry keeping at the schoolhouse. Ah, he has been to the priest, has he? said Kate, and her mother asked her why she said that, and the wrangle began again. Ned was the peacemaker. There was generally quiet in the cabin when he was there. He came in with Mary, a small fair girl and a good girl who would keep his cabin tidy. His mother and sisters were broad-shouldered women with blue-black hair and red cheeks, and it was said that he had said he would like to bring a little fair hair into the family. "'We've just come in for a minute,' said Mary. Ned said that perhaps you would be coming with us. All the boys in the village will be there tonight, said Ned. You had better come with us. And pretending he wanted to get a coal of fire to light his pipe, Ned whispered to Kate as he passed her, Pat Connix will be there. She looked at the striped sunshade she had brought back from the dressmakers. She had once been apprenticed to a dressmaker. But Ned said that the storm was blowing, and she had better leave the sunshade behind. The rain beat in their faces, and the wind came sweeping down the mountain and made them stagger. Sometimes the road went straight on, sometimes it turned suddenly and went uphill. After walking for a mile they came to the schoolhouse. A number of men were waiting outside, and one of the boys told them that the priest had said they were to keep a lookout for the lecturer, and Ned said that he had better stay with them, that his lantern would be useful to show her the way. They went into a long, smoky room. The women had collected into one corner, and the priest was walking up and down, his hands thrust into the pockets of his overcoat. Now he stopped in his walk to scold two children who were trying to light a peat fire in a tumble-down grate. Don't be tired, go on blowing, he said. You are the laziest child I have ever seen this long while. Ned came in and blew out his lantern, but the lady he had mistaken for the lecturer was a lady who had come to live in the neighbourhood lately, and the priest said, You must be very much interested in poultry, ma'am, to come out on such a night as this. The lady stood shaking her waterproof. Now then, Lizzie, run to your mother and get the lady a chair. And when the child came back with the chair and the lady was seated by the fire, he said, I'm thinking there will be no lecture here tonight, and that it would be kind of you if you were to give the lecture yourself. You have read some books about poultry, I am sure. Well, a little, but... Oh, that doesn't matter, said the priest. I'm sure the book you have read is full of instruction. He walked up the room towards a group of men and told them they must cease talking and coming back to the young woman, he said, We shall be much obliged if you will say a few words about poultry. Just say what you have in your mind about the different breeds. The young woman again protested, but the priest said, You will do it very nicely and he spoke like one who is not accustomed to being disobeyed. We will give the lecturer five minutes more. Is there no farmer's wife who could speak? The young lady said in a fluttering voice. She would know much more than I. I see Biddy McHale there. She has done very well with her poultry. I dare say she has, said the priest, but the people would pay no attention to her. She is one of themselves. It would be no amusement to them to hear her. The young lady asked if she might have five minutes to scribble a few notes. The priest said he would wait a few minutes, but it did not matter much what she said. 
but couldn't someone dance or sing said the young lady dancing and singing said the priest no and the young lady hurriedly scribbled a few notes about fowls for laying fowls for fattening regular feeding warm houses and something about a percentage of mineral matter she had not half finished when the priest said now will you stand over there near the harmonium whom shall i announce the young woman told him her name and he led her to the harmonium and left her talking addressing most of her instruction to biddy McHale, a long thin pale-faced woman with wistful eyes this won't do said the priest interrupting the lecturer i'm not speaking to you miss but to my people i don't see one of you taking notes not even you biddy McHale, though you have made a fortune out of your hins didn't i tell you from the pulpit that you were to bring a pencil and paper and write down all you heard if you had known years ago all this young lady is going to tell you you would be rolling in your carriages today then the priest asked the lecturer to go on and the lady explained that to get hens to lay about christmas time when eggs fetch the breast price you must bring on your pullets early you must she said set your eggs in january you hear that said the priest is there anyone who has got anything to say about that why is it that you don't set your eggs in january no one answered and the lecturer went on to tell of the advantages that would come to the poultry keeper whose eggs were hatched in december as she said this the priest's eye fell on biddy McHale, and seeing that she was smiling he asked her if there was any reason why eggs could not be hatched in the beginning of january now biddy you must know all about this and i insist on your telling us we are here to learn biddy did not answer then what are you smiling at i wasn't smiling your reverence yes i saw you smiling is it because you think there isn't a brooding hen in january it had not occurred to the lecturer that hens might not be brooding so early in the year and she waited anxiously at last biddy said well your reverence it isn't because there are no hens brooding you'll get brooding hens at every time in the year but you see you can't rear chickens earlier than march the end of february is the earliest i have ever seen but of course if you could rear them in january all that the young lady said would be quite right i have nothing to say again it i have no fault to find with anything she says your reverence only that it can't be done said the priest well you ought to know biddy the villagers were laughing that will do said the priest i don't mind your having a bit of amusement but you're here to learn and as he looked around the room quieting the villagers into silence his eyes fell on kate that's all right he thought and he looked for the others and spied pat connix and peter mcshane near the door they are here too he thought when the lecture is over i will see them and bring them all together kate kavanagh won't go home until she promises to marry peter i've had enough of her goings-on in my parish but kate had caught sight of peter she would get no walk home with pat that night and she suspected her brother of having done this for a purpose she got up to go i don't want anyone to leave this room said the priest kate kavanagh why are you going sit down till the lecture is over and as kate had not strength to defy the priest she sat down and the lecturer continued for a little while longer the priest could see that the lecturer had said nearly all she had to say and he had begun to wonder how the evening's amusement was to be prolonged it would not do to let the people go home until michael dunn had closed his public-house and the priest looked around the audience thinking which one he might call upon to say a few words on the subject of poultry-keeping 
From one of the back rows a voice was heard. What about the pump, your reverence? Well, indeed, you may ask, said the priest, and immediately he began to speak of the wrong they had suffered by not having a pump in the village. The fact that the Almighty God had endowed Kilmore with a hundred mountain streams did not release the authorities from the obligation of supplying the village with a pump. Had not the authorities put up one in the neighbouring village? You should come out, he said, and fight for your rights. You should take off your coats like men, and if you do, I'll see that you get your rights. And he looked round for someone to speak. There was a landlord among the audience, and as he was a Catholic, the priest called upon him to speak. He said that he agreed with the priest in the main. They should have their pump if they wanted a pump. If they didn't, he would suggest that they asked for something else. Farmer Byrne said he did not want a pump, and then everyone spoke his mind, and things got mixed. The Catholic landlord regretted that Father Maguire was against allowing a poultry yard to the patients in the lunatic asylum. If, instead of supplying a pump, the government would sell them eggs for hatching at a low price, something might be gained. If the government would not do this, the government might be induced to supply books on poultry, free of charge. It took the Catholic landlord half an hour to express his ideas regarding the asylum, the pump, and the duties of the government, and in this way the priest succeeded in delaying the departure of the audience till after closing time. However fast they walk, he said to himself, they won't get to Michael Dunn's public house in ten minutes, and he will be shut by then. It devolved upon him to bring the evening's amusement to a close with a few remarks, and he said, Now, the last words I have to say to you I'll address to the women. Now listen to me. If you pay more attention to your poultry, you'll never be short of half a sovereign to lend your husbands, your sons, or your brothers. These last words produced an approving shuffling of feet in one corner of the room, and seeing that nothing more was going to happen, the villagers got up, and they went out very slowly, the women curtsying and the men lifting their caps to the priest as they passed him. He had signed to Ned and Mary that he wished to speak to them, and after he had spoken to Ned, he called Kate and reminded her that he had not seen her at confession lately. Pat Connex and Peter McShane, now don't you be going. I will have a word with you presently. And while Kate tried to find an excuse to account for her absence from confession, the priest called to Ned and Mary, who were talking at a little distance. He told them he would be waiting for them in church tomorrow, and he said he had never made a marriage that gave him more pleasure. He alluded to the fact that they had come to him. He was responsible for this match, and he accepted the responsibility gladly. His uncle, the vicar general, had delegated all the work of the parish to him. Father Stafford, he said abruptly, will be very glad to hear of your marriage, Kate Kavanagh. My marriage, said Kate. I don't think I shall ever be married. Now why do you say that, said the priest. Kate did not know why she had said that she would never be married. However, she had to give some reason, and she said, I don't think, your reverence, anyone would have me. You are not speaking your mind, said the priest, a little sternly. It is said that you don't want to be married, that you like courting better. I'd like to be married well enough, said Kate. Those who wish to make safe, reliable marriages consult their parents, they consult the priest. I have made your brother's marriage for him. Why don't you come to me and ask me to make up a marriage for you? I think a girl should make her own marriage, your reverence. And what way do you go about making up a marriage? Walking about the roads in the evening and going into the public houses and leaving your situations? It seems to me, Kate Kavanagh, you have been a long time making up this marriage. Now, Pat Connex, I've got a word with you. 
you're a good boy and i know you don't mean any harm by it but i have been hearing tales about you you've been up to dublin with kate kavanagh your mother came up to speak to me about this matter yesterday and she said not a penny of my money will he ever get if he marries her meaning the girl before you your mother said i've got nothing to say against her but i've got a right to choose my own daughter-in-law these are your mother's very words pat so you had better listen to reason do you hear me kate i hear your reverence and if you hear me what have you got to say to that he's free to go after the girl he chooses your reverence said kate there's been courting enough the priest said if you aren't going to be married you must give up keeping company i see paddy boyle outside the door go home with him do you hear what i'm saying pat go straight home and no stopping about the roads just do as i bid you go straight home to your mother pat did not move at the bidding of the priest he stood watching kate as if he were waiting for a sign from her but kate did not look at him do you hear what i'm saying to you said the priest yes i hear said pat and aren't you going said the priest everyone was afraid pat would raise his hand against the priest and they looked such strong men both of them that everyone wondered which would get the better of the other you won't go home when i tell you to do so we will see if i can't put you out of the door then if you weren't a priest said pat the devil a bit you would put me out of the door if i weren't a priest i would break every bone in your body for talking to me like that now out you go he said taking him by the collar and he put him out and now kate governor said the priest coming back from the door you said you didn't marry because no man would have you peter has been waiting for you ever since you were a girl of sixteen years old and i may say it for him since he doesn't say much himself that you have nearly broken his heart i'm sure i never meant it i like peter you acted out of recklessness without knowing what you were doing a continual smile floated round peter's moustache and he looked like a man to whom rebuffs made no difference his eyes were patient and docile and whether it was the presence of this great and true love by her side or whether it was the presence of the priest kate did not know but a great change came over her and she said i know that peter has been very good that he has cared for me this long while if he wishes to make me his wife when kate gave him her hand there was a mist in his eyes and he stood trembling before her End of Some Parishioners, Part 1「Two, Part Two of The Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Some Parishioners, Part Two. Section Three. Next morning, as Father Maguire was leaving the house, his servant handed him a letter. It was from an architect who had been down to examine the walls of the church. The envelope that Father Maguire was tearing open contained his report, and Father Maguire read that it would require two hundred pounds to make the walls secure. Father Maguire was going round to the church to marry Mary Byrne and Ned Kavanagh, and he continued to read the report until he arrived at the church. The wedding party was waiting, but the architect's report was much more important than a wedding and he wandered round the old walls examining the cracks as he went he could see they were crumbling and he believed the architect was right and that it would be better to build a new church but to build a new church three or four thousand pounds would be required 
and the architect might as well suggest that he should collect three or four millions. And Ned and Mary noticed the dark look between the priest's eyes as he came out of the sacristy, and Ned regretted that his reverence should be out of his humour that morning, for he had spent three out of the five pounds he had saved to pay the priest for marrying him. He had cherished hopes that the priest would understand that he had to buy some new clothes. But the priest looked so cross that it was with difficulty he summoned courage to tell him that he had only two pounds left. I want two hundred pounds to make the walls of the church safe. Where is the money to come from? All the money in Kilmore goes into drink and, he added bitterly, into blue trousers. No, I won't marry you for two pounds. I won't marry you for less than five. I will marry you for nothing, or I will marry you for five pounds, he added. And Ned looked round the wedding guests. He knew that none of them had five shillings in his pocket, and he did not dare to take the priest at his word and let him marry him for nothing. Father Maguire felt that his temper had got the better of him, but it was too late to go back on what he said. Marry them for two pounds with the architect's letter in the pocket of his cassock? And if he were to accept two pounds, who would pay five to be married? If he did not stand out for his dues, the marriage fee would be reduced from five pounds to one pound. And if he accepted Ned's two pounds, his authority would be weakened he would not be able to get them to subscribe to have the church made safe. On the whole, he thought he had done right, and his servant was of the same opinion. They'd have the cassock off your back, your reverence, if they could get it. And the architect writing to me that the walls can't be made safe under two hundred pounds, and the whole lot of them earning not less than thirty shillings a week, and they can't pay the priest five pounds for marrying them? In the course of the day, he went to Dublin to see the architect, and the next morning it occurred to him that he might have to go to America to get the money to build a new church. And as he sat thinking, the door was opened, and the servant said that Biddy MacHale wanted to see his reverence. She came in curtsying, and before saying a word, she took ten sovereigns out of her pocket and put them upon the table. The priest thought she had heard of the architect's report, and he said, Now, Biddy, I am glad to see you. I suppose you have brought me this for my church. You have heard of the money it will cost to make the walls safe. No, your reverence, I did not hear any more than that there were cracks in the walls. But you have brought me this money to have the cracks mended? Well, no, your reverence, I have been thinking a long time of doing something for the church, and I thought I should like to have a window put up in the church with coloured glass in it. Father Maguire was touched by Biddy's desire to do something for the church and he thought he would have no difficulty in persuading her. He could get this money for the repairs, and he told her that her name would be put on top of the subscription list. A subscription from Miss McHale, ten pounds. A subscription from Miss McHale. But he did not answer, and the priest could see that it would give her no pleasure whatever to subscribe to mending the walls of his church and it annoyed him to see her sitting in his own chair, stretching out her hands to take the money back. He could see that her wish to benefit the church was merely a pretext for the glorification of herself, and the priest began to argue with the old woman. But he might have spared himself the trouble of explaining that it was necessary to have a new church before you could have a window. She understood well enough it was useless to put a window in a church that was going to fall down. But her idea still was, St. Joseph in a red cloak and the Virgin in blue with a crown of gold on her head. And forgetful of everything else, she asked him whether her window in the new church should be put over the high altar or if it should be a window lighting a side altar. 
but my good woman ten pounds will not pay for a window you couldn't get anything to speak of in the way of a window for less than fifty pounds he had expected to astonish biddy but she did not seem astonished she said that although fifty pounds was a great deal of money she would not mind spending all that money if she were to have her window all to herself she had thought at first of only putting in part of the window a round piece at the top of the window and she had thought that that could be bought for ten pounds the priest could see that she had been thinking a good deal of this window and she seemed to know more about it than he expected it is extraordinary he said to himself how a desire of immortality persecutes these second-class souls a desire of temporal immortality he said fearing he had been guilty of a heresy if i could have the whole window to myself i would give you fifty pounds your reverence the priest had no idea she had saved as much money as that the hins have been very good to me your reverence and i would like to put up the window in the new church better than in the old church but i've got no money my good woman to build the church ah won't your reverence go to america and get the money aren't our own kith and kin over there and aren't they always willing to give us money for our churches the priest spoke to her about statues and suggested that perhaps the statue would be a more permanent gift but the old woman knew that stained glass was more permanent and that it could be secured from breakage by means of wire netting do you know biddy it will require three or four thousand pounds to build a new church if i go to america and do my best to get the money how much will you help me with does your reverence mean for the window no biddy i was thinking of the church itself and biddy said that she would give him five pounds to help to build the church and fifty pounds for her window and she added if the best gilding and paint costs a little more i would be sorry to see the church shot well you say biddy you will give five pounds towards the church now let us think how much money i could get in this parish he had a taste for gossip and he liked to hear everyone's domestic details she began by telling him she had met kate kavanagh on the road and kate had told her that there had been great dancing last night but there was no wedding said the priest i only know your reverence what kate kavanagh told me there had been great dancing last night the supper was ordered at michael dunn's and the cars were ordered and they went to enniskerry and back but michael dunn would not dare to serve supper to people who were not married said the priest the supper had been ordered and they would have to pay for it whether they ate it or not there was a pig's head and the cake cost eighteen shillings and it was iced never mind the food said the priest tell me what happened kate said that after coming back from enniskerry michael dunn said is this the wedding party and that nate jumped off the car and said to be sure amped i the wedded man and they had half a barrel of porter never mind the drink said the priest what then there was dancing first and fighting after pat connex and peter mcshane were both there you know pat plays the melodeon and he asked peter to sing and peter can't sing a bit and he was laughed at so he grabbed a bit of a stick and hit pat on the head and hit him badly too i hear the doctor had to be sent for that is always the end of their dancing and drinking said the priest and what happened then what happened after that they went home yes your reverence they went home mary byrne went home with her own people i suppose and ned went back to his home i don't know your reverence what they did well what else did kate kavanagh tell you she had just left her brother and mary and they were going towards the peak 
that is what kate told me when i met her on the road Mary Byrne would not go to live with a man to whom she was not married. But you told me that Kate said she had just left Mary Byrne and her brother. Yes, they were just coming out of the cabin, said Biddy. She passed them on the road. Out of whose cabin, said the priest? Out of Ned's cabin. I know it must have been out of Ned's cabin, because she said she met them at the crossroads. He questioned the old woman, but she grew less and less explicit. I don't like to think this of Mary Byrne, but after so much dancing and drinking, it is impossible to say what might not have happened. I suppose they forgot your reverence didn't marry them. Forgot, said the priest, a sin has been committed, and through my fault. They will come to your reverence tomorrow, when they are feeling a little better. The priest did not answer, and Biddy said, Am I to take away my money, or will your reverence keep it for the stained-glass window? The church is tumbling down, and before it is built up you want me to put up statues? I'd like a window as well, or better. I've got other things to think of now. Your reverence is very busy. If I had known it, I would not have come disturbing you. But I'll take my money with me. Yes, take your money, he said. Go home quietly and say nothing about what you have told me. I must think over what is best to be done. Biddy hurried away, gathering her shawl about her. And this great strong man, who had taken Pat Konex by the collar and could have thrown him out of the schoolroom, fell on his knees and prayed that God might forgive him the avarice and anger that had caused him to refuse to marry Ned Kavanagh and Mary Byrne. Oh, my God, oh, my God, he said, thou knowest that it was not for myself that I wanted the money, it was to build up thine own house. He remembered that his uncle had warned him again and again against the sin of anger. He had thought lightly of his uncle's counsels, and he had not practised the virtue of humility, which, as St. Teresa said, was the surest virtue to seek in this treacherous world. Oh, my God, give me strength to conquer anger. The servant opened the door, but seeing the priest upon his knees, she closed it quietly, and the priest prayed that if sin had been committed, he might bear the punishment and on rising from his knees he felt that his duty was to seek out the sinful couple but how to speak to them of their sin the sin was not theirs he was the original wrongdoer if ned kavanagh and mary byrne were to die and lose their immortal souls how could the man who had been the cause of the loss of two immortal souls save his own and the consequences of his refusal to marry Ned Kavanagh and Mary Byrne seemed to reach to the very ends of eternity. He walked to his uncle's with great swift steps, hardly seeing his parishioners as he passed them on the road. Is Father Stafford in? Yes, your reverence. Uncle John, I have come to consult you. The priest sat huddled in his armchair over the fire, and Father Maguire noticed that his cassock was covered with snuff, and he noticed the fringe of reddish hair about the great bald head, and he noticed the fat inert hands, and he noticed these things more explicitly than he had ever noticed them before, and he wondered why he noticed them so explicitly, for his mind was intent on a matter of great spiritual importance. I have come to ask you, Father Tom said, regarding the blame attaching to a priest who refuses to marry a young man and a woman, there being no impediment of consanguinity or other. But have you refused to marry anyone because they couldn't pay you your dues? Listen, the church is falling. My dear Tom, you should not have refused to marry them, he said as soon as his soul-stricken curate had laid the matter before him. 
nothing can justify my action in refusing to marry them said father tom nothing uncle john i know that you can extenuate that you are kind but i do not see it is possible to look at it from any other side my dear tom you are not sure they remained together the only knowledge you have of the circumstances you obtained from that old woman biddy mchale who cannot tell a story properly and old gossip who manufactures stories out of the slightest materials but who sells excellent eggs her eggs are always fresh i had two this morning uncle john i did not come here to be laughed at i am not laughing at you my dear tom but really you know very little about this matter i know well enough that they remained together last night I examined the old woman carefully, and she had just met Kate Kavanagh on the road. There can be no doubt about it, he said. But, said Father John, they intended to be married. The intention was there. Yes, but the intention is no use. We are not living in a country where the edicts of the Council of Trent have not been promulgated. That's true, said Father John, but how can I help you? what am i to do are you feeling well enough for a walk this morning could you come up to kilmore but it is two miles i really the walk will do you good if you do this for me uncle john my dear tom i am as you say not feeling very well this morning but he looked at his nephew and seeing that he was suffering he said i know what these scruples of conscience are they are worse than physical suffering but before he decided to go with his nephew to seek the sinners out he could not help reading him a little lecture i don't feel as sure as you do that a sin has been committed but admitting that a sin has been committed i think you ought to admit that you set your face against the pleasure of these poor people too resolutely pleasure said father tom drinking and dancing hugging and kissing each other about the lanes you said dancing now i can see no harm in it there is no harm in dancing but it leads to harm if they only went back with their parents after the dance but they linger in the lanes it was raining the other night and i felt sorry and i said well the boys and girls will have to stop at home tonight there will be no courting to-night if you do not let them walk about the lanes and make their own marriages they marry for money these walks at eventide represent all the aspiration that may come into their lives after they get married the work of the world grinds all the poetry out of them walking under the moon said father tom with their arms around each other's waists sitting for hours saying stupid things to each other that isn't my idea of poetry the irish find poetry in other things than sex mankind said father john is the same all the world over the irish are not different from other races do not think it woman represents all the poetry that the ordinary man is capable of appreciating and what about ourselves we are different we have put this interest aside i have never regretted it and you have not regretted it either celibacy has never been a trouble to me but tom your own temperament should not prevent you from sympathy with others you are not the whole of human nature you should try to get a little outside yourself can one ever do this said father tom well you see what a difficulty your narrow-mindedness has brought you into i know all that said father tom it is no use insisting upon it now will you come with me they must be married this morning will you come with me i want you to talk to them you are kinder than i am you sympathize with them more than i do and it wasn't you who refused to marry them father john got out of his armchair and staggered about the room on his short fat legs trying to find his hat father tom said here it is 
you don't want your umbrella there's no sign of rain no said his uncle but it will be very hot presently my dear tom i can't walk fast i am sorry i didn't know i was walking fast you are walking at the rate of four miles an hour at the least i am sorry i will walk slower at the crossroads inquiry was made and the priests were told that the cabin ned kavanagh had taken was the last one that's just another half mile said father john if we don't hasten we shall be late we might rest here said father john for a moment and he leaned against the gate my dear tom it seems to me you're agitating yourself a little unnecessarily about ned kavanagh and his wife i mean the girl he is going to marry i am quite sure ned kavanagh brought mary back to his cabin there can be no doubt even so said father john he may have thought he was married how could he have thought he was married unless he was drunk and that cannot be put forward as an excuse no my dear uncle you are inclined for subtleties this morning he may have thought he was married moreover he intended to be married and if through forgetfulness forgetfulness cried father maguire a pretty large measure of forgetfulness i shouldn't say that a mortal sin has been committed a venial one if he intended to be married oh my dear uncle we shall be late we shall be late father stafford repressed the smile that gathered in the corner of his lips and he remembered how father tom had kept him out of bed till two o'clock in the morning talking to him about st thomas aquinas if they're to be married today we must be getting on and father maguire's stride grew more impatient i'll walk in front at last he spied a woman in a field and she told him that the married couple had gone towards the peak most of them had gone for a walk but pat connex was in bed and the doctor had to be sent for i've heard said father tom of last night's drunkenness half a barrel of porter there's what remains he said pointing to some stains on the roadway they were too drunk to turn off the tap i heard your reverence wouldn't marry them the woman said i'm going to bring them down to the church at once well if you do said the woman you won't be a penny the poorer you will have your money at the end of the week and how do you do your reverence the woman dropped a curtsy to father stafford it's seldom we see you up here they have gone towards the peak said father tom for he saw his uncle would take advantage of the occasion to gossip we shall catch them up there i'm afraid i am not equal to it tom i'd like to do this for you but i'm afraid i am not equal to another half mile uphill father maguire strove to hypnotize his parish priest uncle john you are called upon to make this effort i cannot speak to these people as i should like to if you spoke to them as you would like to you would only make matters worse said father john very likely i'm not in a humor to contest these things with you but i beseech you to come with me come he said take my arm they went a few hundred yards up the road then there was another stoppage and father maguire had again to exercise his power of will and he was so successful that the last half mile of the road was accomplished almost without a stop at michael dunn's the priest learned that the wedding party had been there and father stafford called for a lemonade don't fail me now uncle john they are within a few hundred yards of us i couldn't meet them without you think of it if they were to tell me that i had refused to marry them for two pounds my authority would be gone forever i should have to leave the parish my dear tom i would do it if i could but i am completely exhausted at that moment sounds of voices were heard listen to them uncle john and the curate took the glass from father john 
They are not as far as I thought. They are sitting under these trees. Come, he said. And they walked some twenty yards till they came to a spot where the light came pouring through the young leaves, and all the brown leaves of last year were spotted with light. There were light shadows amid the rocks and pleasant mosses, and the sounds of leaves and water, and from the top of a rock Kate listened while Peter told her they would rebuild his house. The priests are after us, she said, and she gave a low whistle, and the men and boys looked round, and seeing the priests coming they dispersed, taking several paths, and none but Ned and Mary were left behind. Ned was dozing, Mary was sitting beside him, fanning herself with her hat. They had not heard Kate's whistle, and they did not see the priests until they were by them. Now, Tom, don't lose your head. Be quiet with them. Will you speak to them, or shall I? said Father Tom. In the excitement of the moment he forgot his own imperfections and desired to admonish them. I think you had better let me speak to them, said Father John. You are Ned Kavanagh, he said, and you are Mary Byrne, I believe. Now, I don't know you all, for I am getting an old man, and I don't often come up this way. But notwithstanding my age and the heat of the day, I have come up, for I have heard that you have not acted as good Catholics should. I don't doubt for a moment that you intended to get married, but you have, I fear, been guilty of a great sin and you've set a bad example we were on our way to your reverence now said mary i mean to his reverence well said father tom you are taking your time over it lying here half asleep under the trees we hadn't the money said mary it wasn't our fault didn't i say i'd marry you for nothing but sure your reverence that's only a way of speaking there's no use lingering here, said Father Tom. Ned, you took the pledge the day before yesterday, and yesterday you were tipsy. I may have had a drop of drink in me, your reverence. Pat Connex passed me the mug of porter, and I forgot myself. And once, said the priest, you tasted the porter, you thought you could go on taking it. Ned did not answer, and the priests whispered together. We are halfway now, said Father Tom. We can get there before twelve o'clock. I don't think I'm equal to it, said Father John. I really don't think. The sounds of wheels were heard, and a peasant driving a donkey cart came up the road. You see, it is all uphill, said Father John. See how the road ascends. I never could manage it. The road is pretty flat at the top of the hill, once you get to the top of the hill, and the cart will take you to the top. It seemed undignified to get into the donkey cart, but his nephew's conscience was at stake, and the vicar general got in, and Father Tom said to the unmarried couple, Now, walk on in front of us, and step out as quickly as you can. And on the way to the church, Father Tom remembered that he had caught sight of Kate standing at the top of the rock, talking to Peter McShane. In a few days they would come to him to be married, and he hoped that Peter and Kate's marriage would make amends for this miserable patchwork, for Ned Kavanagh and Mary Byrne's marriage was no better than patchwork. End of Some Parishioners, Part 2「2 Part 3 of The Untilled Field by George Moore」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Some Parishioners, Part 3 Section 4 Mrs. Konex promised the priest to keep Pat at home out of Kate's way and the neighbours knew it was the priest's wish that they should do all they could to help him to bring about this marriage. And everywhere Kate went she heard nothing talked of but her marriage. 
The dress that Kate was to be married in was a nice grey silk. It had been bought at a rummage sale, and she was told that it suited her. But Kate had begun to feel that she was being driven into a trap. In the week before her marriage she tried to escape. She went to Dublin to look for a situation, but she did not find one. She had not seen Pat since the poultry lecture, and his neglect angered her. She did not care what became of her. On the morning of her wedding she turned round and asked her sister if she thought she ought to marry Peter, and Julia said it would be a pity if she didn't. Six cars had been engaged, and, feeling she was done for, she went to the church, hoping it would fall down on her. Well, the priest had his way, and Kate felt she hated him and Mrs. McShane, who stood on the edge of the road. The fat were distributed alongside of the lean, and the bridal party drove away, and there was great waving of hands, and Mrs. McShane waited until the last car was out of sight. Her husband had been dead many years, and she lived with her son in a two-roomed cabin. She was one of those simple, kindly natures that everyone likes, and that everyone despises, and she returned home like a lonely goose, waddling slowly, a little overcome by the thought of the happiness that awaited her son. There would be no more lonely evenings in the cabin. Kate would be with him now, and later on there would be some children and she waddled home thinking of the cradle and the joy it would be to her to take her grandchildren upon her knee. When she returned to the cottage she sat down so that she might dream over her happiness a little longer, but she had not been sitting long when she remembered there was a great deal of work to be done. The cabin would have to be cleaned from end to end. There was the supper to be cooked, and she did not pause in her work until everything was ready. At five the pig's head was on the table and the sheep's tongues. The bread was baked, the barrel of porter had come, and she was expecting the piper every minute. As she stood with her arms akimbo looking at the table, thinking of the great evening it would be, she thought how her old friend Annie Connex had refused to come to Peter's wedding. Wasn't all the village saying that Kate would not have married Peter if she had not been driven to it by the priest and by her mother? Poor boy, she thought, his heart is so set upon her that he has no ears for any word against her. She could not understand why people should talk ill of a girl on her wedding day. Why shouldn't a girl be given a chance, she asked herself. Why should any connex prevent her son from coming to the dance? If she were to go to her now and ask her if she would come, and if she would not come herself, if she would let Pat come round for an hour. If Annie would do this, all the gossip would have their tongues tied. Anyhow, she could try to persuade her. And she locked her door and walked up the road and knocked on Mrs. Konex's. Prosperity, in the shapes of pigsties and stables, had collected round Annie's door and Mrs. McShane was proud to be a visitor in such a house. I came round, Annie, to tell you they're married. Well, come in, Mary, she said, if you have the time. The first part of the sentence was prompted by the news that Kate was safely married and out of Pat's way, and the second half of the sentence, if you have the time, was prompted by a wish that Mary should see that she need not come again for some time at least. To Annie Connex the Kavanaugh family was abomination. The father got eighteen shillings a week for doing a bit of gardening. Ned had been a quarryman, now he was out of work and did odd jobs. The Kavanaghs took in a baby and they got five or six shillings a week for that. Mrs. Kavanagh sold geraniums at more than their value and she got more than the market value for her chickens. She sold them to charitable folk who were anxious to encourage poultry farming. And now Julia, the second daughter, had gone in for lace-making, and she made a lace that looked as if it were cut out of paper, and sold it for three times its market value. 
and to sell above market value was abominable to Annie Connex. Her idea of life was order and administration, and the village she lived in was thriftless and idle. The Kavanaghs received outdoor relief. They got two shillings a week off the rates, though every Saturday evening they bought a quarter barrel of porter, and Annie Connex could not believe in the future of a country that would tolerate such a thing. If her son had married a Kavanagh, her life would have come to an end, and the twenty years she had worked for him would have been wasted years. Thank God Kate was out of her son's way, and on seeing Mary she resolved that Pat should never cross the McShane threshold. Mrs. McShane looked round the comfortable kitchen, with sides of bacon and home-cured hams hanging from the rafters. She had not got on in life as well as Mrs. Connex, and she knew she would never have a beautiful closed range, but an open hearth till the end of her days. She could never have a nice dresser with a pretty carved top. The dresser in her kitchen was deal, and had no nice shining brass knobs on it. She would never have a parlour, and this parlour had in it a mahogany table and a grandfather's clock that would show you the moon on it, just the same as it was in the sky, and there was a glass over the fireplace. This was Annie Connex's own parlour. The parlour on the other side of the house was even better furnished, for in the summer months Mrs. Connex bedded and boarded her lodgers for one pound or one pound five shillings a week. So she was married today, and Father Maguire married her after all. I never thought he would have brought her to it. Well, I'm glad she's married. It rose to Mary's lips to say, you are glad she didn't marry your son, but she put back the words. It comes upon me as a bit of a surprise, for sure and all I could never see her settling down in the parish. Them that are the wildest before marriage are often the best after, and I think it will be like that with Kate. I hope so, said Annie, and there is reason why it should be like that. She must have liked Peter better than we thought. You will never get me to believe that it was the priest's will or anybody's will that brought Kate to do what she did. I hope she'll make my boy a good wife. I hope so too, said Annie, and the woman sat over the fire, thinking it out. Annie Connex wore an apron and a black straw hat, and her eyes were young and kind and laughing. But Mrs. McShane, who had known her for twenty years, often wondered what Annie would have been like if she had not got a kind husband, and if good luck had not attended her all through life. We never had anyone like her before in the parish. I hear she turned round to her sister Julia, who was dressing her, and said, Now, am I to marry him, or shall I go to America? And she was putting on her grey dress at the time. She looked well in that grey dress. There was lace on the front of it, and everyone said that a handsomer girl hasn't been married in the parish for years. There isn't a man in the parish that would not be in Peter's place today if he only dared. I don't catch your meaning, Mary. Well, perhaps I oughtn't to have said it, now that she's my own daughter, but I think many would have been a bit afraid of her after what she said to the priest three days ago. She did have her tongue on him. People are telling all ends of stories. Tis said that Father Maguire was up at the Kavanagh's three days ago, and I heard she hunted him. She called him a policeman and a tax collector and a landlord, and if she said this, she said more to a priest than anyone ever said before. There are plenty of people in the parish, she said, who believe he could turn them into rabbits if he liked. As for the rabbits, she isn't far from the truth, though I don't take it on myself to say if it be a truth or a lie. But I know for a fact that Patsy Rogan was going to vote for the Unionists to please his landlord, but the priest had been to see his wife, who was going to be confined, 
and didn't he tell her that if patsy voted for the wrong man there would be horns on the new baby and mrs rogan was so frightened that she wouldn't let her husband go when he came in that night till he had promised to vote as the priest wished patsy rogan is an ignorant man said annie there are many like him even here ah sure there will be always some like him don't we like to believe the priest can do all things but kate doesn't believe the priest can do these things anyhow she's married and there will be an end to all the work that has been going on that's true for you annie and that's just what i came to talk to you about i think now she's married we ought to give her a chance every girl ought to get her chance and the way to put an end to all this talk about her will be for you to come round to the dance tonight i don't know that i can do that i am not friends with the kavanaghs though i always bid them the time of day when i meet them on the road if you come in for a few minutes or if pat were to come in for a few minutes if peter and pat aren't friends they'll be enemies Maybe they'll be worse than enemies if I don't keep Pat out of Kate's way. She's married Peter, but her mind is not settled yet. Yes, Annie, I've thought of all that. But they'll be meeting on the road, and if they aren't friends, they will be quarrelling, and some bad deed may be done. Annie did not answer, and, thinking to convince her, Mary said, You wouldn't like to see a corpse overwrite your window it ill becomes you mary to speak of corpses after the blow that peter gave pat with his stick at ned kavanagh's wedding no i must stand by my son and i must keep him out of the low irish and he won't be safe until i get him a good wife the low irish indeed annie it ill becomes you to talk in that way of your neighbours is it because none of us have brass knockers on our doors i have seen this pride growing up in you annie connex this long while there isn't one in the village now that you've any respect for except the grocer that black protestant who sits behind his counter and makes money and knows no enjoyment in life at all that's your way of looking at it but it isn't mine I set my face against my son marrying Kate Kavanagh, and you should have done the same. Something will happen to you for the cruel words you have spoken to me this day. Mary, you came to ask me to your son's wedding, and I had to tell you, yes, and you've told me that you won't come, and that you hate the Kavanaghs, and you've said all you could against them. I should not have listened to all you said if i did it is because we have known each other these twenty years don't i remember well the rags you had on your back when you came to this village it ill becomes mrs mcshane got up and went out and annie followed her to the gate the sounds of wheels and hooves were heard and the wedding party passed by and on the first car whom should they see but kate sitting between pat and peter Goodbye, Annie. I see that Pat's coming to our dance after all. I must hurry down the road to open the door to him. And she laughed as she waddled down the road, and she could not speak for want of breath when she got to the door. They were all there, Pat and the Piper and Kate and Peter and all their friends. And she could not speak, and hadn't the strength to find the key. She could only think of the black look that had come over Annie's face, when she saw Pat sitting by Kate on the car. She had told Annie that she would be punished, and Mrs. McShane laughed as she searched for the key, thinking how quickly her punishment had come. She searched for the key, and all the while they were telling her how they had met Pat at Michael Dunn's. When he saw us, he tried to sneak into the yard, but I went after him, and don't you think I did right? Kate said as they went into the house. And when they were all inside, she said, Now I'll get the biggest jug of porter, and one shall drink one half, 
and the other the other peter was fond of jugs and had large and small some were white and brown some were gilt with pink flowers at last she chose the great brown one now peter you'll say something nice i'll say then said peter this is the happiest day of my life as it should be indeed for haven't i got the girl that i wanted and hasn't pat forgiven me for the blow i struck him for he knows well i wouldn't hurt a hair of his head weren't we boys together but i had a cross drop in me at the time and that was how it was catching sight of kate's black hair and rosy cheeks which were all the world to him he stopped speaking and stood looking at her unheedful of everything and he looked so good and foolish at that time that more than one woman thought it would be a weary thing to live with him now pat you must make a speech too said kate i haven't any speech in me he said i'm glad enough to be here but i'm sore afraid my mother saw me sitting on the cart and i think i better be going home and letting you finish this marriage what's that you're saying said kate you won't go out of this house till you've danced a reel with me and now sit down at the table next to me and peter you sit on the other side of him so that he won't run away to his mother her eyes were as bright as coals of fire and she called to her father who was at the end of the table to have another slice of pig's head and to the piper who was having his supper in the window to have a bit more and then she turned to pat who said never a word and laughed at him for having nothing to say it seemed to them as if there was no one in the room but kate and afterwards they remembered things ned remembered that kate had seemed to put pat out of her mind she had stood talking to her husband and she had said that he must dance with her though it was no amusement to a girl to dance opposite peter and mary ned's wife remembered how kate though she had danced with peter in the first reel had not been able to keep her eyes from the corner where pat was sulking and that sudden like she had grown weary of peter mary remembered she had seen a wild look pass in kate's eyes and that she had gone over to pat and pulled him out it was a pleasure for a girl to dance opposite to pat so cleverly did his feet move to the tune and everyone was admiring them when pat cried out i'm going home i bid you all good night here finish this wedding as you like and before anyone could stop him he had run out of the house peter go after him kate said bring him back it would be ill luck on our wedding night for anyone to leave us like that peter went out of the door and was away some time but he came back without pat the night is that dark i lost him he said then kate did not seem to care what she said her black hair fell down and she told peter he was a fool and that he should have run faster her mother said it was the porter that had been too much for her but she said it was the priest's blessing and this frightened everyone but after saying all this she went to her husband saying that he was very good to her and she had no fault to find with him but no sooner were the words out of her mouth than her mind seemed to wander and everyone had expected her to run out of the house but she went into the other room instead and shut the door behind her everyone knew then there would be no more dancing that night and the piper packed up his pipes and peter sat by the fire and he seemed to be crying they were all sorry to leave him like this and so that he might not remember what had happened ned drew a big jug of porter and put it by him he drank a sup out of it but seemed to forget everything and the jug fell out of his hand never mind the pieces peter his mother said you can't put them together and it would be better for you not to drink any more porter go to bed there's been too much drinking this night mother 
I want to know why she said I didn't run fast enough after Pat. And didn't she know that if I hit Pat so hard, it was because there were knobs on his stick, and didn't I pick up his stick by mistake of my own? Sure, Peter, it wasn't your fault, we all know that, and Kate knows it too. Now, let there be no more talking or drinking. No, Peter, you've had enough porter for tonight. He looked round the kitchen, and seeing that Kate was not there, he said, She's in the other room, I think. Mother, you'll be wanting to go to bed. And Peter got on his feet and stumbled against the wall, and his mother had to help him towards the door. Is it drunk I am, mother? Will you open the door for me? But Mrs. McShane could not open the door, and she said, I think she's put a bit of stick in it. A bit of stick in the door? And didn't she say that she didn't want to marry me? Didn't she say something about the priest's blessing? And then Peter was sore afraid that he would not get sight of his wife that night, and he said, Won't she acquiesce? And Kate said, No, I won't. And then he said, We were married in church today. You acquiesced. And she said, I'll not open the door to you. You're drunk, Peter, and not fit to enter a decent woman's room. It isn't because I've a drop too much in me that you should have fastened the door on me. It is because you're thinking of the blow I gave Pat. But Kate, it was because I loved you so much that I struck him. Now, will you open the door? No, I'll not open the door tonight, she said. I'm tired and want to go to sleep. And when he said he would break open the door, she said, you're too drunk, Peter, and sorry a bit of good it will do you. I'll be no wife to you tonight, and that's as true as God's in heaven. Peter, said his mother, don't trouble her tonight. There has been too much dancing and drinking. It's a hard thing. Shut out of his wife's room. Peter, don't vex her tonight. Don't hammer her door any more. Didn't she acquiesce? Mother, you have always been agin me. Didn't she acquiesce? Oh, Peter, why do you say I'm agin you? Did you hear her say that I was drunk? If you tell me I'm drunk, I'll say no more. I'll acquiesce. Peter, you must go to sleep. Yes, go to sleep. I want to go to sleep, but she won't open the door. Peter, never mind her. It isn't that I mind. I'm getting sleepy. But what I want to know, mother, before I go to bed, is if I'm drunk. Tell me I'm not drunk on my wedding night. And, though Kate, and I'll acquiesce in all that may be put upon me. He covered his face with his hands, and his mother begged him not to cry. He became helpless. She put a blanket under his head and covered him with another blanket and went up the ladder and lay down in the hay. She asked herself what had she done to deserve this trouble, and she cried a great deal. And the poor hapless old woman was asleep in the morning when Peter stumbled to his feet. And after dipping his head in a pail of water, he remembered that the horses were waiting for him in the farm. He walked off to his work, staggering a little, and as soon as he was gone, Kate drew back the bolt of the door and came into the kitchen. I'm going, mother, she called up to the loft. Wait a minute, Kate, said Mrs. McShane, and she was halfway down the ladder when Kate said, I can't wait, I'm going. She walked up the road to her mother's, and she hardly saw the fields or the mountains, though she knew she would never look upon them again. And her mother was sweeping out the house. She had the chairs out in the pathway. She had heard that the rector was coming down that afternoon, and she wanted to show him how beautifully clean she kept her cabin. I've come, mother, to give you this. 
and she took the wedding ring off her finger and threw it on the ground. I don't want it. I shut the door on him last night, and I'm going to America today. You see how well the marriage that you and the priest made up together has turned out? Going to America, said Mrs. Kavanagh, and it suddenly occurred to her that Kate might be going to America with Pat Connex, but she did not dare to say it. Kate stood looking at the bushes that grew between their cottage and the next one, and she remembered how she and her brother used to cut the branches of the alder to make pop-guns, for the alder branches are full of sap, and when the sap is expelled there is a hole smooth as the barrel of a gun. I'm going, she said suddenly. There's nothing more to say. Good-bye. She walked away quickly, and her mother said, She's going with Pat Konex, but Kate had no thought of going to America with him. It was not until she met him a little further on at the crossroads that the thought occurred to her that he might like to go to America with her. She called him, and he came to her, and he looked a nice boy, but she thought he was better in Ireland, and the country seemed far away, though she was still in it, and the people too though she was still among them. I'm going to America, Pat. You were married yesterday. Yes, that was the priest's doing, and mother's, and I thought they knew best. But I'm thinking one must go one's own way, and there's no judging for oneself here. That's why I'm going. You'll find some other girl, Pat. There's not another girl like you in the village. We're a dead and alive lot. You stood up to the priest. I didn't stand up to him enough. You're waiting for someone. Who are you waiting for? I don't like to tell you, Kate. She pressed him to answer her, and he told her he was waiting for the priest. His mother had said he must marry and the priest was coming to make up a marriage for him. Everything's mother's. That's true, Pat, and you'll give a message for me. Tell my mother-in-law that I've gone. She'll be asking me questions, and I'll be sore set for an answer. She looked at him steadily, but she left him without speaking, and he stood thinking. He had had good times with her, and all such times were ended for him for ever. He was going to be married, and he did not know to whom. Suddenly he remembered he had a message to deliver, and he went down to the McShane's cabin. Ah, Mrs. McShane, he said, it was a bad day for me when she married Peter, but this is a worse one, for we've both lost her. My poor boy will feel it sorely. And when Peter came in for his dinner, his mother said, Peter, she's gone. She's gone to America, and you're well rid of her. Don't say that, mother. I'm not well rid of her, for there's no other woman in the world for me except her that's gone. Has she gone with Pat Connex? No, he said nothing about that and it was he who brought the message. I've no one, mother, to blame but myself. I was drunk last night, and how could she let a drunken fellow like me into her room? He went out to the back yard, and his mother heard him crying till it was time for him to go back to work. Section 5 As he got up to go to his work, he caught sight of Biddy McHale coming up the road. He rushed past her, lest she should ask him what he was crying about, and she stood looking after him for a moment, and went into the cabin to inquire what had happened. Sure, she wouldn't let her husband sleep with her last night, said Mrs. McShane, and you'll be telling the priest that. It will be well he should know it at once. Biddy would have liked to have heard how the wedding party had met Pat Konex on the road, and what had happened after. But the priest was expecting her, and she did not dare to keep him waiting much longer. But she was not sorry she had been delayed, 
for the priest only wanted to get her money to mend the walls of the old church, and she thought that her best plan would be to keep him talking about Kate and Peter. He was going to America tomorrow or the day after, and if she could keep her money till then, it would be safe. His front door was open. He was leaning over the green paling that divided his strip of garden from the road, and he looked very cross indeed. She began at once. Sure, your reverence, there's terrible work going on in the village, and I've had to stop to listen to Mrs. McShane. Kate Kavanagh, that was, has gone to America, and she shut her door on him last night, saying he was drunk. What's this you're telling me? If your reverence will listen to me. I'm always listening to you, Biddy McHale. Go on with your story. It was a long time before he fully understood what had happened, but at last all the facts seemed clear, and he said, I'm expecting Pat Connex. Then his thoughts turned to the poor husband weeping in the back yard, and he said, I made up this marriage so that she might not go away with Pat Connex. Well, we've been saved that, said Biddy. Ned Kavanagh's marriage was bad enough, but this is worse. It is no marriage at all. Ah, your reverence, you mustn't be taking it to heart. If the marriage did not turn out right, it was the drink. Ah, the drink, the drink, said the priest, and he declared that the brewer and the distiller were the ruin of Ireland. That's true for you. At the same time, we mustn't forget that they have put up many a fine church. It would be impossible, I suppose, to prohibit the brewing of ale and the distillation of spirit. The priest's brother was a publican, and had promised a large subscription. And now, Biddy, what are you going to give me to make the walls secure? I don't want you all to be killed while I am away. There's no fear of that, your reverence. A church never fell down on anyone. Even so, if it falls down when nobody's in it, where are the people to hear Mass? Ah, won't they be going down to hear Mass at Father Stafford's? If you don't wish to give anything, say so. Your reverence, haven't I? We don't want to hear about that window. Biddy began to fear she would have to give him a few pounds to quiet him. But fortunately, Pat Connex came up the road, and she thought she might escape after all. I hear, Pat Connex, you were dancing with Kate Kavanagh. I should say Kate McShane, and she went away to America this morning. Have you heard that? I have, your reverence. She passed me on the road this morning. And you weren't thinking you might stop her? Stop her, said Pat. Who could stop Kate from doing anything she wanted to do? And now your mother writes to me, Pat Connex, to ask if I will get... Lennon's daughter for you. I see your reverence has private business with Pat Connex. I'll be going, said Biddy, and she was many yards down the road before he could say a word. Now, Biddy McHale, don't you be going. But Biddy pretended not to hear him. Will I be running after her, said Pat, and bring her back? No, let her go. If she doesn't want to help me make the walls safe, I'm not going down on my knees to her. You'll all have to walk to Father Stafford's to hear Mass. Have you heard your mother say what she's going to give towards the new church, Pat Connex? I think, she said, your reverence, she was going to send you ten pounds. That's very good of her. And this proof that a public and religious spirit was not yet dead in his parish softened the priest's temper and thinking to please him, and perhaps escape a scolding, Pat began to calculate how much Biddy had saved. She must be worth, I'm thinking, close on one hundred pounds today. As the priest did not answer, he said, I wouldn't be surprised if she was worth another fifty. Hardly as much as that, said the priest. Hadn't the aunt the house we're living in before mother came to Kilmore? 
and they used to have the house full of lodgers all the summer it's true that her aunt didn't pay her any wages but when she died she left her a hundred pounds and she has been making money ever since this allusion to biddy's poultry reminded the priest that he had once asked biddy what had put the idea of a poultry farm into her head and she had told him that when she was taking up the lodger's meals at her aunt's she used to have to stop and lean against the banisters so heavy were the trays one day i slipped and hurt myself and i was lying on my back for more than two years and all the time i could see the fowls pecking in the yard for my bed was by the window i thought i would like to keep fowls when i was older the priest remembered the old woman standing before him telling him of her accident and while listening he had watched her undecided whether she could be called a hunchback her shoulders were higher than shoulders usually are she was jerked forward from the waist and she had the long thin arms and the long thin face and the pathetic eyes of the hunchback perhaps she guessed his thoughts she said in those days we used to go blackberrying with the boys we used to run all over the hills he did not think she had said anything else but she had said the words in such a way that they suggested a great deal they suggested that she had once been very happy and that she had suffered very soon the loss of all her woman's hopes a few weeks a few months between her convalescence and her disappointment had been all her woman's life the thought that life is but a little thing passed across the priest's mind and then he looked at pat connex and wondered what was to be done with him his conduct at the wedding would have to be inquired into and the marriage that was being arranged would have to be broken off if kate's flight could be attributed to him now pat connex we will go to mrs mcshane i shall want to hear her story sure what story can she tell of me didn't i run out of the house away from kate when i saw what she was thinking of what more could i do if mrs mcshane tells the same story as you do we'll go to your mother's and afterwards i'll go to see lennon about his daughter pat's dancing with kate and kate's flight to america had reached lennon's ears and it did not seem at all likely that he would consent to give his daughter to pat connex unless indeed pat connex agreed to take a much smaller dowry than his mother had asked for these new negotiations his packing a letter to the bishop and the payment of bills fully occupied the last two days and the priest did not see biddy again till he was on his way to the station she was walking up and down her poultry yard telling her beads followed by her poultry and it was with difficulty he resisted the impulse to ask her for a subscription but the driver said if they stopped they would miss the train very well said the priest and he drove past her cabin without speaking to her in the bar rooms of new york while trying to induce a recalcitrant loafer to part with a dollar he remembered that he had not met any one so stubborn as biddy she had given very little and yet she seemed to be curiously mixed up with the building of the church she was the last person he saw on his way out and a few months later he was struck by the fact that she was the first parishioner he saw on his return as he was driving home from the station in the early morning whom should he see but biddy telling her beads followed by her poultry the scene was much the same except that morning was substituted for evening this was the first impression on looking closer he noticed that she was not followed by as many Plymouth Rocks as on the last occasion. 
she seems to be going in for buff orpingtons he said to himself it's a fine thing to see you again and your reverence is looking well i hope you've been lucky in america i have brought home some money anyhow and the church will be built and you will be telling your beads under your window one of these days your reverence is very good to me and god is very good and she stood looking after him thinking how she had brought him round to her way of thinking she had always known that the americans would pay for the building but no one else but herself would be thinking of putting up a beautiful window that would do honour to god and kill more and it wasn't her fault if she didn't know a good window from a bad one as well as the best of them and it wasn't she who was going to hand over her money to the priest or his architect to put up what window they liked she had been inside every church within twenty miles of kilmore and would see that she got full value for her money End of some parishioners part three Chapter two Part four of The Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Some Parishioners Part four. At the end of the week she called at the priest's house to tell him the pictures she would like to see in the window and the colours. But the priest's servant was not certain whether Biddy could see his reverence. He has a gentleman with him. Isn't it the architect he has with him? Don't you know it is I who am putting up the window? To be sure, said the priest, show her in. And he drew forward a chair for Miss McHale, and introduced her to the architect. The little man laid his pencil aside, and this encouraged Biddy, and she began to tell him of the kind of window she had been thinking of but she had not told him half the things she wished to have put into the window when he interrupted her and said there would be plenty of time to consider what kind of window should be put in when the walls were finished and the roof was upon them perhaps it is a little premature to discuss the window but you shall choose the subjects you would like to see represented in the window and as for the colours the architect and designer will advise you but I am sorry to say, Biddy, that this gentleman says that the four thousand pounds the Americans were good enough to give me will not do much more than build the walls. They're waiting for me to offer them my money, but I won't say a word, Biddy said to herself, and she sat fidgeting with her shawl, coughing from time to time, until the priest lost his patience. Well, Biddy, we're very busy here and I'm sure you want to get back to your fowls. When the church is finished, we'll see if we want your window. The priest had hoped to frighten her, but she was not the least frightened. Her faith in her money was abundant. She knew that as long as she had her money, the priest would come to her for it, on one pretext or another, sooner or later. And she was as well pleased that nothing would be settled at present, for she was not quite decided whether she would like to see Christ sitting in judgment or Christ crowning his virgin mother, and during the next six months she pondered on the pictures and the colours, and gradually the design grew clearer. And every morning, as soon as she had fed her chickens, she went up to Kilmore to watch the workmen. She was there when the first spadeful of earth was thrown up, and as soon as the walls showed above the ground, she began to ask the workmen how long it would take them to reach the windows, and if a workman put down his trowel and wandered from his work, she would tell him it was God he was cheating. And later on, when the priest's money began to come to an end, and he could not pay the workmen full wages, she told them that they were working for God's own house, and that he would reward them in the next world. 
hold your tongue said a mason if you want the church built why don't you give the priest the money you're saving and let him pay us keep a civil tongue in your head pat murphy it isn't for myself i am keeping it back isn't it all going to be spent the walls were now built and amid the clatter of the slaters hammers biddy began to tell the plasterers of the beautiful pictures that would be seen in her window and she gabbled on mixing up her memories of the different windows she had seen until at last her chatter grew wearisome and they threw bits of mortar laughing at her for a crazy old woman or the priest would suddenly come upon them and they would scatter in all directions leaving him with biddy what were they saying to you biddy they were saying your reverence that america is a great place you spend a great deal of your time here biddy and i suppose you are beginning to see that it takes a long time to build a church now you are not listening to what i am saying you are thinking about your window but you must have a house before you can have a window i know that very well your reverence but you see god has given us the house god's house consists of little more than walls and a roof indeed it does your reverence and am not i saving up all my money for the window but my good biddy there is hardly any plastering done yet the laths have come in and there isn't sufficient to fill that end of the church and i have no more money won't your reverence be getting the rest of the money in america and i am thinking a bazaar would be a good thing wouldn't we all be making scapulars and your reverence might get medals that the pope had blessed eventually he drove her out of the church with his umbrella but as his anger cooled he began to think that perhaps biddy was right a bazaar might be a good thing and a distribution of medals and scapulars might induce his workmen to do some overtime he went to dublin to talk over this matter with some pious catholics and an old lady wrote a cheque for fifty pounds two or three others subscribed smaller sums and the plasterers were busy all next week but these subscriptions did not go nearly as far towards completing the work as he had expected the architect had led him astray and he looked round the vast barn that he had built and despaired it seemed to him it would never be finished in his lifetime a few weeks after he was again running short of money and he was speaking to his workmen one saturday afternoon telling them how they could obtain a plenary indulgence by subscribing so much towards the building of the church and by going to confession and communion on the first sunday of the month and if they could not afford the money they could give their work he was telling them how much could be done if every workman were to do each day an hour of overtime when biddy suddenly appeared and standing in front of the men she raised up her hands and said that they should not pass her until they had pledged themselves to come to work on monday but haven't we got our wives and little ones and haven't we to think of them said a workman ah one can live on very little when one is doing the work of god said biddy the man called her a vain old woman who was starving herself so that she might put up a window and they pushed her aside and went away saying they had to think of their wives and children the priest turned upon her angrily and asked her what she meant by interfering between him and his workmen now don't be angry with me your reverence i will say a prayer and you will say a word or two in your sermon tomorrow and he spoke in his sermon of the disgrace it would be to kill more if the church remained unfinished the news would go over to america and what priest would ever be able to get money there again to build a church do you think a priest likes to go about the bar rooms asking for dollars and half dollars would you make his task more unpleasant if i have to go to america again 
what answer shall I make if they say to me, Well, didn't your workmen leave you at Kilmore? They don't want churches at Kilmore. Why should we give you money for a church? There was a great deal of talking that night in Michael Dunn's, and they were all of one mind, that it would be a disgrace to Kilmore if the church were not finished. But no one could see that he could work for less wages than he was in the habit of getting. As the evening wore on, the question of indulgences was raised, and Ned Kavanagh said, The devil a bit of use going against the priest, and the indulgences will do us no harm. The devil a bit, but maybe a great deal of good, said Peter McShane and an hour later they were staggering down the road swearing they would stand by the priest till the death but on monday morning nearly all were in their beds only half a dozen came to the work and the priest sent them away except one plasterer there was one plasterer who he thought could stand on the scaffold if i were to fall i'd go straight to heaven the plasterer said and he stood so near the edge, and his knees seemed so weak under him, that Biddy thought he was going to fall. It would be better for you to finish what you are doing. The Holy Virgin will be more thankful to you. Aye, maybe she would, he said, and he continued his work mechanically. He was working at the clustered columns about the window Biddy had chosen for her stained glass, and she did not take her eyes off him. The priest returned a little before twelve o'clock as the plasterer was going to his dinner, and he asked him if he were feeling better. I'm all right, your reverence, and it won't occur again. I hope he won't go down to Michael Dunn's during his dinner hour, he said to Biddy. If you see any further sign of drink upon him when he comes back, you must tell me. He is safe enough, your reverence. Wasn't he telling me, while your reverence was having your breakfast, that if he fell down he would go straight to heaven, and he opened his shirt and showed me he was wearing the scapular of the Holy Virgin? And Biddy began to advocate a sale of scapulars. A sale of scapulars will not finish my church. You're all a miserly lot here. You want everything done for you. Weren't you telling me, your reverence, that a pious lady in Dublin? The work is at a standstill. If I were to go to America tomorrow, it would be no use unless I could tell them it was progressing. Sure, they don't ask any questions in America. They just give their money. If they do, that's more than you're doing at home. I want to know, Biddy, what you are going to do for this church. You're always talking about it. You're always here, and you have given less than anyone else. Didn't I offer your reverence a sovereign once, since I gave you the five pounds? You don't seem to understand, Biddy, that you can't put up your window until the plastering is finished. I think I understand that well enough. But the church will be finished. How will it be finished? When will it be finished? She did not answer, and nothing was heard in the still church but her irritating little cough. You're very obstinate. Well, tell me where you would like to have your window. It is there I shall be kneeling, and if you will let me put my window there, I shall see it when I look up from my beads. I should like to see the Virgin, and I should like to see St. John with her. And don't you think, your reverence, we might have St. Joseph as well? Our Lord would have to be in the Virgin's arms, and I think, your reverence, I would like our Lord coming down to judge us, and I should like to have him on his throne on the day of judgment up at the top of the window. I can see you've been thinking a good deal about this window, the priest said. She began again, and the priest heard the names of the different saints she would like to see in stained glass, and he let her prattle on, but his temper boiled up suddenly, and he said, You'd go on like this till midnight if I let you. Now, Biddy McHale, you've been here all the morning delaying my workmen. Go home to your fowls. 
and she ran away shrinking like a dog, and the priest walked up and down the unfinished church. She tries my temper more than any one I ever met, he said to himself. At that moment he heard some loose boards clanking, and, thinking it was the old woman coming back, he looked round, his eyes flaming. But the intruder was a short and square-set man, of the type that one sees in Germany, and he introduced himself as an agent of a firm of stained-glass manufacturers. He told Father Maguire they had heard in Germany of the beautiful church he was building. I met an old woman on the road, and she told me that I would find you in the church considering the best place for the window she was going to put up. She looks very poor. She's not as poor as she looks. She's been saving money all her life for this window. Her window is her one idea, and, like people of one idea, she's apt to become a little tiresome. I don't quite understand. He began telling the story, and seeing the German was interested in the old woman, he began to acquire an interest in her himself, an unpremeditated interest. He had not suspected that Biddy was so interesting. The German said she reminded him of the quaint sculpture of Nuremberg, and her character reminded him of one of the German saints and talking of Biddy and medievalism and Gothic art and stained glass, the priest and the agent for the manufacture of stained glass in Munich walked up and down the unfinished church until the return of the plasterer reminded the priest of his embarrassments, and he took the German into his confidence. These embarrassments always occur, said the agent, but there is no such thing as an unfinished church in Ireland. If you were to let her put up the window, subscriptions would pour in. How is that? A paragraph in the newspaper describing the window, the gift of a local saint. I think you told me her name was McHale, and that she lives in the village? Yes, you pass her house on the way to the station. The German took his leave abruptly and when he was halfway down the hill he asked some children to direct him. Is it Biddy McHale that has all the hins and is going to put up a window in the church that you're wanting? The German said that that was the woman he wanted, and the eldest child said, You will see her feeding her chickens, and you must call to her over the hedge. And he did as he was bidden. Madam, the priest has sent me to show you some designs for a stained-glass window. No one had ever addressed Biddy as Madam before. She hastened to let him into the house and wipe the table clean so that he could spread the designs upon it. The first designs he showed her were the four evangelists, but he would like a woman's present to her church to be in a somewhat lighter style, and he showed her a picture of St. Cecilia that fascinated her for a time, and then he suggested that a group of figures would look handsomer than a single figure, but she could not put aside the idea of the window that had grown up in her mind, and after some attempts to persuade her to accept a design they had in stock, he had to give way and listen. At the top of the picture, where the window narrowed to a point, our lord sat dressed in white on a throne placing a golden crown on the head of the virgin kneeling before him about him were the women who had loved him and the old woman said she was sorry she was not a nun and hoped that christ would not think less of her as far as mortal sins was concerned she could say she had never committed one at the bottom of the window there were suffering souls the cauldrons that Biddy wished to see them in, the agent said, would be difficult to introduce. The suffering of the souls could be artistically indicated by flames. I shall have great joy, she said, seeing the blessed women standing about our divine Lord, singing hymns in his praise, and the sight of sinners broiling will make me sorrowful. She insisted on telling the German of the different churches she had visited, and the windows she had seen, 
and she did not notice that he was turning over his designs and referring to his notebook while she was talking. Suddenly he said, Excuse me, but I think we have got the greater part of the window you wish for in stock, and the rest can be easily made up. Now, the only question that remains is the question of the colours you care about. I've always thought there's no colour like blue. I'd like the Virgin to wear a blue cloak. She did not know why she had chosen that colour, but the agent told her that she was quite right. Blue signified chastity, and when the German had gone, she sat thinking of the Virgin and her cloak. The Minorcas and Buff Orpingtons and Plymouth Rocks came through the door cackling, and while feeding them she sat, her eyes fixed on the beautiful evening sky, wondering if the blue in the picture would be as pale, or if it would be a deeper blue. She remembered suddenly that she used to wear a blue ribbon when she went blackberrying among the hills. She found it in an old box and tied it round her neck. The moment she put it on, her memory was as if lighted up with memories of the saints and the miracles they had performed, and she went to Father Maguire to tell him of the miracle. That the agent should have in stock the very window she had imagined seemed a miracle, and she was encouraged to think some miraculous thing had happened when the priest asked her to tell him exactly what the window was like. She had often told him before but he had never listened to her, but now he recognized her window as an adaptation of Fra Angelico's picture, and he told her how the saint had wandered from monastery to monastery painting pictures on the walls. More he could not tell her, but he promised to procure a small biography of the saint. She received the book a few days later, and as she turned over the leaves she heard the children coming from school and she took the book out to them, for her sight was failing, and they read bits of it aloud, and she frightened them by dropping on her knees and crying out that God had been very good to her. She wandered over the country, visiting churches, returning to Kilmore suddenly. She was seen, as usual, at sunrise and at sunset, feeding her poultry, and then she went away again and the next time she was heard of was in a church near Dublin, celebrated for its stained glass. A few days after, Ned Kavanagh met her hurrying up the road from the station, and she told him she had just received a letter from the Munich agent, saying he had forwarded her window. It was to arrive tomorrow. It was expected some time about midday, but Biddy's patience was exhausted long before, and she walked a great part of the way to Dublin to meet the dray. She returned with it, walking with the draymen, but within three miles of Kilmore she was so tired that they had to put her on top of the boxes, and a cheer went up from the villagers when she was lifted down. She called to the workmen to be careful in unpacking the glass, and when they were putting it up she went down on her knees and prayed that no accident might happen. At sunset the church had to be closed, and it was with difficulty she was persuaded to leave it. Next morning at sunrise she was knocking at the door of the woman who was charged with the cleaning of the church, asking for the key. And from that day she was hardly ever out of the church. The charwoman began to complain that she could not get on with her work and she was telling the priest that Biddy was always at her elbow, asking her to come to her window, saying she would show her things she had not seen before. When the conversation was interrupted by Biddy, she seemed a little astray, a little exalted, and Father Maguire watched her as she knelt with uplifted face, telling her beads. He noticed that her fingers very soon ceased to move, and that she held the same bead a long time between her fingers. Minutes passed, but her lips did not move, her eyes were fixed on the panes, and her look was so enraptured that he began to wonder if paradise were being revealed to her. And while the priest wondered, Biddy listened to music inconceivably tender. 
she had been awakened from her prayers by the sound of a harp string touched very gently and the note had floated down like a flower and all the vibrations were not dead when the same note floated down the aisles once more biddy listened anxious to hear it a third time once more she heard it and the third time she saw the saint's fingers moving over the strings and she played a little tune of six notes and it was at the end of the second playing of the tune that the priest touched biddy on the shoulder she looked up and it was a long while before she saw him and she was greatly grieved that she had been awakened from her dream she said it was a dream because her happiness had been so great and she stood looking at the priest fain but unable to tell how she had been born beyond her usual life that her whole being had answered to the music the saint played and looking at him she wondered what would have happened if he had not awakened her next day was sunday and she was in the church at sunrise listening for the music but she heard and saw nothing until the priest had reached the middle of the mass the acolyte had rung the bell to prepare the people for the elevation and it was then that she heard a faint low sound that the light wire emitted when the saint touched her harp and she noticed that it was the same saint that had played yesterday the tall saint with the long fair hair who stood apart from the others looking more intently at our blessed lord than the others she touched her harp again and the note vibrated for a long while and when the last vibrations died she touched the string again the note was sweet and languid and intense and it pierced to the very core of biddy the saint's hand passed over the strings producing faint exquisite sounds so faint that biddy felt no surprise they were not heard by anyone else it was only by listening intently that she could hear them yesterday's little tune appeared again a little tune of six notes and it seemed to biddy that it was even more exquisite than it had seemed when she first heard it the only difference between today and yesterday was that today all the saints struck their harps and after playing for some time the music grew white like snow and remote as starfire and yet biddy heard it more clearly than she had heard anything before and she saw our lord more clearly than she had ever seen anybody else she saw him look up when he had placed the crown on his mother's head she heard him sing a few notes and then the saints began to sing the window filled up with song and colour and all along the window there was a continual transmutation of colour and song the figures grew taller and they breathed extraordinary life it sang like a song within them and it flowed about them and out of them in a sort of pearl-coloured mist the vision clove the church along and across and through it she could see the priest saying his mass and when he raised the host above his head biddy saw our lord look at her and his eyes brightened as if with love of her he seemed to have forgotten the saints that sang his praises so beautifully and when he bent towards her and she felt his presence about her she cried out he is coming to take me in his arms and it was then that biddy fell out of her place and lay at length on the floor of the church pale as a dead woman the clerk went to her but he could not carry her out she lay rigid as one who had been dead a long while and she muttered he is coming to put the gold crown on my head the clerk moved away and she swooned again her return to her ordinary perceptions was slow and painful the people had left long ago and she tottered out of the empty church and followed the road to her cabin without seeing it or the people whom she met on the road at last a woman took her by the arm and led her into her cabin and spoke to her she could not answer at first but she awoke gradually and she began to remember that she had heard music in the window 
and that our Lord had sung to her. The neighbour left her babbling. She began to feed her chickens, and was glad when she had fed them. She wanted to think of the great and wonderful sights she had seen. She could not particularise, preferring to remember her vision as a whole, unwilling to separate the music from the colour, or the colour and the music from the adoration of the saints. As the days went by, her life seemed to pass more and more out of the life of the ordinary day. She seemed to live, as it were, on the last verge of human life. The mortal and immortal mingled. She felt she had been always conscious of the immortal, and that nothing had happened except the withdrawing of a veil. The memory of her vision was still intense in her, but she wished to renew it and waited next Sunday breathless with anticipation. The vision began at the same moment, the signal was the same as before, the note from the harp string floated down the aisles, and when it had been repeated three times, the saintly fingers moved over the strings, and she heard the beautiful little tune. Every eye was upon her, and, forgetful of the fact that the priest was celebrating Mass, they said, look, she hears the saints singing about her, she sees Christ coming. The priest heard Biddy cry out, Christ is coming, and she fell prone, and none dared to raise her up, and she lay there till the mass was finished. When the priest left the altar, she was still lying at length, and the people were about her, and knowing how much she would feel the slightest reproof, he did not say a word that would throw doubt upon her statement. He did not like to impugn a popular belief, but he felt himself obliged to exercise clerical control. Now, Biddy, I know you are a very pious woman, but I cannot allow you to interrupt the Mass. If the Lord comes to me, am I not to receive him, Your Reverence? In the first place, I object to your dress. You are not properly dressed. She wore a bright blue cloak. She seemed to wear hardly anything else, and tresses of dirty hair hung over her shoulders. The Lord has not said anything to me about my dress, Your Reverence, and he put his gold crown on my head today. Biddy, is all this true? As true as you're standing there. I am not asking you if your visions are true. I have my opinion about that. I am asking if they are true to you. True to me, Your Reverence? I don't rightly understand. I want to know if you think our Lord put a gold crown on your head today. To be sure he did, Your Reverence. If he did, where is it? Where is it, Your Reverence? It is with him, to be sure. He wouldn't be leaving it on my head, and me walking about the parish. That would not be reasonable at all, I am thinking. He doesn't want me to be robbed. There is no one in the parish who would rob you. Maybe someone would come out of another parish, if I was walking about with a gold crown on my head, and such a crown as he put upon it. I am sorry you did not see it, but your reverence was saying the Holy Mass at the time. And she fell on her knees and clung to his cassock. And you saw the crown, Biddy? I had it on my head, your reverence. And you heard the saints singing? Yes, and I will tell you what they were singing. And she began crooning. Something like that, your reverence. You don't believe me but we have only our ears and our eyes to guide us. I don't say I don't believe you, Biddy, but you may be deceived. Sorrow deceiving, Your Reverence, or I've been deceived all my life. And now, Your Reverence, if you have no more business with me, I will go, for they are waiting in the chapel yard to hear me tell them about the crown that was put upon my head. Well, Biddy, I want you to understand that I cannot have you interrupting the Mass. I cannot permit it. The visions may be true or not true, but you must not interrupt the Mass. Do you hear me? The acolyte had opened the door of the sacristy. 
she slipped through it, and the priest took off his cassock. As he did so, he noticed that the acolytes were anxious to get out. They were at the window watching, and when the priest looked out of the window, he saw the people gathered about Biddy, and could see she had obtained an extraordinary hold on the popular imagination. No one noticed him when he came out of the sacristy. They were listening to Biddy, and he stood unnoticed amid the crowd for a few minutes. "'She's out of her mind,' he said. "'She's as good as mad. "'What did she tell me? "'That our Lord put a crown on her head?' "'It was difficult to know what to do. "'News of her piety had reached Dublin. "'People had been down to Kilmore to see her "'and had given subscriptions, "'and he understood that Biddy had enabled him "'to furnish his church with varnished pews and holy pictures.' A pious Catholic lady had sent him two fine statues of Our Lady and St. Joseph. St. Joseph was in a purple cloak, and Our Lady wore a blue cloak, and there were gold stars upon it. He had placed these two statues on the two side altars. But there were many things he wanted for his church, and he could only get them through Biddy. It was, therefore, his interest to let her remain in Kilmore only she could not be allowed to interrupt the mass and he felt that he must be allowed to pass in and out of his church without having to put up with extravagant salutations he was going home to his breakfast and a young man extremely interested in ecclesiastical art was coming to breakfast with him the young man had a great deal to say about walter pater and chartres cathedral and Father Maguire feared he was cutting but a very poor figure in the eyes of this young man, for he could not keep his thoughts on what the young man was saying. He was thinking of Biddy. He hardly thought of anything else now. She was absorbing the mind of his entire parish. She interrupted the mass. He could not go into his church without being accosted by this absurd old woman, and this young man a highly cultivated young man who had just come from italy and who took the highest interest in architecture would not be able to see his church in peace as soon as they entered it they would be accosted by this old woman she would follow them about asking them to look at her window telling them her visions which might or might not be true she had a knack of hiding herself he often came upon her suddenly behind the pillars, and sometimes he found her in the confessional. As soon as he crossed the threshold, he began to look for her, and not finding her in any likely place, his fears subsided, and he called the young man's attention to the altar that had been especially designed for his church. And the young man began to tell the priest of the altars he had seen that spring in Italy when suddenly he uttered a cry, he suddenly felt a hand upon his shoulder. "'Your honour will be well rewarded if you will come to my window. Now why should I tell you a lie, your reverence?' She threw herself at the priest's feet, and besought him to believe that the saints had been with her, and that every word she was speaking was the truth. "'Biddy!' If you don't go away at once, I will not allow you inside the church tomorrow. The young man looked at the priest, surprised at his sternness, and the priest said, She has become a great trial to us at Kilmore. Come aside, and I will tell you about her. And when the priest had told the young man about the window, the young man asked if Biddy would have to be sent away. I hope not. For if she were separated from her window, she would certainly die. It came out of her savings, out of the money she made, out of chickens. And what has become of the chickens? She has forgotten all about them. They wandered away or died. She has been evicted, and she lives now in an outhouse. She lives on the bits of bread and the potatoes the neighbours give her. The things of this world are no longer realities to her. Her realities are what she sees and hears in that window. She told me last night the saints were singing about her. I don't like to encourage her to talk, but if you would like to hear her... 
Biddy, come here. The old woman came back as a dog comes to its master, joyful and with brightening eyes. Tell us what you saw last night. Well, your reverence, I was asleep, and there suddenly came a knocking at the door, and I got up, and then I heard a voice say, Open the door. There was a beautiful young man outside, his hair was yellow and curly, and he was dressed in white. He came into the room first, and he was followed by other saints, and they had harps in their hands, and they sang for a long while. They sang beautiful music. Come to the window and you will hear it for yourselves. Someone is always singing it in the window, not always as clearly as they did last night. We'll go to see your window presently. The old woman crept back to her place, and the priest and the young man began to talk about the possibilities of miracles in modern times. And they talked on until the sudden sight of Biddy gave them pause. Look at her, said the young man. Can you doubt that she sees heaven quite plainly, and that the saints visited her just as she told us? No doubt, no doubt. But she's a great trial to us at Mass. The Mass must not be interrupted. I suppose even miracles are inconvenient at times, Father Maguire. Be patient with her, let her enjoy her happiness. And the two men stood looking at her, trying vainly to imagine what her happiness might be. End of Some Parishioners Chapter 3, Part 1 of The Untilled Field by George Moore this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Exile, Part 1 Section 1 Pat Phelan's bullocks were ready for the fair, and so were his pigs. But the two fairs happened to come on the same day, and it was the pigs he would prefer to sell himself. His eldest son, James, was staying at home to help Catherine Ford with her churning. Peter, his second son, was not much of a hand at a bargain. It was Pat and James who managed the farm, and when Peter had gone to bed, they began to wonder if Peter would be able to sell the bullocks. Pat said Peter had been told what was the lowest price he could take. James said there was a good demand for cattle, and at last they decided that Peter could not fail to sell the beasts. Pat was to meet Peter at the crossroads about twelve o'clock in the day, but he had sold his pigs early, and was half an hour in front of him and sitting on the stile waiting for his son. He thought if Peter got thirteen pounds apiece for the bullocks, he would say he had done very well. A good jobber, he thought, would be able to get ten shillings apiece more for them, and he went on thinking of what price Peter would get, until suddenly looking up the road, whom should he see but Peter coming down the road with the bullocks in front of him. He could hardly believe his eyes, and it was a long story that Peter told him about two men who wanted to buy the bullocks early in the morning. They had offered him eleven pounds ten, and when he would not sell them at that price, they had stood laughing at the bullocks and doing all they could to keep off other buyers. Peter was quite certain it was not his fault, and he began to argue. But Pat Phelan was too disappointed to argue with him, and he let him go on talking. At last Peter ceased talking, and this seemed to Pat Phelan a good thing. The bullocks trotted in front of them. They were seven miles from home, and fifteen miles are hard on fat animals, and he could truly say he was at a loss of three pounds that day if he took into account the animal's keep. Father and son walked on, and not a word passed between them till they came to Michael Quinn's public house. Did you get three pounds apiece for the pigs, father? I did, and three pounds five. We might have a drink out of that. 
it seemed to peter that the men inside were laughing at him or at the lemonade he was drinking and seeing among them one who had been interfering with him all day he told him he would put him out of the house and he would have done it if mrs quinn had not told him that no one put a man out of her house without her leave do you hear that peter phelan if you can't best them at the fair said his father it will be little good for you to put them out of the public house afterwards and on that peter swore he would never go to a fair again and they walked on until they came to the priest's house it was bad for me when i listened to you and james if i hadn't i might have been in maynooth now now didn't you come home talking of the police wasn't that after they could not agree as to when his idea of life had changed from the priesthood to the police nor when it had changed back from the police to the priesthood and peter talked on telling of the authors he had read with father tom caesar virgil even quintilian the priest had said that quintilian was too difficult for him and pat phelan was in doubt whether the difficulty of quintilian was a sufficient reason for preferring the police to the priesthood anyway it isn't a girl that's troubling him he said to himself and he looked at peter and wondered how it was that peter did not want to be married peter was a great big fellow over six feet high that many a girl would take a fancy to and pat phelan had long had his eye on a girl who would marry him and the failure to sell the bullocks brought all the advantages of this marriage to pat phelan's mind and he began to talk to his son peter listened and seemed to take an interest in all that was said expressing now and then a doubt if the girl would marry him the possibility that she might seemed to turn his thoughts again towards the priesthood the bullocks had stopped to graze and peter's indecisions threw pat phelan fairly out of his humour well peter i am tired listening to you if it's a priest you want to be go in there and father tom will tell you what you must do and i'll drive the bullocks home myself and on that pat laid his hand on the priest's green gate and peter walked through section two there were trees about the priest's house and there were two rooms on the right and left of the front door the parlor was on the left and when peter came in the priest was sitting reading in his mahogany armchair peter wondered if it were this very mahogany chair that had put the idea of being a priest into his head just now while walking with his father he had been thinking that they had not even a wooden armchair in their house though it was the best house in the village only some stools and some plain wooden chairs the priest could see that peter had come to him for a purpose but peter did not speak he sat raising his pale perplexed eyes looking at the priest from time to time thinking that if he told father tom of his failure at the fair father tom might think he only wished to become a priest because he had no taste for farming you said father tom if i worked hard i should be able to read quintilian in six months the priest's face always lighted up at the name of a classical author and peter said he was sorry he had been taken away from his studies but he had been thinking the matter over and his mind was quite made up and he was sure he would sooner be a priest than anything else my boy i knew you would never put on the policeman's belt the bishop will hold an examination for the places that are vacant in maynooth peter promised to work hard and he already saw himself sitting in an armchair in a mahogany armchair reading classics and winning admiration for his learning he walked home thinking that everything was at last decided when suddenly without warning when he was thinking of something else his heart misgave him it was as if he heard a voice saying my boy i don't think you will ever put on the cassock you will never walk with the beretta on your head the priest had said 
that he did not believe he would ever buckle on the policeman's belt. He was surprised to hear the priest say this, though he had often heard himself thinking the same thing. What surprised and frightened him now was that he heard himself saying he would never put on the cassock and the beretta. It is frightening to hear yourself saying you are not going to do the thing you have just made up your mind you will do. He had often thought he would like to put the money he would get out of the farm into a shop, but when it came to the point of deciding, he had not been able to make up his mind. He had always had a great difficulty in knowing what was the right thing to do. His uncle William had never thought of anything but the priesthood. James never thought of anything but the farm. A certain friend of his had never thought of doing anything but going to America. Suddenly he heard someone call him. It was Catherine, and Peter wondered if she were thinking to tell him she was going to marry James, for she always knew what she wanted. Many said that James was not the one she wanted, but Peter did not believe that and he looked at Catherine and admired her face, and thought what a credit she would be to the family. No one wore such beautifully knitted stockings as Catherine, and no one's boots were so prettily laced. But not knowing exactly what to say, he asked her if she had come from their house, and he went on talking, telling her that she would find nobody in the parish like James. James was the best farmer in the parish, none such a judge of cattle. And he said all this, and a great deal more, until he saw that Catherine did not care to talk about James at all. I dare say all you say is right, Peter, but you see, he's your brother. And then, fearing she had said something hurtful, she told him, that she liked James as much as a girl could like a man who was not going to be her husband. And are you sure, Catherine, that James is not going to be your husband? Yes, she said, quite sure. Their talk had taken them as far as Catherine's door, and Peter went away wondering why he had not told her he was going to Maynooth for no one would have been able to advise him as well as Catherine. She had such good sense. Section 3 There was a quarter of a mile between the two houses, and while Peter was talking to Catherine, Pat Phelan was listening to his son James, who was telling his father that Catherine had said she would not marry him. Pat was over sixty, but he did not give one the impression of an old man. The hair was not grey, there was still a little red in the whiskers. James, who sat opposite to him, holding his hands to the blaze, was not as good-looking a man as his father. The nose was not as fine, nor were the eyes as keen. There was more of the father in Peter than in James. When Peter opened the half-door, awakening the dozen hens that roosted on the beam, he glanced from one to the other, for he suspected that his father was telling James how he had failed to sell the bullocks. But the tone of his father's voice when he asked him what had detained him on the road told him he was mistaken. And then he remembered that Catherine had said she would not marry James, and he began to pity his brother. I met Catherine on the road, and I could do no less than walk as far as her door with her. You could do no less than that, Peter, said James. And what do you mean by that, James? Only this, that it is always the crooked way, Peter. For if it had been you that had asked her, she would have had you and jumping. She would have had me? And now don't you think you had better run after her, Peter? and ask her if she'll have you. I'll never do that, and it's hurtful, James, that you should think such a thing of me, that I would go behind your back and try to get a girl from you. I did not mean that, Peter, but if she won't have me, you had better try if you can get her. And suddenly Peter felt a resolve come into his heart 
and his manner grew exultant. I've seen Father Tom, and he said I can pass the examination, and I'm going to be a priest. And when they were lying down side by side, Peter said, James, it will be all right. Knowing there was a great heart sickness on his brother, he put out his hand. As sure as I lie here, she will be lying next to you before this day twelve months. Yes, James, in this very bed, lying here where I am lying now. I don't believe it, Peter. Peter loved his brother, and to bring the marriage about, he took some money from his father and went to live at Father Tom's, and he worked so hard during the next two months that he passed the bishop's examination, and it was late one night when he went to bid them good-bye at home. What makes you so late, Peter? Well, James, I didn't want to meet Catherine on the road. You are a good boy, Peter, said the father, and God will reward you for the love you bear your brother. I don't think there are two better men in the world. God has been good to me to give me two such sons. And then the three sat around the fire, and Pat Phelan began to talk family history. Well, Peter, you see, there has always been a priest in the family, and it would be a pity if there was not one in this generation. In forty-eight, your grand-uncles joined the rebels, and they had to leave the country. You have an uncle a priest, and you are just like your uncle William. And then James talked, but he did not seem to know very well what he was saying, and his father told him to stop that Peter was going where God had called him. And you will tell her, Peter said, getting up, that I have gone. I haven't the heart for telling her such a thing. She will be finding it out soon enough. Outside the house, for he was sleeping at Father Tom's that night, Peter thought there was little luck in James's eyes. Inside the house, Pat Phelan and James thought that Peter was settled for life. He will be a fine man standing on an altar, James said, and perhaps he will be a bishop some day. And you'll see her when you're done reaping, and you won't forget what Peter told you, said Pat Phelan. And after reaping, James put on his coat and walked up the hillside, where he thought he would find Catherine. I hear Peter has left you, she said, as he opened the gate to let the cows through. He came last night to bid us good-bye. And they followed the cows under the tall hedges. I shall be reaping tomorrow, he said. I will see you at the same time. And henceforth he was always at hand to help her to drive her cows home. And every night, as he sat with his father by the fire, Pat Phelan expected James to tell him about Catherine. One evening he came back overcome, looking so wretched that his father could see that Catherine had told him she would not marry him. She won't have me, he said. A man can always get a girl if he tries long enough, his father said, hoping to encourage him. That would be true enough for another. Catherine knows she will never get Peter. Another man might get her, but I'm always reminding her of Peter. She told him the truth one day, that if she did not marry Peter, she would marry no one, and James felt like dying. He grew pale and could not speak, and at last he said, How is that? I don't know. I don't know, James. But you mustn't talk to me about marriage again. And he had to promise her not to speak of marriage again, and he kept his word. At the end of the year she asked him if he had any news of Peter. The last news we had of him was about a month ago, and he said he hoped to be admitted into the minor orders. And a few days afterwards he heard that Catherine had decided to go into a convent. 
So this is the way it has ended, he thought. And he seemed no longer fit for work on the farm. He was seen about the road, smoking, and sometimes he went down to the ball alley and sat watching the games in the evening. It was thought that he would take to drink, but he took to fishing instead, and was out all day in his little boat on the lake, however hard the wind might blow. The fisherman said he had seen him in the part of the lake where the wind blew the hardest, and that he could hardly pull against the waves. His mind is away. I don't think he'll do any good in this country, his father said. And the old man was very sad, for when James was gone he would have no one, and he did not feel he would be able to work the farm for many years longer. He and James used to sit smoking on either side of the fireplace, and Pat Phelan knew that James was thinking of America all the while. One evening, as they were sitting like this, the door was opened suddenly. Peter, said James, and he jumped up from the fire to welcome his brother. It is good for sore eyes to see the sight of you again, said Pat Phelan. Well, tell us the news. If we had known you were coming, we would have sent the cart to meet you. As Peter did not answer, they began to think that something must have happened. Perhaps Peter was not going to become a priest after all, and would stay at home with his father to learn to work the farm. You see, I did not know myself until yesterday. It was only yesterday that... So you are not going to be a priest? We are glad to hear that, Peter. How is that? He had thought over what he should say, and without waiting to hear why they were glad, he told them the professor, who overlooked his essays, had refused to recognize their merits. He had condemned the best things in them. And Peter said it was extraordinary that such a man should be appointed to such a place. Then he told them that the church afforded little chances for the talents of young men unless they had a great deal of influence and they sat listening to him, hearing how the college might be reformed. He had a gentle, winning way of talking, and his father and brother forgot their own misfortunes, thinking how they might help him. Well, Peter, you have come back none too soon. And how is that? What have you been doing since I went away? You all wanted to hear about Maynooth. Of course we did, my boy. Tell him, James. Oh, it is nothing in particular, said James. It is only this, Peter. I am going to America. And who will work the farm? Well, Peter, we were thinking that you might work it yourself. I work the farm? Going to America, James? But what about Catherine? That's what I'm coming to, Peter. She has gone into a convent. And that's what's happened since you went away. I can't stop here, Peter. I will never do a hand's turn in Ireland. And father is getting too old to go to the fairs. That's what we were thinking when you came in. There was a faint tremble in his voice, and Peter saw how heart-sick his brother was. I will do my best, James. I knew you would. Yes, I will, said Peter, and he sat down by the fire, and his father said, You are not smoking, Peter. No, he said, I've given up smoking. Will you drink something, said James. We have got a drain of whiskey in the house. No, I have had to give up spirits. It doesn't agree with me and I don't take tea in the morning. Have you got any cocoa in the house? It was not the kind of cocoa he liked, but he said he would be able to manage. Section 4 And when the old man came through the doorway in the morning, buttoning his braces, he saw Peter stirring his cocoa. There was something absurd, as well as something attractive, in Peter, 
and his father had to laugh when he said he couldn't eat American bacon. My stomach wouldn't retain it. I require very little, but that little must be the best. And when James took him into the farmyard, he noticed that Peter crossed the yard like one who had never been in a farmyard before. He looked less like a farmer than ever, and when he looked at the cows, James wondered if he could be taught to see the difference between an Aldenay and a Durham. There's Kate, he said. She's a good cow, as good a cow as we have, and we can't get any price for her because of that hump on her back. They went to the styes. There were three pigs there and a great sow with twelve little bonhams and the little ones were white with silky hair, and Peter asked how old they were, and when they would be fit for killing. And James told Peter there were seven acres in the big field. Last year we had oats in the holly field, next year we'll sow potatoes there. And he explained the rotation of crops. And now, he said, we will go down to Crow's Oak, you have never done any ploughing, Peter. I will show you. It was extraordinary how little Peter knew. He could not put the harness on the horse, and he reminded James that he had gone into the post office when he left school. James gave in to him that the old red horse was hard to drive, but James could drive him better than Peter could lead him and Peter marvelled at the skill with which James raised his hand from the shaft of the plough and struck the horse with the rein while he kept the plough steady with the other hand. Now, Peter, you must try again. At the end of the headland where the plough turned, Peter always wanted to stop and talk about something, but James said they would have to get on with the work, and Peter walked after the plough, straining after it for three hours, and then he said, James, let me drive the horse. I can do no more. You won't feel it so much when you are accustomed to it, said James. Anything seemed to him better than a day's ploughing, even getting up at three in the morning to go to a fair. He went to bed early, as he used to, and they talked of him over the fire, as they used to. But however much they talked, they never seemed to find what they were seeking, his vocation, until one evening an idea suddenly rose out of their talk. A good wife is the only thing for Peter, said Pat, and they went on thinking. A husband would be better for her, said Pat Phelan, than a convent. I cannot say I agree with you there. Think of all the good them nuns are doing. She isn't a nun yet, said Pat Phelan, and the men smoked on a while, and they ruminated as they smoked. It would be better, James, that Peter got her than that she would stay in a convent. I wouldn't say that, said James. You see, said his father, she did not go into the convent because she had a calling, but because she was crossed in love. And after another long while, James said, It is a bitter dose, I am thinking, father, but you must go and tell her that Peter has left Maynooth. And what would the Reverend Mother be saying to me if I went to her with such a story as that? Isn't your heart broken enough already, James, without wanting me to be breaking it still more? Sure, James, you could never see her married to Peter. If she were to marry Peter, I should be able to go to America, and that is the only thing for me. That would be poor consolation for you, James. Well, it is the best I shall get, to see Peter settled, and to know that there will be someone to look after you, father. You are a good son, James. They talked on, and as they talked, it became clearer to them that someone must go tomorrow to the convent and tell Catherine that Peter had left Maynooth. But wouldn't it be a pity, said Pat Phelan, to tell her this if Peter is not going to marry her in the end? 
I will have him out of his bed, said James, and he'll tell us before this fire if he will or won't. It's a serious thing you are doing, James, to get a girl out of a convent, I am thinking. It will be on my advice that you will be doing this, father, and now I'll go and get Peter out of his bed. And Peter was brought in, asking what they wanted of him at this hour of the night, and when they told him what they had been talking about and the plans they had been making, he said he would be catching his death of cold, and they threw some sods of turf on the fire. It is against myself that I am asking a girl to leave the convent, even for you, Peter, said James. But we can think of nothing else. Peter will be able to tell us if it's a sin that we'd be doing. It is only right that Catherine should know the truth before she made her vows, Peter said. But this is very unexpected, father. I really, Peter, I'd take it as a great kindness. I shall never do a hand's turn in this country. I want to get to America. It will be the saving of me. And now, Peter, said his father, tell us for sure if you will have the girl. Faith, I will, though I never thought of marriage, if it be to please James. Seeing how heartsick his brother was, he said, I can't say I like her as you like her. But if she likes me, I will promise to do right by her. James, you are going away. We may never see you again. It is all very sad. And now you'll let me go back to bed. Peter, I knew you would not say no to me. I can't bear this any longer. And now, said Peter, let me go back to bed. I'm catching my death. And he ran back to his room and left his brother and father talking by the fire. End of the Exile, Part 1「Chapter Three, Part Two of the Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Exile, Part Two, Section Five. Pat thought the grey mare would take him in faster than the old red horse, and the old man sat, his legs swinging over the shaft wondering what he should say to the reverend mother and how she would listen to his story and when he came to the priest's house a great wish came upon him to ask the priest's advice the priest was walking up his little lawn reading his breviary and a great fear came upon pat whelan and he thought he must ask the priest what he should do the priest heard the story over the little wall and he was sorry for the old man. It took him a long time to tell the story, and when he was finished the priest said, But where are you going, Pat? That's what I stopped to tell you, Your Reverence. I was thinking I might be going to the convent to tell Catherine that Peter has come back. Well, it wasn't yourself that thought of doing such a thing as that, Pat Phelan. But at every word the priest said, Pat Phelan's face grew more stubborn, and at last he said, Well, Your Reverence, that isn't the advice I expected from you, and he struck the mare with the ends of the reins and let her trot up the hill. Nor did the mare stop trotting till she had reached the top of the hill, and Pat Phelan had never known her to do such a thing before. From the top of the hill there was a view of the bog, and Pat thought of the many fine loads of turf he had had out of that bog, and the many young fellows he had seen there cutting turf. But every one is leaving the country, the old man said to himself, and his chin dropped into his shirt collar, and he held the reins loosely, letting the mare trot or walk as she liked. And he let many pass him without bidding them the hour of the day, for he was too much overcome by his own grief to notice any one. The mare trotted gleefully. Soft clouds curled over the low horizon far away, and the sky was blue overhead, 
and the poor country was very beautiful in the still autumn weather, only it was empty. He passed two or three fine houses that the gentry had left to caretakers long ago. The fences were gone, cattle strayed through the woods, the drains were choked with weeds, the stagnant water was spread out into the fields, and Pat Feeler noticed these things, for he remembered what this country was forty years ago. The devil a bit of lonesomeness there was in it then. He asked a girl if they would be thatching the house that autumn, but she answered that the thatch would last out the old people, and she was going to join her sister in America. She's right, they're all there now. Why should anyone stop here? the old man said. The mare tripped, and he took this to be a sign that he should turn back, but he did not go back. Very soon the town began, in broken pavements and dirty cottages. Going up the hill there were some slated roofs, but there was no building of any importance, except the church. At the end of the main street, where the trees began again, the convent stood in the middle of a large garden, and Pat Phelan remembered he had heard that the nuns were doing well with their dairy and their laundry. He knocked and a lay sister peeped through the grating, and then she opened the door a little way, and at first he thought he would have to go back without seeing either Catherine or the Reverend Mother, for he had got no further than Sister Catherine, when the lay sister cut him short with the news that Sister Catherine was in retreat and could see no one. The Reverend Mother was busy. But, said Pat, you're not going to let Catherine take vows without hearing me. If it is about Sister Catherine's vows, yes, it is about them I've come, and I must see the Reverend Mother. The lay sister said Sister Catherine was going to be clothed at the end of the week. Well, that is just the reason I've come here. On that, the lay sister led him into the parlour and went in search of the Reverend Mother. The floor was so thickly beeswaxed that the rug slipped under his feet, and, afraid lest he might fall down, he stood quite still, impressed by the pious pictures on the walls, and by the large books upon the table, and by the poor box, and by the pious inscriptions. He began to think how much easier was this pious life than the life of the world, the rearing of children, the failure of crops, and the loneliness. Here life slips away without one perceiving it, and it seemed a pity to bring her back to trouble. He stood holding his hat in his old hands, and the time seemed very long. At last the door opened, and a tall woman with sharp inquisitive eyes came in. You have come to speak to me about Sister Catherine? Yes, my lady. And what have you got to tell me about her? Well, my son thought, and I thought, last night, we were all thinking we had better tell you, last night was the night that my son came back. At the word Maynooth a change of expression came into her face, but when he told her that Peter no longer wished to be a priest, her manner began to grow hostile again, and she got up from her chair and said, but really, Mr. Phelan, I have got a great deal of business to attend to. But, my lady, you see that Catherine wanted to marry my son Peter, and it is because he went to Maynooth that she came here. I don't think she'd want to be a nun if she knew that he didn't want to be a priest. I cannot agree with you, Mr. Phelan, in that. I have seen a great deal of Sister Catherine. She has been with us now for nearly a year and if she ever entertained the wishes you speak of, I feel sure she has forgotten them. Her mind is now set on higher things. Of course you may be right, my lady, very likely. It isn't for me to argue with you about such things, but you see I have come a long way, and if I could see Catherine herself... That is impossible. Catherine is in retreat. So the lay sister told me, but I thought... 
Sister Catherine is going to be clothed next Saturday, and I can assure you, Mr. Phelan, that the wishes you tell me of are forgotten. I know her very well. I can answer for Sister Catherine. The rug slipped under the peasant's feet, and his eyes wandered round the room, and the Reverend Mother told him how busy she was. She really could not talk to him any more that day. You see, it all rests with Sister Catherine herself. That's just it, said the old man. That's just it, my lady. My son Peter, who has come from Maynooth, told us last night that Catherine should know everything that has happened, so that she may not be sorry afterwards. Otherwise I wouldn't have come here, my lady. I wouldn't have come to trouble you. I am sorry, Mr. Phelan, that your son Peter has left Maynooth. It is sad indeed when one finds that one has not a vocation. But that happens sometimes. I don't think it will be Catherine's case. And now, Mr. Phelan, I must ask you to excuse me. And the Reverend Mother persuaded the unwilling peasant into the passage, and he followed the lay sister down the passage to the gate and got into his cart again. No wonder, he thought, they don't want to let Catherine out. Now that they have got that great farm, and not one amongst them, I'll be bound, who can manage it except Catherine? At the very same moment, the same thought passed through the Reverend Mother's mind. She had not left the parlour yet, and stood thinking how she should manage if Catherine were to leave them. Why, she asked, should he choose to leave Maynooth at such a time? It is indeed unfortunate. There is nothing, she reflected, that gives a woman so much strength as to receive the veil. She always feels stronger after her clothing. She feels that the world is behind her. The Reverend Mother reflected that, perhaps, it would be better for Catherine's sake and for Peter's sake, indeed for everyone's sake, if she were not to tell Catherine of Pat Phelan's visit until after the clothing. She might tell Catherine three months hence. The disadvantage of this would be that Catherine might hear that Peter had left Maynooth. In a country place, news of this kind cannot be kept out of a convent. And if Catherine were going to leave, it were better that she should leave them now than leave them six months hence after her clothing. There are many ways of looking at it, the Reverend Mother reflected. If I don't tell her, she may never hear it. I might tell her later, when she has taught one of the nuns how to manage the farm. She took two steps towards the door, and stopped to think again. And she was thinking, when a knock came to the door. She answered mechanically, Come in. And Catherine wondered at the Reverend Mother's astonishment. I wish to speak to you, dear mother, she said timidly. But seeing the Reverend Mother's face change expression, she said, perhaps another time will suit you better. The Reverend Mother stood looking at her irresolute, and Catherine, who had never seen the Reverend Mother irresolute before, wondered what was passing in her mind. I know you are busy, dear mother, but what I have come to tell you won't take very long. Well then, tell it to me, my child. It is only this, Reverend Mother. I had better tell you now, for you are expecting the bishop, and my clothing is fixed for the end of the week, and... And, said the Reverend Mother, you feel that you are not certain of your vacation? That is it, dear Mother. I thought I had better tell you. Reading disappointment in the nun's face, Catherine said, I hesitated to tell you before. I had hoped that the feeling would pass away, but, dear mother, it isn't my fault. Everyone has not a vocation. Then Catherine noticed a softening in the Reverend Mother's face, and she asked Catherine to sit down by her. And Catherine told her she had come to the convent because she was crossed in love, and not as the others came, because they wished to give up their wills to God. Our will is the most precious thing in us, and that is why the best thing we can do is to give it up to you. For in giving it up to you, dear mother, we are giving it up to God. I know all these things, but... You should have told me of this when you came here, Catherine, and then I would not have advised you to come to live with us. 
Mother, you must forgive me. My heart was broken, and I could not do otherwise. And you have said yourself that I made the dairy a success. If you had stayed with us, Catherine, you would have made the dairy a success. But we have got no one to take your place. However, since it is the will of God, I suppose we must try to get on as well as we can without you. And now tell me, Catherine, when it was that you changed your mind, it was only the other day you told me you wished to become a nun. You said you were most anxious for your clothing. How is it that you have changed your mind? Catherine's eyes brightened, and speaking like one illuminated by some inward light, she said, It was the second day of my retreat, mother. I was walking in the garden where the great cross stands amid the rocks. Sister Angela and Sister Mary were with me, and I was listening to what they were saying, when suddenly my thoughts were taken away, and I remembered those at home. I remembered Mr. Phelan and James, who wanted to marry me, but whom I would not marry. And it seemed to me that I saw him leaving his father. It seemed to me that I saw him going away to America. I don't know how it was. You will not believe me, dear mother, but I saw the ship lying in the harbour that is to take him away. And then I thought of the old man sitting at home with no one to look after him. And it was not a seeming, but a certainty, mother. It came over me suddenly that my duty was not here, but there. Of course you can't agree with me, but I cannot resist it. It was a call. But the evil one, my dear child, calls us too. We must be careful not to mistake the devil's call for God's call. Mother, I dare say. Tears came to Catherine's eyes. She began to weep. I can't argue with you, mother. I only know. She could not speak for sobbing, and between her sobs she said, I only know that I must go home. She recovered herself very soon, and the reverend mother took her hand and said, Well, my dear child, I shall not stand in your way. Even the reverend mother could not help thinking that the man who got her would get a charming wife. Her face was rather long and white, and she had long female eyes with dark lashes, and her eyes were full of tenderness. She had spoken out of so deep a conviction that the reverend mother had begun to believe that her mission was, perhaps, to look after this hapless young man. And when she told the Reverend Mother that yesterday she had felt a conviction that Peter was not going to be a priest, the Reverend Mother felt that she must tell her of Pat Phelan's visit. I did not tell you at once, my dear child, because I wished to know from yourself how you felt about this matter, the nun said, and she told Catherine that she was quite right, that Peter had left Maynooth. He hopes to marry you, Catherine. A quiet glow came into the postulant's eyes, and she seemed engulfed in some deep joy. How did he know that I cared for him? The girl said, half to herself, half to the nun. I suppose his father or his brother must have told him, the nun answered. And then Catherine, fearing to show too much interest in things that the nun deemed frivolous, said, I am sorry to leave before my work is done here. But, mother, so it has all come true. It was extraordinary what I felt that morning in the garden, she said, returning to her joy. Mother, do you believe in visions? The saints, of course, have had visions. We believe in the visions of the saints. But after all, mother, there are many duties besides religious duties. I suppose, Catherine, you feel it to be your duty to look after this young man? Yes, I think that is it. I must go now, mother, and see Sister Angela, and write out for her all I know about the farm and what she is to do, for if one is not very careful with a farm, one loses a great deal of money. There is no such thing as making two ends meet. One either makes money or loses money. And then Catherine again seemed to be engulfed in some deep joy, out of which she roused herself with difficulty. 
Section 6 When her postulant left the room, the Reverend Mother wrote to Pat Phelan, asking him to come next morning with his cart to fetch Catherine. And next morning, when the lay sister told Catherine that he was waiting for her, the Reverend Mother said, We shall be able to manage, Catherine. You have told Sister Angela everything, and you will not forget to come to see us, I hope. Mr. Phelan, said the lay sister, told me to tell you that one of his sons is going to America today. Sister Catherine will have to go at once if she wishes to see him. I must see James. I must see him before he leaves for America. Oh, she said, turning to the Reverend Mother, do you remember that I told you I had seen the ship? Everything has come true. You can't believe any longer that it is not a call. Her box was in the cart, and as Pat turned the mare round, he said, I hope we won't miss James at the station. That's the reason I came for you so early. I thought you would like to see him. Why did you not come earlier? she cried. All my happiness will be spoilt if I don't see James. The convent was already behind her, and her thoughts were now upon poor James, whose heart she had broken. She knew that Peter would never love her as well as James, but this could not be helped. Her vision in the garden consoled her, for she could no longer doubt that she was doing right in going to Peter, that her destiny was with him. She knew the road well. She knew all the fields, every house and every gap in the walls. Sign after sign went by. At last they were within sight of the station. The signal was still up, and the train had not gone yet. At the end of the platform she saw James and Peter. She let Pat feel and drive the cart round. She could get to them quicker by running down the steps and crossing the line. The signal went down. Peter, she said, we shall have time to talk presently. I want to speak to James now and they walked up to the platform, leaving Peter to talk to his father. Peter, she said, we shall have time to talk presently. I want to speak to James now. And they walked up to the platform, leaving Peter to talk to his father. Paddy Maguire is outside, Pat said. I asked him to stand at the mare's head. James, said Catherine, it is very sad you are going away. We may never see you again, and there is no time to talk, and I've much to say to you. I am going away, Catherine, but maybe I will be coming back some day. I was going to say, maybe you would be coming over after me. But the land is good land, and you'll be able to make a living out of it. And then they spoke of Peter. James said he was too great a scholar for a farmer and it was a pity he could not find out what he was fit for, for surely he was fit for something great after all. And Catherine said, I shall be able to make something out of Peter. His emotion almost overcame him, and Catherine looked aside so that she could not see his tears. This is no time for talking of Peter, she said. You are going away, James, but you will come back. You will find another woman better than I am in America, James. I don't know what to say to you. The train will be here in a minute. I am distracted. But one day you will be coming back, and we shall be very proud of you when you come back. I shall rebuild the house, and we shall all be happy then. Oh, here's the train. Goodbye. You have been very good to me. Oh, James, shall I ever see you again? Then the crowd swept them along, and James had to take his father's hand and his brother's hand. There were a great many people in the station. Hundreds were going away in the same ship that James was going in. The train was followed by wailing relatives. They ran alongside of the train, waving their hands until they could no longer keep up with the train. James waved a red handkerchief until the train was out of sight. It disappeared in a cutting, and a moment after, Catherine and Peter remembered they were standing side by side. They were going to be married in a few days. They started a little, hearing a step beside them. It was old Phelan. 
I think, he said, it is time to be getting home. End of The Exile Chapter 4 of The Untilled Field by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Home Sickness, Section 1 He told the doctor he was due in the bar room at eight o'clock in the morning. The bar room was in a slum in the Bowery, and he had only been able to keep himself in health by getting up at five o'clock and going for long walks in the Central Park. A sea voyage is what you want, said the doctor. Why not go to Ireland for two or three months? You will come back a new man. I'd like to see Ireland again. And he began to wonder how the people at home were getting on. The doctor was right. He thanked him, and three weeks afterwards he landed in Cork. As he sat in the railway carriage he recalled his native village. He could see it and its lake, and then the fields one by one, and the roads. He could see a large piece of rocky land, some three or four hundred acres of headland, stretching out into the winding lake. Upon this headland the peasantry had been given permission to build their cabins by the former owners of the Georgian house standing on the pleasant green hill. The present owners considered the village a disgrace, but the villagers paid high rents for their plots of ground, and all the manual labour that the big house required came from the village the gardeners, the stable helpers, the house and kitchen maids. Bryden had been thirteen years in America, and when the train stopped at his station, he looked round to see if there were any changes in it. It was just the same blue limestone station house as it was thirteen years ago. The platform and the sheds were the same, and there were five miles of road from the station to Duncannon. The sea voyage had done him good, but five miles were too far for him to-day. The last time he had walked the road, he had walked it in an hour and a half, carrying a heavy bundle on a stick. He was sorry he did not feel strong enough for the walk. The evening was fine, and he would meet many people coming home from the fair, some of whom he had known in his youth, and they would tell him where he could get a clean lodging. But the carman would be able to tell him that, he called the car that was waiting at the station, and soon he was answering questions about America. But he wanted to hear of those who were still living in the old country, and after hearing the stories of many people he had forgotten, he heard that Mike Scully, who had been away in a situation for many years as a coachman in the King's County, had come back and built a fine house with a concrete floor. Now there was a good loft in Mike Scully's house, and Mike would be pleased to take in a lodger. Bryden remembered that Mike had been in a situation at the big house. He had intended to be a jockey, but had suddenly shot up into a fine, tall man, and had to become a coachman instead. Bryden tried to recall the face, but he could only remember a straight nose and a somewhat dusky complexion. Mike was one of the heroes of his childhood, and now his youth floated before him, and he caught glimpses of himself, something that was more than a phantom and less than a reality. Suddenly his reverie was broken. The carman pointed with his whip, and Bryden saw a tall, finely built, middle-aged man coming through the gates, and the driver said, There's Mike Scully. Mike had forgotten Bryden even more completely than Bryden had forgotten him, and many aunts and uncles were mentioned before he began to understand. "'You've grown into a fine man, James,' he said, looking at Bryden's great width of chest. "'But you are thin in the cheeks, and you're very sallow in the cheeks, too.' "'I haven't been very well lately. That is one of the reasons I have come back. But I want to see you all again.' Bryden paid the carman, wished him Godspeed, and he and Mike divided the luggage between them, Mike carrying the bag and Bryden the bundle, and they walked round the lake, for the townland was at the back of the domain, 
and while they walked james proposed to pay mike ten shillings a week for his board and lodging he remembered the woods thick and well forested now they were wind-worn the drains were choked and the bridge leading across the lake inlet was falling away their way led between long fields where herds of cattle were grazing the road was broken bryden wondered how the villagers drove their carts over it and mike told him that the landlord could not keep it in repair and he would not allow it to be kept in repair out of the rates for then it would be a public road and he did not think there should be a public road through his property at the end of many fields they came to the village and it looked a desolate place even on this fine evening and bryden remarked that the country did not seem to be as much lived in as it used to be it was at once strange and familiar to see the chickens in the kitchen and wishing to re-knit himself to the old habits he begged of mrs scully not to drive them out saying he did not mind them mike told his wife that bryden was born in duncannon and when she heard bryden's name she gave him her hand after wiping it in her apron saying he was heartily welcome only she was afraid he would not care to sleep in a loft why wouldn't i sleep in a loft a dry loft you're thinking a good deal of america over here said he but i reckon it isn't all you think it here you work when you like and you sit down when you like but when you have had a touch of blood poisoning as i had and when you have seen young people walking with a stick you think that there is something to be said for old ireland now won't you be taking a sup of milk you'll be wanting a drink after travelling said mrs scully and when he had drunk the milk mike asked him if he would like to go inside or if he would like to go for a walk maybe it is sitting down you would like to be and they went into the cabin and started to talk about the wages a man could get in america and the long hours of work and after bryden had told mike everything about america that he thought of interest he asked mike about ireland but mike did not seem to be able to tell him much that was of interest they were all very poor poorer perhaps than when he left them i don't think any one except myself has a five pound note to his name bryden hoped he felt sufficiently sorry for mike but after all mike's life and prospects mattered little to him he had come back in search of health and he felt better already the milk had done him good and the bacon and cabbage in the pot sent forth a savoury odour the scullies were very kind they pressed him to make a good meal a few weeks of country air and food they said would give him back the health he had lost in the bowery and when bryden said he was longing for a smoke mike said there was no better sign than that during his long illness he had never wanted to smoke and he was a confirmed smoker it was comfortable to sit by the mild peat fire watching the smoke of their pipes drifting up the chimney and all bryden wanted was to be let alone he did not want to hear of anyone's misfortunes but about nine o'clock a number of villagers came in and their appearance was depressing bryden remembered one or two of them he used to know them very well when he was a boy their talk was as depressing as their appearance and he could feel no interest whatever in them he was not moved when he heard that higgins the stonemason was dead he was not affected when he heard that mary kelly who used to go to do the laundry at the big house had married he was only interested when he heard she had gone to america no he had not met her there america is a big place then one of the peasants asked him if he remembered patsy carabine who used to do the gardening at the big house yes he remembered patsy well patsy was in the poorhouse he had not been able to do any work on account of his arm his house had fallen in he had given up his holding and gone into the poorhouse all this was very sad and to avoid hearing any further unpleasantness bryden began to tell them about america and they sat round listening to him 
but all the talking was on his side. He wearied of it, and looking round the group, he recognised a ragged hunchback with grey hair. Twenty years ago he was a young hunchback, and turning to him, Bryden asked him if he were doing well with his five acres. Ah, not much. This has been a bad season. The potatoes failed. They were watery. There is no diet in them. These peasants were all agreed that they could make nothing out of their farms. Their regret was that they had not gone to America when they were young, and, after striving to take an interest in the fact that O'Connor had lost a mare and foal worth forty pounds, Bryden began to wish himself back in the slum. When they left the house he wondered if every evening would be like the present one. Mike piled fresh sods on the fire, and he hoped it would show enough light in the loft for Bryden to undress himself by. The cackling of some geese in the road kept him awake, and the loneliness of the country seemed to penetrate to his bones and to freeze the marrow in them. There was a bat in the loft, a dog howled in the distance, and then he drew the clothes over his head. Never had he been so unhappy, and the sound of Mike breathing by his wife's side in the kitchen added to his nervous terror. Then he dozed a little, and lying on his back he dreamed he was awake, and the men he had seen sitting round the fireside that evening seemed to him like spectres come out of some unknown region of morass and reedy tarn. He stretched out his hands for his clothes, determined to fly from this house, but remembering the lonely road that led to the station, he fell back on his pillow. The geese still cackled but he was too tired to be kept awake any longer. He seemed to have been asleep only a few minutes when he heard Mike calling him. Mike had come halfway up the ladder and was telling him that breakfast was ready. What kind of breakfast will he give me? Bryden asked himself as he pulled on his clothes. There were tea and hot griddle cakes for breakfast, and there were fresh eggs, there was sunlight in the kitchen, and he liked to hear Mike tell of the work he was going to do in the fields. Mike rented a farm of about fifteen acres. At least ten of it was grass. He grew an acre of potatoes and some corn, and some turnips for his sheep. He had a nice bit of meadow, and he took down his scythe, and as he put the whetstone in his belt, Brighton noticed a second scythe and he asked Mike if he should go down with him and help him to finish the field. You haven't done any mowing this many a year. I don't think you'd be of much help. You'd better go for a walk by the lake, but you may come in the afternoon if you like and help to turn the grass over. Bryden was afraid he would find the lake shore very lonely, but the magic of returning health is sufficient distraction for the convalescent, and the morning passed agreeably. The weather was still and sunny. He could hear the ducks in the reeds. The days dreamed themselves away, and it became his habit to go to the lake every morning. One morning he met the landlord, and they walked together talking of the country, of what it had been, and the ruin it was slipping into. James Bryden told him that ill health had brought him back to Ireland, and the landlord lent him his boat, and Bryden rowed about the islands, and resting upon his oars he looked at the old castles and remembered the prehistoric raiders that the landlord had told him about. He came across the stones to which the lake dwellers had tied their boats, and these signs of ancient Ireland were pleasing to Bryden in his present mood. As well as the great lake, there was a smaller lake in the bog where the villagers cut their turf. This lake was famous for its pike, and the landlord allowed Bryden to fish there, and one evening when he was looking for a frog with which to bait his line, he met Margaret Durkin, driving home the cows for the milking. Margaret was the herdsman's daughter, and she lived in a cottage near the big house, but she came up to the village whenever there was a dance, 
and Bryden had found himself opposite to her in the reels. But until this evening he had had little opportunity of speaking to her, and he was glad to speak to someone, for the evening was lonely, and they stood talking together. "'You're getting your health again,' she said. "'You'll soon be leaving us.' "'I'm in no hurry.' "'You're grand people over there. I hear a man is paid four dollars a day for his work.' "'And how much,' said James, "'has he to pay for his food and for his clothes?' "'Her cheeks were bright, and her teeth small, white, and beautifully even, "'and a woman's soul looked at Bryden out of her soft Irish eyes. "'He was troubled and turned aside, "'and catching sight of a frog looking at him out of a tuft of grass, he said, "'I have been looking for a frog to put upon my pike line.' "'The frog jumped right and left,' and nearly escaped in some bushes, but he caught it and returned with it in his hand. "'It's just the kind of frog a pike will like,' he said. "'Look at its great white belly and its bright yellow back.' And without more ado he pushed the wire to which the hook was fastened through the frog's fresh body, and dragging it through the mouth he passed the hook through the hind legs and tied the line to the end of the wire." I think, said Margaret, I must be looking after my cows. It's time I got them home. Won't you come down to the lake while I set my line? She thought for a moment and said, No, I'll see you from here. He went down to the reedy tarn, and at his approach several snipe got up, and they flew above his head, uttering sharp cries. His fishing rod was a long hazel stick, and he threw the frog as far as he could into the lake. In doing this he roused some wild ducks. A mallard and two ducks got up, and they flew towards the larger lake. Margaret watched them. They flew in a line with an old castle, and they had not disappeared from view when Bryden came towards her, and he and she drove the cows home together that evening. They had not met very often when she said, James, you had better not come here so often calling to me. Don't you wish me to come? Yes, I wish you to come well enough, but keeping company is not the custom of the country, and I don't want to be talked about. Are you afraid the priest would speak against us from the altar? He has spoken against keeping company, but it is not so much what the priest says, for there is no harm in talking. But if you are going to be married, there is no harm in walking out together. Well, not so much, but marriages are made differently in these parts. There is not much courting here. And next day it was known in the village that James was going to marry Margaret Durkin. His desire to excel the boys in dancing had caused a stir of gaiety in the parish and for some time past there had been dancing in every house where there was a floor fit to dance upon, and if the cottager had no money to pay for a barrel of beer, James Bryden, who had money, sent him a barrel so that Margaret might get her dance. She told him that they sometimes crossed over into another parish, where the priest was not so averse to dancing, and James wondered, and next morning at Mass, he wondered at their simple fervour. Some of them held their hands above their head as they prayed, and all this was very new and very old to James Bryden. But the obedience of these people to their priest surprised him. When he was a lad they had not been so obedient, or he had forgotten their obedience, and he listened in mixed anger and wonderment to the priest, who was scolding his parishioners, speaking to them by name, saying that he had heard there was dancing going on in their homes. Worse than that, he said he had seen boys and girls loitering about the roads, and the talk that went on was of one kind, love. He said that newspapers containing love stories were finding their way into the people's houses, stories about love in which there was nothing elevating or ennobling. The people listened, accepting the priest's opinion without question, and their submission was pathetic. 
it was the submission of a primitive people clinging to the religious authority and bryden contrasted the weakness and incompetence of the people about him with the modern restlessness and cold energy of the people he had left behind him one evening as they were dancing a knock came to the door and the piper stopped playing and the dancers whispered someone has told on us it is the priest and the awe-stricken villagers crowded round the cottage fire afraid to open the door but the priest said that if they did not open the door he would put his shoulder to it and force it open bryden went towards the door saying he would allow no one to threaten him priest or no priest but margaret caught his arm and told him that if he said anything to the priest the priest would speak against them from the altar and they would be shunned by the neighbours it was mike scully who went to the door and let the priest in and he came in saying they were dancing their souls into hell i've heard of your goings-on he said of your beer drinking and dancing i will not have it in my parish if you want that sort of thing you had better go to america if that is intended for me sir i will go back to-morrow margaret can follow it isn't the dancing it's the drinking i'm opposed to said the priest turning to bryden well no one has drunk too much sir said bryden but you'll sit there drinking all night and the priest's eyes went towards the corner where the women had gathered and bryden felt that the priest looked on the woman as more dangerous than the porter it's after midnight he said taking out his watch by bryden's watch it was only half past eleven and while they were arguing about the time mrs scully offered bryden's umbrella to the priest for in his hurry to stop the dancing the priest had gone out without his and as if to show bryden that he bore him no ill will the priest accepted the loan of the umbrella for he was thinking of the big marriage fee that bryden would pay him i shall be badly off for the umbrella to-morrow bryden said as soon as the priest was out of the house he was going with his father-in-law to a fair his father-in-law was learning him how to buy and sell cattle and his father-in-law was saying that the country was mending and that a man might become rich in ireland if he only had a little capital bryden had the capital and margaret had an uncle on the other side of the lake who would leave her all he had that would be fifty pounds and never in the village of duncannon had a young couple begun life with so much prospect of success as would james bryden and margaret durkin some time after christmas was spoken of as the best time for the marriage james bryden said that he would not be able to get his money out of america before the spring the delay seemed to vex him and he seemed anxious to be married until one day he received a letter from america from a man who had served in the bar with him this friend wrote to ask bryden if he were coming back the letter was no more than a passing wish to see bryden again yet bryden stood looking at it and everyone wondered what could be in the letter it seemed momentous and they hardly believed him when he said it was from a friend who wanted to know if his health were better he tried to forget the letter and he looked at the worn fields divided by walls of loose stones and a great longing came upon him the smell of the bowery slum had come across the atlantic and had found him out in this western headland and one night he awoke from a dream in which he was hurling some drunken customer through the open doors into the darkness he had seen his friend in his white duck jacket throwing drink from glass into glass amid the din of voices and strange accents he had heard the clang of money as it was swept into the till and his sense sickened for the barroom but how should he tell margaret durkin that he could not marry her she had built her life upon this marriage he could not tell her that he would not marry her yet he must go he felt as if he were being hunted the thought that he must tell margaret that he could not marry her hunted him day after day as a weasel hunts a rabbit 
Again and again he went to meet her with the intention of telling her that he did not love her, that their lives were not for one another, that it had all been a mistake, and that happily he had found out that it was a mistake soon enough. But Margaret, as if she guessed what he was about to speak of, threw her arms about him and begged him to say he loved her, and that they would be married at once. He agreed that he loved her, and that they would be married at once. But he had not left her many minutes before the feeling came upon him that he could not marry her, that he must go away. The smell of the bar-room hunted him down. Was it for the sake of the money that he might make there that he wished to go back? No, it was not the money. What then? His eyes fell on the bleak country on the little fields divided by bleak walls he remembered the pathetic ignorance of the people and it was these things that he could not endure it was the priest who came to forbid the dancing yes it was the priest as he stood looking at the line of the hills the barroom seemed by him he heard the politicians and the excitement of politics was in his blood again he must go away from this place, he must get back to the bar-room. Looking up, he saw the scanty orchard, and he hated the spare road that led to the village, and he hated the little hill at the top of which the village began, and he hated more than all other places the house where he was to live with Margaret Durkin, if he married her. He could see it from where he stood, by the edge of the lake, with twenty acres of pasture land about it, for the landlord had given up part of his domain land to them. He caught sight of Margaret, and he called her to come through the stile. I have just had a letter from America. About the money? she asked. Yes, about the money, but I shall have to go over there. He stood looking at her, seeking for words and she guessed from his embarrassment that he would say to her that he must go to America before they were married. Do you mean, James, you will have to go at once? Yes, he said, at once. But I shall come back in time to be married in August. It will only mean delaying our marriage a month. They walked on a little way, talking and every step he took James felt he was a step nearer the Bowery slum. And when they came to the gate, Bryden said, I must hasten or I shall miss the train. But, she said, you are not going now, you are not going today. Yes, this morning, it is seven miles, I shall have to hurry not to miss the train. And then she asked him if he would ever come back. Yes, he said, I am coming back. If you are coming back, James, why not let me go with you? You could not walk fast enough. We should miss the train. One moment, James. Don't make me suffer. Tell me the truth. You are not coming back. Your clothes, where shall I send them? He hurried away, hoping he would come back. He tried to think that he liked the country he was leaving that it would be better to have a farmhouse and live there with Margaret Durkin than to serve drinks behind a counter in the Bowery. He did not think he was telling her a lie when he said he was coming back. Her offer to forward his clothes touched his heart, and at the end of the road he stood and asked himself if he should go back to her. He would miss the train if he waited another minute, and he ran on and he would have missed the train if he had not met a car. Once he was on the car he felt himself safe. The country was already behind him. The train and the boat at Cork were mere formulae. He was already in America. The moment he landed he felt the thrill of home that he had not found in his native village, and he wondered how it was that the smell of the bar seemed more natural than the smell of fields and the roar of crowds more welcome than the silence of the lake's edge. He offered up a thanksgiving for his escape, and entered into negotiations for the purchase of the barroom. He took a wife, she bore him sons and daughters. The barroom prospered, property came and went, 
he grew old his wife died he retired from business and reached the age when a man begins to feel there are not many years in front of him and that all he has had to do in life has been done his children married lonesomeness began to creep about him in the evening and when he looked into the firelight a vague tender reverie floated up and margaret's soft eyes and name vivified the dusk his wife and children passed out of mind and it seemed to him that a memory was the only real thing he possessed and the desire to see margaret again grew intense but she was an old woman she had married maybe she was dead well he would like to be buried in the village where he was born there is an unchanging silent life within every man that none knows but himself and his unchanging silent life was his memory of margaret durkin the barroom was forgotten and all that concerned it and the things he saw most clearly were the green hillside and the bog lake and the rushes about it and the greater lake in the distance and behind it the blue line of wandering hills end of homesickness Chapter Five of the Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. A letter to Rome. One morning, the priest's housekeeper mentioned, as she gathered up the breakfast things, that Mike Mulhare had refused to let his daughter Catherine marry James Murdoch until he had earned the price of a pig this is bad news said the priest and he laid down the newspaper and he waiting for her all the summer wasn't it in february last that he came out of the poorhouse and the fine cabin he has built for her he'll be that lonesome he'll be going to america to america said the priest Maybe it will be going back to the poor house he'll be, for he'll never earn the price of his passage at the relief works. The priest looked at her for a moment, as if he did not catch her meaning, and then a knock came at the door, and he said, The inspector is here, and there are people waiting for me. And while he was distributing the clothes he had received from Manchester, he argued with the inspector as to the direction the new road should take and when he came back from the relief works there was his dinner he was busy writing letters all the afternoon it was not until he had handed them to the postmistress that his mind was free to think of poor james murdoch who had built a cabin at the end of one of the famine roads in a hollow out of the way of the wind from a long way off the priest could see him digging his patch of bog and when he caught sight of the priest he stuck his spade in the ground and came to meet him he wore a pair of torn corduroy trousers out of which two long naked feet appeared and there was a shirt but it was torn the wind thrilled in a naked breast and the priest thought his housekeeper was right that james must go back to the poorhouse there was a wild look in his eyes and he seemed to the priest like some lonely animal just come out of its burrow his mud cabin was full of peat smoke there were pools of green water about it but it had been dry he said all the summer and he had intended to make a drain it's hard luck your reverence and after building this house for her there's a bit of smoke in the house now but if i got catherine i wouldn't be long making a chimney i told mike he should give catherine a pig for her fortune but he said he would give her a calf when i bought the pig and i said haven't i built a fine house and wouldn't it be a fine one to rear him in and they walked through the bog james talking to the priest all the way for it was seldom he had any one to talk to now i must not take you any further from your digging sure there's time enough said james amn't i there all day i'll go and see mike mulhare myself said the priest 
long life to your reverence and i will try to get you the price of the pig ah tis your reverence that's good to us the priest stood looking after him wondering if he would give up life as a bad job and go back to the poorhouse but while thinking of james murdoch he was conscious of an idea it was still dim and distant but every moment it emerged it was taking shape ireland was passing away in five and twenty years if some great change did not take place ireland would be a protestant country there is no one in this parish except myself who has a decent house to live in he murmured and then an idea broke suddenly in his mind the greek priests were married they had been allowed to retain their wives in order to avert a schism rome had always known how to adapt herself to circumstances and there was no doubt that if rome knew ireland's need of children rome would consider the revocation of the decree that clergy must marry he walked very slowly and looking through the peat stacks he saw st peter's rising above a rim of pearl-coloured mountains and before he was aware of it he had begun to consider how he might write a letter to rome was it not a fact that celibacy had only been made obligatory in ireland in the twelfth century when he returned home his housekeeper was anxious to hear about james murdoch but the priest sat possessed by the thought of ireland becoming a protestant country and he had not moved out of his chair when the servant came in with the tea he drank his tea mechanically and walked up and down the room and it was a long time before he took up his knitting but that evening he could not knit and he laid the stocking aside so that he might think of what good would his letter be a letter from a poor parish priest asking that one of the most ancient decrees should be revoked the pope's secretary would pitch his letter into the waste paper basket the pope would only be told of its contents the cardinals are men whose thoughts move up and down certain narrow ways clever men no doubt but clever men are often the dupe of conventions all men who live in the world accept the conventions as truths and the idea of this change in ecclesiastical law had come to him because he lived in a waste bog but was he going to write the letter he could not answer the question yes he knew that sooner or later he must write this letter instinct he said is a surer guide than logic my letter to rome was a sudden revelation the idea had fallen as it were out of the air and now as he sat knitting by his own fireside it seemed to come out of the corners of the room when you were at rathowen his idea said you heard the clergy lament that the people were leaving the country you heard the bishop and many eloquent men speak on the subject but their words meant little but on the bog road the remedy was revealed to you the remedy lies with the priesthood if each priest were to take a wife about four thousand children would be born within the year forty thousand children would be added to the birth rate in ten years ireland would be saved by her priesthood the truth of his estimate seemed beyond question nevertheless father macturnan found it difficult to reconcile himself to the idea of a married clergy one is always the dupe of prejudice he knew that and went on thinking the priests lived in the best houses eat the best food wear the best clothes they are indeed the flower of the nation and would produce magnificent sons and daughters and who could bring up their children according to the teachings of a holy church as well as priests so did his idea speak to him unfolding itself in rich variety every evening very soon he realized that other advantages would accrue beyond the addition of forty thousand children to the birth rate and one advantage that seemed to him to exceed the original advantage would be the nationalization of religion the formation of an irish catholicism suited to the ideas and needs of the irish people 
In the beginning of the century, the Irish lost their language. In the middle of the century, the characteristic aspects of their religion. He remembered that it was Cardinal Cullen who had denationalized religion in Ireland. But everyone recognized his mistake, and how could a church be nationalized better than by the rescission of the decree? Wives and the begetting of children would attach the priests to the soil of Ireland. It could not be said that anyone loved his country who did not contribute to its maintenance. He remembered that the priests leave Ireland on foreign missions, and he said, every Catholic who leaves Ireland helps to bring about the very thing that Ireland has been struggling against for centuries, Protestantism. This idea talked to him, and one evening it said, religion, like everything else, must be national, and it led him to contrast cosmopolitanism with parochialism. Religion, like art, came out of parishes, he said. Some great force was behind him. He must write. He must write. He dropped the ink over the table and over the paper. He jotted down his ideas in the first words that came to him until midnight. He could see his letter in all its different parts, and when he slept, it floated through his sleep. I must have a clear copy of it before I begin the Latin translation. He had written the English text thinking of the Latin that would come after, and very conscious of the fact that he had written no Latin since he had left Maynooth, and that a bad translation would discredit his ideas in the eyes of the Pope's secretary, who was doubtless a great Latin scholar. The Irish priests have always been good Latinists, he murmured, as he hunted through the dictionary. The table was littered with books, for he had found it necessary to create a Latin atmosphere before beginning his translation. He worked principally at night, and one morning at about three he finished his translation, and getting up from his chair he walked to the whitening window. His eyes pained him, and he decided he would postpone reading over what he had written till morning. His illusions regarding his Latin were broken. He had laid his manuscript on a table by his bedside, and on awakening he had reached out his hand for it, but he had not read a page when he dropped it, and the manuscript lay on the floor while he dressed. He went in to his breakfast, and when he had eaten his breakfast his nerve failed him. He could not bring himself to fetch the manuscript, and it was his housekeeper who brought it to him. Ah, he said, it is tasteless, as the gruel poor James Murdoch is eating. And taking a volume from the table, St. Augustine's Confessions, he said, what diet there is here. He stood reading. There was no idiom. He had used Latin words instead of English. At last he was interrupted by the wheels of a car stopping at his door. Father Meehan! Meehan could revise his Latin. None had written such good Latin at Maynooth as Meehan. My dear Meehan, this is indeed a pleasant surprise. I thought I'd like to see you. I drove over. But... I am not disturbing you. You've taken to reading again, St. Augustine, and you're writing in Latin. Father James's face grew red, and he took the manuscript out of his friend's hand. No, you mustn't look at that. And then the temptation to ask him to overlook certain passages made him change his mind. I was never much of a Latin scholar. And you want me to overlook your Latin for you? But why are you writing in Latin? Because I am writing to the Pope. I was at first a little doubtful, but the more I thought of this letter, the more necessary it seemed to me. And what are you writing to the Pope about? You see, Ireland is going to become a Protestant country. Is it? said Father Meehan, and he listened a little while. Then, interrupting his friend, he said, I've heard enough. Now, I strongly advise you not to send this letter. We have known each other all our lives. Now, my dear MacTurnan. Father Michael talked eagerly, and Father MacTurnan sat listening. 
At last Father Meehan saw that his arguments were producing no effect, and he said, You don't agree with me? It isn't that I don't agree with you. You have spoken admirably from your point of view, but our points of view are different. Take your papers away, burn them. Then, thinking his words were harsh, he laid his hand on his friend's shoulder and said, My dear MacTurnan, I beg of you not to send this letter. Father James did not answer. The silence grew painful, and Father Michael asked Father James to show him the relief works that the government had ordered. They walked to where the poor people were working, but important as these works were, the letter to Rome seemed more important to Father Michael, and he said, My good friend, there isn't a girl that would marry us, now is there? There isn't a girl in Ireland who would touch us with a forty-foot pole. Would you have the Pope release the nuns from their vows? I think exceptions should be made in favour of those in orders, but I think it would be for the good of Ireland if the secular clergy were married. That's not my point. My point is that even if the decree were rescinded, we should not be able to get wives. You've been living too long in the waste, my dear friend. You've lost yourself in a dream. We shouldn't get a penny. Our parishioners would say, why should we support that fellow and his family? That's what they'd say. We should be poor, no doubt, said Father James, but not so poor as our parishioners. My parishioners eat yellow meal, and I eat eggs and live in a good house. We are educated men, and should live in better houses. The greatest saints lived in deserts. And so the argument went on until the time came to say goodbye, and then Father James said, I shall be glad if you will give me a lift in your car. I want to go to the post office. To post your letter? The idea came to me. It came swiftly, like a lightning flash, and I can't believe that it was an accident. If it had fallen into your mind, with the suddenness that it fell into mine, you would believe that it was an inspiration. It would take a good deal to make me believe I was inspired said Father Michael, and he watched Father James go into the post office to register his letter. As he went home, Father James met a long string of peasants returning from their work. The last was Nora Flynn, and the priest blushed deeply. It was the first time he had looked on one of his parishioners in the light of a possible spouse. He entered his house frightened, and when he looked round his parlour, he asked himself if the day would come when he should see Nora Flynn sitting opposite to him in his armchair, and his face flushed deeper when he looked towards the bedroom door, and he fell on his knees and prayed that God's will might be made known to him. During the night he awoke many times, and the dream that had awakened him continued when he had left his bed and he wandered round and round the room in the darkness, seeking a way. At last he reached the window and drew the curtain, and saw the dim dawn opening out over the bog. Thank God, he said, it was only a dream, only a dream. And lying down he fell asleep, but immediately another dream, as horrible as the first appeared, and his housekeeper heard him beating on the walls. Only a dream, only a dream, he said. He lay awake, not daring to sleep, lest he might dream, and it was about seven o'clock when he heard his housekeeper telling him that the inspector had come to tell him they must decide what direction the new road should take. In the inspector's opinion, it should run parallel with the old road. To continue the old road two miles further would involve extra labour, the people would have to go further to their work, and the stones would have to be drawn further. The priest held that the extra labour was of secondary importance. He said that to make two roads running parallel with each other would be a wanton humiliation to the people. But the inspector could not appreciate the priest's arguments. He held that the people were thinking only how they might earn enough money to fill their bellies. 
I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you, said the priest. Better go in the opposite direction and make a road to the sea. Well, your reverence, the government do not wish to engage upon any work that will benefit any special class. These are my instructions. A road to the sea will benefit no one. I see you are thinking of the landlord, but there is no harbour, no boat ever comes into that flat waste sea. Well, your reverence, one of these days a harbour may be made, whereas an arch would look well in the middle of the bog, and the people would not have to go far to their work. No, no, a road to the sea will be quite useless, but its futility will not be apparent, at least not so apparent, and the people's hearts will not be broken. The inspector seemed a little doubtful. But the priest assured him that the futility of the road would satisfy English ministers. And yet these English ministers, the priest reflected, are not stupid men. They are merely men blinded by the theory and prejudice, as all men are, who live in the world. Their folly will be apparent to the next generation, and so on, and so on forever and ever, world without end. And the worst of it is, the priest said, while the people are earning their living on these roads, their fields will be lying idle, and there will be no crops next year. Father McTurnan began to think of the cardinals and the transaction of business in the Vatican. Cardinals and ministers alike are the dupes of convention. Only those who are estranged from habits and customs can think straightforward. If, instead of insisting on these absurd roads, the government would give me the money, I should be able to feed the people at a cost of about a penny a day, and they would be able to sow their potatoes. And if only the cardinals would consider the rescission of the decree on its merits, Ireland would be saved from Protestantism. Some cardinal was preparing an answer. An answer might be even in the post. Rome might not think his answer worthy of an answer. A few days afterwards, the inspector called to show him a letter he had just received from the Board of Works, and Father James had to write many letters and had to go to Dublin, and in the excitement of these philanthropic activities, the emigration question was forgotten. He was talking to the inspector about the possibility of obtaining a harbour when the postman handed him a letter. This is a letter from Father Moran. The bishop wishes to see me. We will continue the conversation tomorrow. It is eight miles to Rathowen, and how much further is the palace? A good seven, said the inspector. You're not going to walk it, your reverence. Why not? In four hours I shall be there. He looked at his boots first and hoped they would hold together, and then he looked at the sky and hoped it would not rain. The sky was dim. All the light seemed to be upon the earth. A soft, vague sunlight floated over the bog. Now and again a yellow hammer rose above the tufts of coarse grass and flew a little way. A line of pearl-coloured mountains showed above the low horizon, and he had walked eight miles before he saw a pine wood. Some hundred yards further on was a green field, but under the green sod there was peat, and a man and a boy were cutting it. The heather appeared again, and he walked ten miles before he was clear of winds and heather. He walked on, thinking of his interview with the bishop, and was nearly at the end of his journey when he noticed that one of his shoes had come unsewn and he stopped at a cabin, and while the woman was looking for a needle and thread, he mopped his face with a great red handkerchief that he kept in the pocket of his threadbare coat, a coat that had once been black, but had grown green with age and weather. He had outwalked himself, and feeling he would be tired and not well able to answer the points that the bishop would raise, he decided to rest a while. The woman had found some beeswax, and he stopped half an hour stitching his shoe under the hawthorn that grew beside the cabin. He was still two miles from the palace, 
and this last two miles proved very long. He arrived footsore and covered with dust, and he was so tired that he could hardly get up from his chair to receive Father Moran when he came into the parlour. You seem to have walked a long way, Father McTurnan. About fifteen miles. I shall be all right presently. I suppose His Grace does not want to see me at once. Well, that's just it. His Grace sent me to say he would see you at once. He expected you earlier. I started the moment I received His Grace's letter. I suppose His Grace wishes to see me regarding my letter to Rome. The secretary hesitated, coughed, and Father McTurnan wondered why Father Moran looked at him so intently. He returned in a few minutes, saying that His Grace was sorry that Father McTurnan had had so long a walk. He hoped that he would rest a while and partake of some refreshment. The servant brought in some wine and sandwiches, and the secretary returned in half an hour. His Grace was now ready to receive him. Father Moran opened the library door, and Father McTurnan saw the bishop, a short, alert man, about fifty-five, with a sharp nose and grey eyes and bushy eyebrows. He popped about the room and gave his secretary many orders. Father McTurnan wondered if the bishop would ever finish talking to his secretary. He seemed to have finished, but a thought suddenly struck him, and he followed his secretary to the door and Father McTurnan began to fear that the Pope had not decided to place the Irish clergy on the same footing as the Greek clergy. If he had, the bishop's interest in these many various matters would have subsided. His mind would be engrossed by the larger issue. On returning from the door, His Grace passed Father McTurnan without speaking to him, and going to his writing table he began to search among his papers. At last Father McTurnan said, Maybe your Grace is looking for my letter to Rome? Yes, said His Grace, do you see it? It's under your Grace's hand, those blue papers. Ah, yes, and His Grace leaned back in his armchair, leaving Father McTurnan standing. Won't you sit down, Father McTurnan, he said casually. You've been writing to Rome, I see, advocating the revocation of the decree of celibacy. There's no doubt the emigration of Catholics is a very serious question. So far you have got the sympathy of Rome, and, I may say, of myself. But am I to understand that it was your fear for the religious safety of Ireland that prompted you to write this letter? What other reason could there be? Nothing was said for a long while, and then the bishop's meaning began to break in his mind. His face flushed and he grew confused. I hope your grace doesn't think for a moment that... I only wanted to know if there is anyone... If your eyes ever went in a certain direction, if your thoughts ever said, well... If the degree is revoked. No, Your Grace, no. Celibacy has been no burden to me, far from it. Sometimes I feared that it was celibacy that attracted me to the priesthood. Celibacy was a gratification rather than a sacrifice. I am glad, said the bishop, and he spoke slowly and emphatically, that this letter was prompted by such impersonal motives. Surely, Your Grace, his Holiness did not suspect. The bishop murmured a euphonious Italian name, and Father McTurnan understood that he was speaking of one of the Pope's secretaries. More than once, said Father McTurnan, I feared that if the decree were revoked, I should not have had sufficient courage to comply with it. And then he told the bishop how he had met Nora Flynn on the road. An amused expression stole into the bishop's face, and his voice changed. I presume you do not contemplate making marriage obligatory. You do not contemplate the suspension of the faculties of those who do not take wives. It seems to me that exception should be made in favour of those in orders, and of course in favour of those who have reached a certain age like your grace. The bishop coughed and pretended to look for some paper which he had mislaid. 
This was one of the many points that I discussed with Father Michael Meehan. Oh, so you consulted Father Meehan, the bishop said, looking up. He came in one day, I was reading over my Latin translation before posting it. I'm afraid the ideas that I submitted to the consideration of His Holiness have been degraded by my very poor Latin. I should have wished Father Meehan to overlook my Latin, but he refused. He begged of me not to send the letter. Father Meehan, said His Grace, is a great friend of yours, yet nothing he could say could shake your resolution to write to Rome. Nothing, said Father McTurnan. The call I received was too distinct and too clear for me to hesitate. Tell me about this call. Father McTurnan told the bishop that the poor man had come out of the workhouse because he wanted to be married, and that Mike Mulhare would not give him his daughter until he had earned the price of a pig, and as I was talking to him I heard my conscience say, no one can afford to marry in Ireland but the clergy. We all live better than our parishioners. And then, forgetting the bishop and talking as if he was alone with his God, he described how the conviction had taken possession of him that Ireland would become a Protestant country if the Catholic emigration did not cease, and he told how his conviction had left him little peace until he had written his letter. The priest talked on until he was interrupted by Father Moran. I have some business to transact with Father Moran now, the bishop said, but you may stay to dinner. You have walked a long way, and you are tired and hungry. But your grace, if I don't start now, I shall not get home until nightfall. A car will take you back, Father McTurnan. I will see to that. I must have some exact information about your poor people. We must do something for them. Father McTurnan and the bishop were talking together when the car came to take Father McTurnan home. And the bishop said, Father McTurnan, you have borne the loneliness of your parish a long while. Loneliness is only a matter of habit, I think, Your Grace. I'm better suited to the place than I am for any other. I don't wish any change, if Your Grace is satisfied with me. No one will look after the poor people better than yourself, Father McTurnan, but, he said, it seems to me there is one thing we have forgotten. You haven't told me if you succeeded in getting the money to buy the pig. Father McTurnan grew very red. I had forgotten it. The relief works. It's not too late. Here's five pounds, and this will buy him a pig. It will indeed, said the priest. It will buy him too. He had left the palace without having asked the bishop how his letter had been received at Rome, and he stopped the car and was about to tell the driver to go back. But no matter, he would hear about his letter some other time. He was bringing happiness to two poor people, and he could not persuade himself to delay their happiness by one minute. He was not bringing one pig, but two pigs, and now Mike Mulhare would have to give him Nora and a calf. And the priest remembered that James Murdoch had said, what a fine house this will be to rear them in. There were many who thought that human beings and animals should not live together, but after all, what did it matter if they were happy? And the priest forgot his letter to Rome in the thought of the happiness he was bringing to two poor people. He could not see Nora Mulhare that night, but he drove down to the famine road, and he and the driver called until they awoke James Murdoch. The poor man came stumbling across the bog, and the priest told him the news. End of A Letter to Rome Chapter 6 of The Untilled Field by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Julia Cahill's Curse In 95 I was agent of the Irish Industrial Society, and I spent three days with Father O'Hara 
making arrangements for the establishment of looms, for the weaving of homespuns, and for acquiring plots of ground, whereupon to build schools where the village girls could practice lace-making. The priest was one of the chief supporters of our movement. He was a wise and tactful man, who succeeded not only in living on terms of friendship with one of the worst landlords in Ireland, but in obtaining many concessions from him. When he came to live in Culloch, the landlord had said to him, what he would like to do would be to run the ploughshare through the town, and to turn Culloch into Bullock. But before many years had passed, Father O'Hara had persuaded this man to use his influence to get a sufficient capital to start a bacon factory. And the town of Culloch possessed no other advantages except an energetic and foreseeing parish priest. It was not a railway terminus, nor was it a seaport. But perhaps, because of his many admirable qualities, Father O'Hara is not the subject of this story. We find stories in the lives of the weak and the foolish and the improvident, and his name occurs here because he is typical of not a few priests I have met in Ireland. I left him early one Sunday morning, and he saying that twenty odd miles lay before me, and my first stopping place would be Ballyglissane, that I could hear mass there at Father Madden's chapel, and after mass I could call upon him, and when I had explained the objects of our society, I could drive to Rathowen, where there was a great gathering of the clergy. All the priests within ten miles round would be there for the consecration of the new church. On an outside car, one divides one's time in moralising on the state of the country, or in chatting with the driver, and as the driver seemed somewhat taciturn, I examined the fields as we passed them. They were scanty fields, drifting from thin grass into bog, and from bog into thin grass again, and in the distance there was a rim of melancholy mountains, and the peasants I saw along the road seemed a counterpart of the landscape. The land has made them, I said, according to its own image and likeness, and I tried to find words to define the yearning that I read in their eyes as we drove past, but I could find no words that satisfied me. Only music can express their yearning, and they have written it themselves in their folk tunes. My driver's eyes were the eyes that one meets everywhere in Ireland, pale, wandering eyes that the land seems to create, and I wondered if his character corresponded to his eyes and with a view to finding if it did, I asked him some questions about Father Madden. He seemed unwilling to talk, but I soon began to see that his silence was the result of shyness rather than dislike of conversation. He was a gentle, shy lad, and I told him that Father O'Hara had said I would see the loneliest parish in Ireland. It's true for him, he answered, and again there was silence. At the end of a mile, I asked him if the land in Father Madden's parish was poor, and he said no, it was the best land in the country, and then I was certain that there was some mystery attached to Father Madden. The road over there is the Meering, and soon after passing this road I noticed that, although the land was certainly better than the land about Culloch, there seemed to be very few people on it and what was more significant than the untilled fields were the ruins, for they were not the cold ruins of twenty or thirty or forty years ago, when the people were evicted and their tillage turned into pasture, but the ruins of cabins that had been lately abandoned. Some of the roof trees were still unbroken, and I said that the inhabitants must have left voluntarily. Sure they did. Aren't we all going to America? Then it was not the landlord. Ah, it's the landlord who'd have them back if he could. And the priest, how does he get his dues? Those on the other side are always sending their money to their friends, and they pay the priest. Sure, why should we be staying? Isn't the most of us over there already? It's more like going home than leaving home. 
I told him we hoped to establish new looms in the country, and that Father O'Hara had promised to help us. Father O'Hara is a great man, he said. Well, don't you think that, with the revival of industries, the people might be induced to stay at home? Sora stay, said he. I could see that he was not so convinced about the depopulation of Father O'Hara's parish as he was about Father Madden's, and I tried to induce him to speak his mind. Well, Your Honour, there's many that think there's a curse on the parish. A curse? And who put the curse on the parish? Isn't that the bell ringing for mass, Your Honour? And listening, I could hear a doleful pealing in the grey sky. Does Father Madden know of this curse? Indeed he does, none better. And does he believe in it? There's many who will tell you that he has been saying masses for the last ten years, that the curse may be taken off the parish. We could now hear the bell tolling quite distinctly, and the driver pointed with his whip, and I could see the cross above the fir trees. And there, he said, is Bridget Coyne, and I saw a blind woman being led along the road. At the moment I supposed he had pointed the woman out because she was blind, though this did not seem a sufficient reason for the note of wonder in his voice. But we were within a few yards of the chapel, and there was no time to ask him who Bridget Coyne was. I had to speak to him about finding stabling for the horse. That, he said, was not necessary. He would let the horse graze in the chapel yard while he himself knelt by the door, so that he could hear mass and keep an eye on his horse. I shall want you half an hour after mass is over. Half an hour, I thought, would suffice to explain the general scope of our movement to Father Madden. I had found that the best way was to explain to each priest in turn the general scope of the movement, and then to pay a second visit a few weeks later. The priest would have considered the ideas that I had put into his head. He would have had time to assimilate them in the interval, and I could generally tell in the second visit if I should find in him a friend, an enemy, or an indifferent. There was something extraordinary in the appearance of Father Madden's church. A few peasants crouched here and there, and among them I saw the blind woman that the driver had pointed out on the road. She did not move during mass, she knelt or crouched with her shawl drawn over her head, and it was not until the acolyte rang the communion bell that she dared to lift herself up. That day she was the only communicant, and the acolyte did not turn the altar cloth over the rails. He gave her a little bit of the cloth to hold, and holding it firmly in her fingers, she lifted up her blind face, and when the priest placed the host on her tongue, she sank back overcome. This blind woman, I said to myself, will be the priest's last parishioner and I saw the priest saying mass in a waste church for the blind woman, everyone else dead or gone. All her days, I said, are spent by the cabin fire hearing of people going to America. Her relations, her brothers and sisters had gone, and every seventh day she is led to hear mass, to receive the host, and to sink back. Today and tomorrow and the next day will be spent brooding over her happiness, and in the middle of the week she will begin to look forward to the seventh day. The blind woman seemed strangely symbolical, and the parish, the priest too. A short, thick-set man with a large bald head, and a fringe of reddish hair. His hands were fat and short, the nails were bitten, the nose was fleshy, and the eyes were small, and when he turned towards the people and said, Pax for Biscom, there was a note of command in his voice. The religion he preached was one of fear. His sermon was filled with flames and gridirons, and ovens and devils with pitchforks, and his parishioners groaned and shook their heads and beat their breasts. I did not like Father Madden or his sermon. I remembered that there were few young people left in his parish, 
and it seemed waste of time to appeal to him for help in establishing industries but it was my business to seek the cooperation of every priest and i could not permit myself such a license as the passing over of any priest what reason could i give that i did not like his sermon or his bald head and after mass i went round to see him in the sacristy the sacristy was a narrow passage and there were two acolytes in it and the priest was taking off his vestments and the people were knocking constantly at the door and the priest had to tell the acolyte what answer to give i had only proposed to myself to sketch the objects of our organization in a general outline to the priest but it was impossible even to do this so numerous were the interruptions when i came to unfold our system of payments the priest said it is impossible for me to listen to you here you had better come round with me to my house the invitation was not quite in accordance with the idea i had formed of the man and while walking across the fields he asked me if i would have a cup of tea with him and we spoke of the new church at rathowen it seemed legitimate to deplore the building of new churches and i mentioned that while the churches were increasing the people were decreasing and i ventured to regret that only two ideas seemed to obtain in ireland the idea of the religious vocation and the idea of emigration i see said father madden you are imbued with all the new ideas but i said you don't wish the country to disappear i do not wish it to disappear he said but if it intends to disappear we can do nothing to prevent it from disappearing everyone is opposed to emigration now but i remember when everyone was advocating it teach them english and emigrate them was the cure now he said you wish them to learn irish and to stay at home and you are quite certain that this time you have found out the true way i live very quietly down here but i hear all the new doctrines besides teaching paddy durkin to feed his pig i hear you are going to revive the gothic music and literature are to follow and among these resurrections there is a good deal of talk about pagan ireland we entered a comfortable well-furnished cottage with a good carpet on the floor and the walls lined with books and on either side of the fireplace there were easy chairs and i thought of the people on the other side he took a pot of tea from the hob and said now let me pour you out a cup of tea and you shall tell me about the looms but i said father madden you don't believe much in the future of ireland you don't take very kindly to new ideas new ideas every ten years there is a new set if i had said teach them irish ten years ago i should have been called a fool and now if i say teach them english and let them go to america i am called a reactionist you have come from father o'hara i could see from the way he said the name that the priests were not friends and he has told you a great many of my people have gone to america and perhaps you heard him say that they have not gone to america for the sake of better wages but because my rule is too severe because i put down crossroad dances father o'hara and i think differently and i have no doubt he thinks he is quite right while we breakfasted father madden said some severe things about father o'hara about the church he had built and the debt that was still upon it i suppose my face told father madden of the interest i took in his opinions for during breakfast he continued to speak his mind very frankly on all the subjects i wished to hear him speak on and when breakfast was over i offered him a cigar and proposed that we should go for a walk on his lawn yes he said there are people who think i am a reactionist because i put down the ball alley the ball alley there used to be a ball alley by the church but the boys wouldn't stop playing ball during mass so i put it down but you will excuse me a moment the priest darted off and i saw him climb down the wall into the road 
he ran a little way along the road calling at the top of his voice and when i got to the wall i saw him coming back let me help you i said i pulled him up and we continued our walk and as soon as he had recovered his breath he told me that he had caught sight of a boy and girl loitering and i hunted them home i asked him why knowing well the reason and he said young people should not loiter along the roads i don't want bastards in my parish it seemed to me that perhaps bastards were better than no children at all even from a religious point of view one can't have religion without life and bastards may be saints in every country i said boys and girls walk together and the only idealism that comes into the lives of peasants is between the ages of eighteen and twenty when young people meet in the lanes and linger by the stiles afterwards hard work in the fields kills aspiration the idealism of the irish people does not go into sex it goes into religion but religion does not help to continue the race and we are anxious to preserve the race otherwise there will be no religion or a different religion in ireland that is not certain later on i asked him if the people still believed in fairies he said that traces of such belief survived among the mountain folk there is a great deal of paganism in the language they wish to revive though it may be as free from protestantism as father o'hara says it is for some reason or other i could see that folklore was distasteful to him and he mentioned casually that he had put a stop to the telling of fairy tales around the fire in the evening and the conversation came to a pause now i won't detain you much longer father madden my horse and car are waiting for me you will think over the establishment of looms you don't want the country to disappear no i don't and though i do not think the establishment of workrooms an unmixed blessing i will help you you must not believe all father o'hara says the horse began to trot and i to think he had said that the idealism of the irish peasant goes into other things than sex if this be true the peasant is doomed i said to myself and i remembered that father madden would not admit that religion is dependent on life and i pondered in this country religion is hunting life to the death in other countries religion has managed to come to terms with life in the south men and women indulge their flesh and turn the key on religious inquiry in the north men and women find sufficient interest in the interpretation of the bible and the founding of new religious sects one can have faith or morals both together seem impossible remembering how the priest had chased the lovers i turned to the driver and asked if there was no courting in the country there used to be courting he said but now it is not the custom of the country any longer how do you make up your marriages the marriages are made by the parents and have often seen it that the young couple did not see each other until the evening before the wedding sometimes not until the very morning of the wedding many a marriage i've seen broken off for half a sovereign well he said if not for half a sovereign for a sovereign one party will give forty-nine pounds and the other party wants fifty and they haggle over that pound and then the boy's father will say well if you won't give the pound you can keep the girl but do none of you ever want to walk out with a young girl i said we're like other people sir we would like it well enough but it isn't the custom of the country and if we did it we would be talked about i began to like my young carmen and his answer to my question pleased me as much as any answer he had yet given me and i told him that father madden objected to the looms because they entailed meetings etc and if he were not present the boys would talk on subjects they should not talk about now do you think it is right for a priest to prevent men from meeting to discuss their business i said turning to the driver determined to force him into an expression of opinion 
It isn't because he thinks the men would talk about things they should not talk about that he is against an organisation. Didn't he tell your honour that things would have to take their course? That is why he will do nothing, because he knows well enough that everyone in the parish will have to leave it, that every house will have to fall. Only the chapel will remain standing, and the day will come when Father Tom will say mass to the blind woman and to no one else. Did you see the blind woman today at mass, sir, in the right-hand corner with the shawl over her head? Yes, I said, I saw her. If any one is a saint, that woman seems to be one. Yes, sir, she is a very pious woman, and her piety is so well known that she is the only one who dared to brave Father Madden. She was the only one who dared to take Julia Cahill to live with her. It was Julia who put the curse on the parish. A curse? But you are joking. No, Your Honour, there was no joke in it. I was only telling you what must come. She put her curse on the village twenty years ago, and every year a roof has fallen in and a family has gone away. And you believe that all this happened on account of Julia's curse? To be sure I do, he said. He flicked his horse pensively with the whip, and my disbelief seemed to disincline him for further conversation. But, I said, who is Julia Cahill, and how did she get the power to lay a curse upon the village? Was she a young woman or an old one? A young one, sir. How did she get the power? Didn't she go every night into the mountains? She was seen one night over yonder and the mountains are ten miles off, and whom would she have gone to see except the fairies, and who could have given her the power to curse the village? But who saw her in the mountains? She would never walk so far in one evening. A shepherd saw her, sir. But he may have been mistaken. He saw her speaking to someone, and nobody for the last two years that she was in this village dared to speak to her but the fairies and the old woman you saw at mass today sir now tell me about julia cahill what did she do it is said sir she was the finest girl in these parts i was only a gossoon at the time about eight or nine but i remember that she was tall sir nearly as tall as you are and she was as straight as one of those poplar trees, he said, pointing to three trees that stood against the sky. She walked with a little swing in her walk, so that all the boys, I have heard, who were grown up used to look after her, and she had fine black eyes, sir, and she was nearly always laughing. This was the time when Father Madden came to the parish. There was courting in it then, and every young man and every young woman made their own marriages, and their marriages were made at the crossroad dancing, and in the summer evenings under the hedges. There was no dancer like Julia. They used to gather about to see her dance, and whoever walked with her under the hedges in the summer could never think about another woman. The village was fairly mad about her. Many a fight there was over her, so I suppose the priest was right. He had to get rid of her, but I think he might not have been so hard upon her as he was. It is said that he went down to her house one evening. Julia's people were well-to-do people. They kept a shop. You might have seen it as we came along the road. Just outside of the village it is. And when he came in, there was one of the richest farmers in the country who was trying to get Julia for his wife. Instead of going to Julia, he had gone to her father. There are two counters in the shop, and Julia was at the other, and she had made many a good pound for her parents in that shop. And he said to the father, Now, what fortune are you going to give with Julia? And the father said there was many a man who would take her without any. And Julia was listening quietly all the while at the opposite counter. The man who had come to marry her did not know what a spirited girl she was, and he went on till he got the father to say that he would give seventy pounds, and thinking he had got him so far, he said, Julia will never cross my doorway unless you give her eighty pounds. 
Julia said never a word. She just sat there listening. And it was then that the priest came in. He listened for a while, and then he went over to Julia and said, Are you not proud to hear that you will have such a fine fortune? And he said, I shall be glad to see you married. I would marry you for nothing, for I cannot have any more of your goings-on in my parish. You are the beginning of the dancing and courting here. The ball alley, too, I am going to put all that down. Julia did not answer a single word to him, and he went over to them that were disputing about the eighty pounds, and he said, Now, why not make it seventy-five? And the father agreed to that, since the priest said it, and the three men thought the marriage was settled. And Father Tom thought that he would get not less than ten pounds for the marrying of her. They did not even think to ask her, and little did they think what she was going to say. And what she said was that she would not marry anyone till it pleased herself, and that she would pick a man out of this parish or out of the next that pleased her. Her husband would marry her, and not so many pounds to be paid when they signed the book or when the first baby was born. This is how marriages are settled now. Well, sir, the priest went wild when he heard Julia speak like this. He had only just come to the parish, and did not know how self-minded Julia was. Her father did, though, and he said nothing. He let Julia and the priest fight it out, and he said to the man who had come to marry her, My good man, you can go your way. You will never get her. I can tell that. And the priest was heard saying, Do you think I am going to let you go on turning the head of every boy in the parish? Do you think I am going to see fighting and quarrelling for you? Do you think I am going to see you first with one boy and then with the other? Do you think I am going to hear stories like I heard last week about poor Peter Carey, who, they say, has gone out of his mind on account of your treatment? No, he said, I will have no more of you. I will have you out of my parish, or I will have you married. Julia tossed her head, and her father got frightened. He promised the priest that she would walk no more with the young men in the evenings, for he thought he could keep her at home, but he might just as well have promised the priest to tie up the winds. Julia was out the same evening with the young man, and the priest saw her and next evening she was out with another, and the priest saw her, and not a bit minded was she at the end of the month to marry any of them. It is said that he went down to speak to her a second time, and again a third time. It is said that she laughed at him. After that there was nothing for him to do but to speak against her from the altar. The old people say there were some terrible things in the sermon. I have heard it said that the priest called her the evil spirit that sets men mad. I don't suppose Father Madden intended to say so much, but once he is started the words come pouring out. The people did not understand half of what he said, but they were very much frightened, and I think more frightened at what they did not understand than at what they did. Soon after that the neighbours began to be afraid to go to buy anything in Cahill's shop. Even the boys who were most mad after Julia were afraid to speak to her, and her own father put her out. No one in the parish would speak to her. They were all afraid of Father Madden. If it had not been for the blind woman you saw in the chapel today, sir, she would have had to go to the poorhouse. The blind woman has a little cabin at the edge of the bog, and there Julia lived. She remained for nearly two years, and had hardly any clothes on her back. But she was beautiful for all that, and the boys, as they came back, sir, from the market, used to look towards the little cabin in the hopes of catching sight of her. They only looked when they thought they were not watched, for the priest still spoke against her. He tried to turn the blind woman against Julia, but he could not do that. The blind woman kept her until money came from America. Some say that she went to America, some say that she joined the fairies, but one morning she surely left the parish. One morning Pat Quinn heard somebody knocking at his window. 
somebody asking if he would lend his cart to take somebody to the railway station. It was five o'clock in the morning, and Pat was a heavy sleeper, and he would not get up, and it is said that she walked barefooted all the way to the station, and that is a good ten miles. But you said something about a curse. Yes, sir. A man who was taking some sheep to the fair saw her. There was a fair that day. He saw her standing at the top of the road. The sun was just above the hill, and looking back, she cursed the village, raising both hands, sir, up to the sun, and since that curse was spoken, every year a roof has fallen in. There was no doubt that the boy believed what he had told me. I could see that he liked to believe the story, that it was natural and sympathetic to him to believe in it, and for the moment I, too, believed in a dancing girl becoming the evil spirit of a village that would not accept her delight. He has sent away life, I said to myself, and now they are following life. It is life they are seeking. It is said, Your Honour, that she has been seen in America, and I am going there this autumn. You may be sure I will keep a lookout for her. But all this is twenty years ago. You will not know her. A woman changes a good deal in twenty years. There will be no change in her, Your Honour. She has been with the fairies. But, sir, we shall be just in time to see the clergy come out of the cathedral after the consecration, he said, and he pointed to the town. It stood in the middle of a flat country, and as we approached it, the great wall of the cathedral rose above dirty and broken cottages, and great masses of masonry extended from the cathedral into the town, and these were the nunnery, its schools and laundry. Altogether, they seemed like one great cloud. When, I said, will a ray from the antique sun break forth and light up this country again? End of Julia Cahill's Curse Chapter 7 of the Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. A Playhouse in the Waste. I had arranged to stay with Father McTurnan till Monday, and had driven many miles along the road that straggles like a grey thread through the brown bog. On either side there were bog holes and great ruts in the road. The horse shied frequently, and once I was preparing to leap from the car, but the driver assured me that the old horse would not leave the road. Only once he was near leaving the road, and the wheel of the car must have gone within an inch of the bog hole. It was the day before Christmas Day, and I was driving the doctor. He saw something, a small white thing, gliding along the road, and he was that scared that the hair rose up and went through his cap. I could not tell from the driver's face whether he was aware of his extravagant speech. He seemed to have already forgotten what he had said, and we drove on through the bog till the dismal distant mountains, and the cry of a plover forced me to speak again. All this parish, then, I said, is Father McTurnan's? Every mile of it, sir, he said, every mile of it. And we see him riding along the roads on his bicycle, going to sick calls buttoned up in his old coat. Do you often come this way? Not very often, sir. No one lives here except the poor people and the priest and the doctor. It is the poorest parish in Ireland and every third or fourth year there's a famine, and they would have died long ago if it had not been for Father James. And how does he help them? Isn't he always writing letters to the government asking for relief works? Do you see those bits of roads? They are the relief works. Where do those roads lead to? Nowhere. The road stops in the middle of the bog when the money is out. 
But, I said, surely it would be better if the money was spent on permanent improvements, on drainage, for instance. The boy did not answer. He called to his horse, and I had to press him for an answer. There is no fall, sir. And the bog is too big, I added, in hope of encouraging conversation. Faith it is, sir. But we are not very far from the sea, are we? About a couple of miles. Well then, I said, couldn't a harbour be made? They were thinking about that, but there's no depth of water, and the engineer said it would be cheaper to send the people to America. Everyone's against emigration now, but the people can't live here. So there is no hope, I said, for home industries, weaving, lace-making. I won't say that. But has it been tried? The candle do be burning in the priest's window till one in the morning, and he sitting up thinking of plans to keep the people at home. Do you see that house, sir? For ain't my whip at the top of the hill? I said I did. Well, that's the playhouse that he built. A playhouse? I said. Yes, sir. Father James hoped that people might come from Dublin to see it. No play like it had ever been acted in Ireland before, sir. This Carmen of mine, I said to myself, is an extraordinary fellow. He has got a story about everyone. He is certainly a legitimate descendant of the old bards. And I leaned across the car and said to him, And was the play performed? No, sir. The priest had been learning them all the summer, but the autumn was on them before they had got it by rote, and a wind came and blew down one of the walls. And couldn't Father McTurnan get money to build it up? Sure, he might have got the money, but where would be the use when there was no luck in it? And who were to act the play? The girls and boys of the parish, and the prettiest girl in all the parish was to play good deeds. So it was a miracle play? I said. Do you see that man there, sir? That's the priest coming out of James Burke's cabin. We should overtake Father McTurnan in a minute or more. There was no time to hear the story, and I was sorry not to have heard the story of the playhouse from the car driver. Father McTurnan got up beside me and told me we were about a mile from his house and that he had dinner for me. He was a tall, thin man, and his pale, wandering eyes reflected the melancholy of the distant mountains. I hope, said the priest, that you're not wet. We have had some showers here. We were caught in a shower coming out of Rathowen, but nothing to signify. Our talk then turned on the consecration of the cathedral. I told him everything I thought would interest him, but all the while I was thinking what kind of house he lived in. I had only seen mud huts for many a mile. Presently he pointed with his umbrella, and I saw a comfortable whitewashed cottage by the roadside. The idea of the playhouse was ringing in my head, and I began to wonder why he did not train a rose-bush against its wall, and a moment after I felt that it was well that he did not. Facing that waste hill, a rose-bush could only seem incongruous. We passed into the house, and seeing the priest's study lined with books, I said, Reading is his distraction. And I looked forward to a pleasant talk about books when we had finished our business talk. And he'll tell me about the playhouse, I said. After dinner, when we had said all we had to say on the possibilities of establishing local industries, the priest got up suddenly. I thought he was going to take a book from the shelves to show me, but he had gone to fetch his knitting, and, without a word of explanation, he began to knit. I saw that he was knitting stockings, and from the rapidity that the needles went to and fro, I guessed that he knitted every evening. It may have been only my fancy, but it seemed to me that the priest answered the questions I addressed to him about his books perfunctorily. It even seemed to me that he wished to avoid literary conversation. Yielding to his wish, or what I believed to be his wish, 
I spoke of practical things, saying that the worst feature of the case was that the Irish no longer cared to live in Ireland. Even the well-to-do want to go away. The people are weary of the country. They have suffered too much. I think that they wish to lose themselves. It will be a pity, the priest said. A sort of natural euthanasia, I said, a wish to forget themselves. It will be a pity, the priest said again, and he began to speak of the seventh century, when Ireland had a religion of her own, an art of her own, and a literature of her own. We drew our chairs closer to the fire, and we spoke of the Cross of Kong and Cormac's Chapel, and began to mourn the race as is customary in these times. The Celt is melting like snow, he lingers in little patches in the corners of the field, and hands are stretched from every side, for it is human to stretch hands to fleeting things, but as well we might try to retain the snow. But as I grew despondent, the priest grew hopeful. No fine race has ever been blotted out. His eyes, I said, are as melancholy as the mountains, but nature has destined him to bring hope to the hopeless. And my delight in his character caused me to forget to ask him about the playhouse. He had started a school for lace-making, but instead of keeping them at home, it had helped them to emigrate. I said that this was the worst feature of the case. But the priest found excellent reasons for thinking that the weaving industry would prove more remunerative. He was sure that if the people could only make a slight livelihood in their own country, they would not want to leave it. He instanced Ireland in the 18th century. The population had been killed off until only two million remained and in the nineteenth century the population stood at eight millions. I listened, letting the priest talk on, delighting in his incurable optimism, and when the servant opened the door and told the priest he was wanted, I saw him put on his old coat grown green with age. I said to myself, no man in the world is better at his own job than this one. Hope is what they want and returning to the study after seeing him off, I stopped suddenly, seeing his eyes filled with kindness as he sat by the deathbed and hearing his kind wisdom. That day I had seen a woman digging in a patch of bog under the grey sky. She wore a red petticoat, a handkerchief was tied round her head, and the moment she caught sight of us she flung down the spade and ran to the hovel and a man appeared with a horn, and he blew the horn, running to the brow of the hill. I asked the driver the reason of their alarm, and he told me that we had been mistaken for the bailiff. This was true, for I saw two little sheep, hardly bigger than geese, driven away. There was a pool of green water about this hovel, and all the hovels in the district were the same, one-roomed hovels full of peat smoke, and on the hearth a black iron pot with traces of some yellow meal stir about in it. The dying man or woman would be lying in a corner on some straw, and the priest would speak a little Irish to these outcast Celts, to those dim people who wander like animals through the waste, I said. The grey sky has blown over these people for so many generations that it has left them bare as the hills. A playhouse for these people, what defiance of nature's law! And watching the shapely sods of turf melting into white ash, I thought of the dim people building the playhouse obedient to the priest, unsuspicious of a new idea. A playhouse must have seemed to them as useless as a road that leads nowhere. The priest told them that people would come to see the play, but the idea of pleasure did not find a way into their minds. The playhouse had fallen. I piled more turf on the fire. The priest did not return, and the moaning of the wind put strange fancies into my head. My driver had spoken of a small white thing gliding along the road, and I regretted I had not asked him more about the apparition, if it were an apparition. 
A little later I wondered why the priest knitted. His room is lined with books. He does not read, he knits. A strange occupation. He never talks about books. I crossed the room to investigate the mystery, and I discovered a heap of woolen stockings. All these he has knitted. But some strange story hangs about him, I said, and I lay awake a long while thinking of the people I should meet on the morrow. And never shall I forget the spectacle. There are degrees in poverty, and I remember two men. Their feet were bare, their shirts were so torn that the curling breast hair was uncovered. They wore brown beards, and their skin was yellow with famine and one of them cried out, The white sun of heaven does not shine upon two poorer men than upon this man and myself. After the meeting they followed us, and the poor people seemed to me strangely anxious to tell of their condition. There were some women among them, they were kept back by the men, and they quarrelled among themselves, disputing who should talk to me. They had seen no one except each other for a long time, and I feared their interest in the looms was a conversational interest. It amused them to talk. The priest brought a bundle of clothes out of the house, and when the distribution was finished, I asked him to come for a walk up the hill and show me the playhouse. Again he hesitated, and I said, You must come, Father McTurnan, for a walk. You must forget the misfortunes of those people for a while. He yielded, and we spoke of the excellence of the road, and he told me that when he had conceived the idea of a playhouse, he had arranged with the inspector that the road should go to the top of the hill. It will not make much difference, he said, for if there is ever a harbour made, the road can be carried over the hill right down to the sea, and the hill, as you say, is not a very steep one. There must be a fine view from the hilltop, and no doubt you often go there to read your breviary. During the building of the playhouse, I often used to be up here, and during the rehearsals I was here every day. I noticed that the tone of his voice never altered. A grey, shallow sea had slowly eaten away the rotten land, and the embay was formed by two low headlands hardly showing above the water at high tide. I thought once, said the priest, that if the play were a great success, a line of flat-bottomed steamers might be built. Pleasant dreams, I said to myself, and he sitting here in the quiet evenings reading his breviary, dreaming of a line of steamships crowded with visitors. He had been reading about the Oberammergau performances, I said to myself, and I spoke about these performances agreeing with him that no one would have dared to predict that visitors would come from all sides of Europe to see a few peasants performing a miracle play in the Tyrol. Come, I said, into the playhouse, let me see how you built it. The building was finished, the walls and the roof were finished, and a stage had been erected at the end of the building but half a wall and some of the roof had fallen upon it, and the rubble had not been cleared away. It would not cost many pounds to repair the damage, I said, and having gone so far, you should give the play a chance. I was anxious to hear if he had discovered any aptitude for acting among the girls and boys who lived in the cabins. I think, said the priest, that the play would have been very fairly acted, and I think that, with a little practice, we might have done as well as they did at Oberammergau. But he was more willing to discuss the play that he had chosen than the talents of those who were going to perform it, and he told me that it had been written in the 14th century in Latin, and that he himself had translated it into Irish. I wonder if it would have been possible to organise an excursion from Dublin. If the performance had been judiciously advertised, Oberammergau in the West. I used to think, said he, it is eight miles from Rathowen, and the road is a bad one, and when they got here there would be no place for them to stay. 
they would have to go all the way back again, and that would be sixteen miles. Yet it was as well to build this playhouse as to make a useless road, a road leading nowhere. While they were building this playhouse, they thought they were accomplishing something. Never before did the poor people do anything except for bare life. Do you know, Father McTurnan, your playhouse touches me to the heart? And I turned and looked. Once pleasure hovered over your parish, but the bird did not alight. Let me start a subscription for you in Dublin. I don't think, said the priest, that it would be possible. Not for me to get fifty pounds? Yes, he said, you might get the money, but I don't think we could ever get up a performance of the play. And why not? I said. You see, the wind came and blew down the wall, and I think they look upon that wind as a manifestation of God's disapproval. The people are very pious, and, looking back, I think they felt that the time they spent in rehearsing might have been better spent. The idea of amusement shocks those who are not accustomed to the idea. The playhouse disturbed them in their ideas. They hear Mass on Sundays, and there are the sacraments, and they remember that they have to die. It used to seem to me a very sad thing to see all the people going to America. It seemed to me the saddest thing in the world to see the poor Celt disappear in America, leaving his own country, leaving his language, and very often his religion. And does it no longer seem to you sad that such a thing should happen? No, not if it is the will of God. God has especially chosen the Irish race to convert the world. No race has provided so many missionaries. No race has preached the gospel more frequently to the heathen, and once we realize that we have to die, and very soon, and that the Catholic Church is the only true church, our ideas about race and nationality fade from us. They come to seem very trite and foolish. We are here not to make life successful and triumphant, but to gain heaven. That is the truth, and it is to the honour of the Irish people that they have been selected by God to preach the truth, even though they lose their nationality in preaching it. I do not expect you to accept these opinions. I know that you think very differently, but living here I have learnt to acquiesce in the will of God. The priest stopped speaking suddenly, like one ashamed of having expressed himself too openly, and soon after we were met by a number of peasants, and the priest's attention was engaged. The inspector of the relief works had to speak to him, and I did not see him again until dinner time. You have given them hope, he said. This was gratifying to hear, and the priest sat listening while I told him of the looms already established in different parts of the country. We talked about half an hour, and then, like one who suddenly remembers, the priest got up and fetched his knitting. Do you knit every evening? I have got into the way of knitting lately. It passes the time. But do you never read? I asked, and I looked towards the bookshelves. I used to read a great deal, but there wasn't a woman in the parish that could turn a heel properly, so that I had to learn to knit. Do you like knitting better than reading? I asked, feeling ashamed of my curiosity. I have constantly to attend sick calls, and if one is absorbed in a book one experiences a certain reluctance in putting it aside. The people are very inconsiderate. Now, why did that man put off coming to fetch you till eleven o'clock last night? He knew his wife was ill. Sometimes one is apt to think them inconsiderate. The two volumes of miracle plays. Yes, and that's another danger. A book puts all kinds of ideas and notions into one's head. The idea of that playhouse came out of those books. But, I said, you do not think that God sent the storm because he did not wish a play to be performed? One cannot judge God's designs. Whether God sent the storm or whether it was an accident must remain a matter for conjecture. 
but it is not a matter of conjecture that one is doing certain good by devoting oneself to one's daily task getting the government to start new relief works establishing schools for weaving the people are entirely dependent upon me and when i am attending there once i know i am doing right all the rest is conjecture the priest asked for some further information regarding our system of payments and i answered eagerly i had begun to feel my curiosity to be disgraceful and it was unnecessary my driver would tell me tomorrow why the playhouse had been abandoned i relied on him to tell me he was one of those who had the faculty for hearing things he had heard that i had been up the hill with the priest to see the playhouse he knew all about my walk with the priest and he was soon telling me that it was the curse of the widow sheridan that had brought down the wind that had wrecked the playhouse for it was her daughter that the priest had chosen to play the part of good deeds in the miracle play and the story the driver told me seemed true to the ideas of the primitive people who lived in the waste and of the waste itself the girl had been led astray one evening returning from rehearsal in the words of my car driver she had been weak going down one evening and when the signs of her wakeness began to show upon her her mother took the halter off the cow and tied the girl to the wall and kept her there until the child was born and mrs sheridan put a bit of string round its throat and buried it one night near the playhouse and it was three nights after that the storm rose and the child was seen pulling the thatch out of the roof but did she murder the child sorrow one of me knows she sent for the priest when she was dying and told him what she had done but the priest would not reveal what he heard in the confessional i said mrs sheridan didn't die that night not till the end of the week and the neighbors heard her talking about the child that she buried and then they all knew what the white thing was that they had seen by the roadside and the night that the priest left her he saw the white thing standing in front of him and if he hadn't been a priest he would have dropped down dead but he knew well enough that it was the unbaptized child and he took some water from the bog hole and dashed it over it saying i baptize thee in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost the driver told his story like one saying his prayers and he seemed to have forgotten that he had a listener and the ghost hasn't been seen again i said no not that i know of i don't like your story i said i liked the story about julia cahill better well they're both true one's as true as the other and julia and margaret are in america once a woman is wake she must go to america it must have been a great shock to the priest faith it was sir to meet an unbaptized child on the roadside and that child the only bastard that has ever been born in the parish so tom mulhare says and he's the oldest man in the county it was altogether a very queer idea this playhouse it was indeed sir a queer idea but you see he's a queer man he has been always thinking of something to do good and it is said that he thinks too much father james is a very queer man your honour at the end of a long silence interrupted now and then by the melancholy cry with which he encouraged his horse he began another story how father james mcturnan had written to the pope asking that priests might marry so afeard was he that the catholics were going to america and the country would become protestant and there's james murdoch's cabin and he is the man that got the five pounds that the bishop gave father james to buy a pig for mike mulhare would not give his daughter to james murdoch until he could show him a pig and when i asked him how he knew all these things he said there isn't many days in the year that the old grey horse and myself don't do five and twenty miles and i'm often in and out of rathowen there is no doubt i said to myself that this car driver is the legitimate descendant of the ancient bards
End of A Playhouse in the Waste Chapter 8 of The Untilled Field by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Wedding Gown It was said, but with what truth I cannot say, that the Roach property had been owned by the O'Dwyers many years ago, several generations past, sometime in the 18th century. Only a faint legend of this ownership remained. Only once had young Mr. Roach heard of it, and it was from his mother he had heard it. Among the country people it was forgotten. His mother had told him that his great-great-grandfather, who had made large sums of money abroad, had increased his property by purchase from the O'Dwyers, who then owned, as well as farmed, the hillside on which the big house stood. The O'Dwyers themselves had forgotten that they were once much greater people than they now were, but the master never spoke to them without remembering it, for though they only thought of themselves as small farmers, dependents on the squire, every one of them, boys and girls alike, retained an air of high birth, which at the first glance distinguished them from the other tenants of the estate. Though they were not aware of it, some sense of their remote origin must have survived in them, and I think that in a still more obscure way some sense of it survived in the countryside, for the villagers did not think worse of the O'Dwyers because they kept themselves aloof from the pleasures of the village and its squabbles. The O'Dwyers kept themselves apart from their fellows without any show of pride, without wounding anyone's feelings. The head of the family was a man of forty, and he was the trusted servant, almost the friend, of the young master. He was his bailiff and his steward, and he lived in a pretty cottage by the edge of the lake. The O'Dwyer's aunts, they were old women of sixty-eight and seventy, lived in the big house. The elder had been cook, and the younger housemaid and both were now past their work and they lived full of gratitude to the young master to whom they thought they owed a great deal he believed the debt to be all on his side and when he was away he often thought of them and when he returned home he went to greet them as he might go to the members of his own family the family of the o'dwyers was long lived and betty and mary had a sister far older than themselves Margaret Kerwin, Granny Kerwin, as she was called, and she lived in the cottage by the lake with her nephew Alec O'Dwyer. She was over eighty. It was said that she was nearly ninety, but her age was not known exactly. Mary O'Dwyer said that Margaret was nearly twenty years older than she, but neither Betty nor Mary remembered the exact date of their sister's birth. They did not know much about her, for though she was their sister, she was almost a stranger to them. She had married when she was sixteen, and had gone away to another part of the country, and they had hardly heard of her for thirty years. It was said that she had been a very pretty girl, and that many men had been in love with her, and it was known for certain that she had gone away with the son of the gamekeeper of the grandfather of the present Mr. Roche so you can understand what a very long while ago it was, and how little of the story of her life had come to the knowledge of those living now. It was certainly sixty years since she had gone away with this young man. She had lived with him in Meath for some years, nobody knew exactly how many years, maybe some nine or ten years, and then he had died suddenly and his death, it appears, had taken away from her some part of her reason. It was known for certain that she left me after his death, and had remained away many years. She had returned to me about twenty years ago, though not to the place she had lived in before. Some said she had experienced misfortunes so great that they had unsettled her mind. She herself had forgotten her story, and one day news had come to Galway, news, but it was sad news, that she was living in some very poor cottage on the edge of Navan town, where her strange behaviour and her strange life 
had made a scandal of her. The priest had to inquire out her relations, and it took him some time to do this, for the old woman's answers were incoherent, but he at length discovered she came from Galway, and he had written to the O'Dwyers. And immediately on receiving the priest's letter, Alec sent his wife to Navan, and she had come back with the old woman. And it was time indeed I went to fetch her, she said. The boys in the town used to make game of her and follow her and throw things at her, and they nearly lost the poor thing the little reason that was left to her. The rain was coming in through the thatch, there was hardly a dry place in the cabin, and she had nothing to eat but a few scraps that the neighbours gave her. Latterly she had forgotten how to make a fire, and she ate the potatoes the neighbours gave her raw, and on her back there were only a few dirty rags. She had no care for anything, except for her wedding gown. She kept that in a box covered over with paper, so that no damp should get to it and she was always folding it and seeing that the moths did not touch it, and she was talking of it when I came in at the door. She thought that I had come to steal it from her. The neighbours told me that that was the way she always was, thinking that someone had come to steal her wedding gown. This was all the news of Margaret Kerwin that Alec O'Dwyer's wife brought back with her. The old woman was given a room in the cottage and though with food and warmth and kind treatment she became a little less bewildered, a little less like a wild hunted creature, she never got back her memory sufficiently to tell them all that had happened to her after her husband's death. Nor did she seem as if she wanted to try to remember. She was garrulous only of her early days when the parish bells rang for her wedding and the furze was in bloom. This was before the big house on the hill had been built. The hill was then a fine pasture for sheep, and Margaret would often describe the tinkling of the sheep bells in the valley, and the yellow furs, and the bells that were ringing for her wedding. She always spoke of the bells, though no one could understand where the bells came from. It was not customary to ring the parish bell for weddings, and there was no other bell so that it was impossible to say how Margaret could have got the idea into her head that bells were ringing for her when she crossed the hill on her way to the church, dressed in the beautiful gown which the grandmother of the present Mr. Roach had dressed her in, for she had always been the favourite, she said, with the old mistress, a much greater favourite than even her two sisters had ever been. Betty and Mary were then little children, and hardly remembered the wedding, and could say nothing about the bells. Margaret Kerwin walked with a short stick, her head lifted hardly higher than the handle, and when the family were talking round the kitchen fire, she would come among them for a while, and say something to them, and then go away, and they felt they had seen someone from another world. She hobbled now and then as far as the garden gate, and she frightened the peasantry, so strange did she seem among the flowers, so old and forlorn, almost cut off from this world, with only one memory to link her to it. It was the spectral look in her eyes that frightened them, for Margaret was not ugly. In spite of all her wrinkles, the form of the face remained, and it was easy, especially when her little grandniece was by, to see that sixty-five years ago she must have had a long and pleasant face such as one sees in a fox, and red hair like Molly. Molly was sixteen, and her grey dress reached only to her ankles. Everyone was fond of the poor old woman, but it was only Molly who had no fear of her at all and one would often see them standing together beside the pretty paling that separated the steward's garden from the high road. Chestnut trees grew about the house, and china roses over the walls, and in the course of the summer there would be lilies in the garden, and in the autumn hollyhocks and sunflowers. There were a few fruit trees a little further on, and lower down a stream. A little bridge led over the stream into the meadow, and Molly and her grand-aunt used to go as far as the bridge, and everyone wondered what the child and the old woman had to say to each other. 
Molly was never able to give any clear account of what the old woman said to her during the time they spent by the stream. She had tried once to give Molly an account of one long winter when the lake was frozen from side to side. Then there was something running in her mind about the transport of pillars in front of the big house, how they had been drawn across the lake by oxen, and how one of the pillars was now lying at the bottom of the lake. That was how Molly took up the story from her, but she understood little of it. Molly's solicitude for the old woman was a subject of admiration, and Molly did not like to take the credit for such kindness and pity which she did not altogether feel. She had never seen anyone dead, and her secret fear was that the old woman might die before she went away to service. Her parents had promised to allow her to go away when she was eighteen, and she lived in the hope that her aunt would live two years longer, and that she would be saved the terror of seeing a dead body. And it was in this intention that she served her aunt, that she carefully minced the old woman's food and insisted on her eating often, and that she darted from her place to fetch the old woman her stick when she rose to go. When Margaret Kerwin was not in the kitchen, Molly was always laughing and talking, and her father and mother often thought it was her voice that brought the old woman out of her room. So the day Molly was grieving because she could not go to the dance, the old woman remained in her room, and not seeing her at tea-time they began to be afraid, and Molly was asked to go and fetch her aunt. "'Something may have happened to her, mother. I daren't go.' And when old Margaret came into the kitchen towards evening, she surprised everyone by her question. Why is Molly crying? No one else had heard Molly sob, if she had sobbed, but everyone knew the reason of her grief. Indeed, she had been reproved for it many times that day. I will not hear any more about it, said Mrs. O'Dwyer. She has been very tiresome all day. Is it my fault if I cannot give her a gown to go to the dance? And then, forgetting that old Margaret could not understand her, she told her that the servants were having a dance at the big house, and had asked Molly to come to it. But what can I do? She has got no gown to go in. Even if I had the money, there would not be time to send for one now, nor to make one. And there are a number of English servants stopping at the house. There are people from all parts of the country. They have brought their servants with them, and I am not going to see my girl worse dressed than the others, so she cannot go. She has heard all this. She knows it. I have never seen her so tiresome before. Mrs. O'Dwyer continued to chide her daughter, but her mother's reasons for not allowing her to go to the ball, though unanswerable, did not seem to console Molly, and she sat looking very miserable. She has been sitting like that all day, said Mrs. O'Dwyer, and I wish that it were tomorrow, for she will not be better until it is all over. But, mother, I am saying nothing. I will go to bed. I don't know why you are blaming me. I am saying nothing. I can't help feeling miserable. No, she don't look a bit cheerful, the old woman said, and I don't like her to be disappointed. This was the first time that old Margaret had seemed to understand, since she came to live with them, what was passing about her, and they all looked at her, Mrs. O'Dwyer and Alec and Molly. They stood waiting for her to speak again, wondering if the old woman's speech was an accident, or if she had recovered her mind. It is a hard thing for a child at her age not to be able to go to the dance at the big house, now that she has been asked. No wonder Molly is unhappy. I remember the time that I should have been unhappy too, and she is very like me. But Granny, what can I do? She can't go in the clothes she is wearing, and she has only got one other frock, the one she goes to mass in. I can't allow my daughter. But seeing the old woman was about to speak, Alec stopped his wife. Let us hear what she has to say, he whispered. There is my wedding gown. That is surely beautiful enough for anyone to wear. It has not been worn since the day I wore it, when the bells were ringing, and I went over the hill and was married. And I have taken such care of it that it is the same as it was that day. 
Molly will look very nice in it. She will look as I looked that day. No one spoke. Father, mother and daughter stood looking at the old woman. Her offer to lend her wedding gown had astonished them as much as her recovery of her senses. Everything she once had, and there were tales that she had once been rich, had melted away from her. Nothing but this gown remained. How she had watched over it. Since she had come to live with the O'Dwyers, she had hardly allowed them to see it. When she took it out of its box to air it and to strew it with camphor, she closed her room door. Only once had they seen it, and then only for a few moments. She had brought it out to show it, as a child brings its toy. But the moment they had stretched their hands to touch it, she had taken it away, and they had heard her locking the box it was in. But now she was going to lend it to Molly. They did not believe she meant what she was saying. They expected her to turn away and to go to her room, forgetful of what she had said. Even if she were to let Molly put the dress on, she would not let her go out of the house with it. She would change her mind at the last minute. When does this dancing begin? she asked. And when they told her, she said there would be just time for her to dress Molly, and she asked the girl and her mother to come into her room. Mrs. O'Dwyer feared the girl would be put to a bitter disappointment. But if Molly once had the gown on, she would not oblige her to take it off. In my gown you will be just like what I was when the bells were ringing. She took the gown out of its box herself, and the petticoat, and the stockings, and the shoes. There was everything there. The old mistress gave me all these. Molly has got the hair I used to have. She will look exactly like myself. Are they not beautiful shoes? she said. Look at the buckles. They will fit her very well. Her feet are the same size as mine were. And Molly's feet went into the shoes just as if they had been made for her. And the gown fitted as well as the shoes. And Molly's hair was arranged as nearly as possible according to the old woman's fancy, as she used to wear her hair when it was thick and red like a fox's. The girl thought that Granny would regret her gift. She expected the old woman would follow her into the kitchen and ask her to take the things off, and that she would not be able to go to the ball after all. She did not feel quite safe until she was a long way from the house, about half way up the drive. Her mother and father had said that the dance would not be over until maybe six o'clock in the morning, and they offered her the key of the house. But Granny had said that she would sit up for her. I will doze a bit upon a chair. If I am tired, I will lie down upon my bed. I shall hear Molly. I shall not sleep much. She will not be able to enter the house without my hearing her. It was extraordinary to hear her speak like this. And a little frightened by her sudden sanity, they waited up with her until midnight. Then they tried to persuade her to go to bed, to allow them to lock up the house. But she sat looking into the fire, seeming to see the girl dancing at the ball quite clearly. She seemed so contented that they left her, and for an hour she sat dreaming, seeing Molly young and beautiful, dressed in the wedding gown of more than sixty years ago. Dream after dream went by. The fire had burnt low. The sods were falling into white ashes, and the moonlight began to stream into the room. It was the chilliness that had come into the air that awoke her, and she threw several sods of turf onto the fire. An hour passed, and old Margaret awoke for the last time. The bells are ringing, the bells are ringing, she said, and she went to the kitchen door. She opened it and stood in the garden under the rays of the moon. The night of her marriage was just such a night as this one, and she had stood in the garden amid the summer flowers just as she did now. The day is beginning, she said, mistaking the moonlight for the dawn, and, listening, it seemed to her that she heard once more the sound of bells coming across the hill. Yes, the bells are ringing, she said. I can hear them quite clearly, and I must hurry and get dressed. I must not keep him waiting. 
and returning to the house she went to her box where her gown had lain so many years and though no gown was there it seemed to her that there was one and one more beautiful than the gown she had cherished it was the same gown only grown more beautiful it had grown into softer silk into a more delicate colour it had become more beautiful and she held the dream gown in her hands and she sat with it in the moonlight thinking how fair he would find her in it once her hands went to her hair and then she dropped them again i must begin to dress myself i must not keep him waiting the moonlight lay still upon her knees but little by little the moon moved up the sky leaving her in the shadow it was at this moment as the shadows grew denser about old margaret that the child who was dancing at the ball came to think of her who had given her the gown and who was waiting for her it was in the middle of a reel she was dancing and she was dancing it with mr roach that she felt that something had happened to her aunt mr roach she said you must let me go away i cannot dance any more tonight i am sure that something has happened to my aunt the old woman margaret kerwin who lives with us in the lodge it was she who lent me this gown this was her wedding gown and for sixty-five years it has never been out of her possession she has hardly allowed anyone to see it but she said that i was like her and she heard me crying because i had no gown to go to the ball and so she lent me her wedding gown you look very nice molly in the wedding gown and this is only a fancy seeing the girl was frightened and wanted to go he said but why do you think that anything has happened to your aunt she is very old but she is not much older than she was when you left her let me go mr roach i think i must go i feel sure that something has happened to her i never had such a feeling before and i could not have that feeling if there was no reason for it well if you must go she glanced to where the moon was shining and ran down the drive leaving mr roach looking after her wondering if after all she might have had a warning of the old woman's death the night was one of those beautiful nights in may when the moon soars high in the sky and all the woods and fields are clothed in the green of spring but the stillness of the night frightened molly and when she stopped to pick up her dress she heard the ducks chattering in the reeds the world seemed divided into darkness and light the hawthorn trees threw black shadows that reached into the hollows and molly did not dare to go by the path that led through a little wood lest she should meet death there for now it seemed to her that she was running a race with death and that she must get to the cottage before him she did not dare to take the shortcut but she ran till her breath failed her she ran on again but when she went through the wicket she knew that death had been before her she knocked twice receiving no answer she tried the latch and was surprised to find the door unlocked there was a little fire among the ashes and after blowing the sod for some time she managed to light the candle and holding it high she looked about the kitchen auntie are you asleep have the others gone to bed she approached a few steps and then a strange curiosity came over her and though she had always feared death she now looked curiously upon death and she thought that she saw the likeness which her aunt had often noticed yes she said she is like me i shall be like that some day if i live long enough and then she knocked at the door of the room where her parents were sleeping End of the wedding gown Chapter nine of the Untilled Field by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Clerk's Quest. For thirty years, 
Edward Dempsey had worked low down in the list of clerks in the firm of Quinn and Wee. He did his work so well that he seemed born to do it, and it was felt that any change in which Dempsey was concerned would be unlucky. Managers had looked at Dempsey doubtingly and had left him in his habits. New partners had come into the business, but Dempsey showed no sign of interest. He was interested only in his desk. There it was by the dim window. There were his pens. There was his pen wiper. There was the ruler. There was the blotting pad. Dempsey was always the first to arrive and the last to leave. Once in thirty years of service he had accepted a holiday. It had been a topic of conversation all the morning, and the clerks tittered when he came into the bank in the afternoon, saying he had been looking into the shop windows all the morning, and had come down to the bank to see how they were getting on. An obscure, clandestine, taciturn little man occupying in life only the space necessary to bend over a desk, and whose conical head leaned to one side as if in token of his humility. It seemed that Dempsey had no other ambition than to be allowed to stagnate at a desk to the end of his life and this modest ambition would have been realized had it not been for a slight accident, the single accident that had found its way into Dempsey's well-ordered and closely guarded life. One summer's day, when the heat of the areas was rising and filling the open window, Dempsey's somnolescent senses were moved by a soft and suave perfume. At first he was puzzled to say whence it came, then he perceived that it came from the bundle of cheques which he held in his hand, and then that the odiferous paper was a pale pink cheque in the middle of the bundle. He had hardly seen a flower for thirty years, and could not determine whether the odour was that of mignonette or honeysuckle or violet. But at that moment the cheques were called for. He handed them to his superior, and with cool hand and clear brain continued to make entries in the ledger until the bank closed. But that night, just as he was falling asleep, a remembrance of the insinuating perfume returned to him. He wondered whose cheque it was, and regretted not having looked at the signature and many times during the succeeding weeks he paused as he was making entries in the ledger to think if the haunting perfume were rose, lavender or mignonette. It was not the scent of rose, he was sure of that. And a vague swaying of hope began. Dreams that had died or had never been born floated up like things from the depths of the sea, and many old things that he had dreamed about or had never dreamed at all drifted about. Out of the depths of life a hope that he had never known, or that the severe rule of his daily life had checked long ago, began its struggle for life, and when the same sweet odour came again, he knew now it was the scent of heliotrope. His heart was lifted, and he was overcome in a sweet, possessive trouble. He sought for the cheque amid the bundle of cheques, and, finding it, he pressed the paper to his face. The cheque was written in a thin, feminine handwriting, and was signed Henrietta Brown, and the name and the handwriting were pregnant with occult significances in Dempsey's disturbed mind. His hand paused amid the entries, and he grew suddenly aware of some dim, shadowy form, gracile and sweet-smelling as the spring, moist shadow of wandering cloud, emanation of earth, or woman herself, Dempsey pondered, and his absent-mindedness was noticed, and occasioned comment among the clerks. For the first time in his life he was glad when the office hours were over, he wanted to be alone, he wanted to think. He felt he must abandon himself to the new influence that had so suddenly and unexpectedly entered his life. Henrietta Brown, the name persisted in his mind like a half-forgotten, half-remembered tune. 
and in his efforts to realise her beauty he stopped before the photographic displays in the shop windows, but none of the famous or infamous celebrities there helped him in the least. He could only realise Henrietta Brown by turning his thoughts from without and seeking the intimate sense of her perfumed cheques. The end of every month brought a cheque from Henrietta Brown, and for a few moments the clerk was transported and lived beyond himself. An idea had fixed itself in his mind. He knew not if Henrietta Brown was young or old, pretty or ugly, married or single. The perfume and the name were sufficient, and could no longer be separated from the idea now forcing its way through the fissures in the failing brain of this poor little bachelor clerk. That idea of light and love and grace so inherent in man, but which rigorous circumstance had compelled Dempsey to banish from his life. Dempsey had had a mother to support for many years, and had found it impossible to economise. But since her death he had laid by about a hundred and fifty pounds. He thought of this money with awe and, awed by his good fortune, he thought how much more he might save before he was forced to leave his employment, and to have touched a penny of his savings would have seemed to him a sin near to sacrilege. Yet he did not hesitate for a single moment to send Henrietta Brown, whose address he had been able to obtain through the bank books, a diamond brooch which had cost twenty pounds. He omitted to say whence it had come, and for days he lived in a warm wonderment, satisfied in the thought that she was wearing something that he had seen and touched. His ideal was now by him and always, and its dominion was so complete that he neglected his duties at the bank, and was censured by the amazed manager. The change of his condition was so obvious that it became the subject for gossip, and jokes were now beginning to pass into serious conjecturing. Dempsey took no notice, and his plans matured amid jokes and theories. The desire to write and reveal himself to his beloved had become imperative, and after some very slight hesitation, for he was moved more by instinct than by reason, he wrote a letter urging the fatality of the circumstances that separated them, and explaining rather than excusing this revelation of his identity. His letter was full of deference, but at the same time it left no doubt as to the nature of his attachments and hopes. The answer to this letter was a polite note begging him not to persist in this correspondence, and warning him that if he did it would become necessary to write to the manager of the bank. But the return of his brooch did not dissuade Dempsey from the pursuit of his ideal, and as time went by it became more and more impossible for him to refrain from writing love letters and sending occasional presents of jewellery. When the letters and jewellery were returned to him, he put them away carelessly, and he bought the first sparkle of diamonds that caught his fancy, and forwarded ring, bracelet, and earring, with whatever words of rapturous love that came up in his mind. One day he was called into the manager's room, severely reprimanded, and eventually pardoned in consideration of his long and faithful services. But the reprimands of his employers were of no use, and he continued to write to Henrietta Brown, growing more and more careless of his secret, dropping brooches about the office and letters. At last the story was whispered from desk to desk. Dempsey's dismissal was the only course open to the firm, and it was with much regret that the partners told their old servant that his services were no longer required. To their surprise, Dempsey seemed quite unaffected by his dismissal. He even seemed relieved, and left the bank smiling, thinking of Henrietta, bestowing no thought on his want of means. He did not even think of providing himself with money by the sale of some of the jewellery he had about him, nor of going to his lodgings and packing up his clothes. He did not think how he should get to Edinburgh. It was there that she lived. 
he thought of her even to the exclusion of the simplest means of reaching her and was content to walk about the streets in happy mood watching for glimpses of some evanescent phantom at the wood's edge wearing a star on her forehead or catching sight in the wood's depths of a glistening shoulder and feet flying towards the reeds full of happy aspiration he wandered seeking the country through the many straggling villages that hang like children round the skirts of dublin and passing through one of these at nightfall and feeling tired he turned into the bar of an inn and asked for bread and cheese come a long way governor said one of two rough fellows i am going a long way replied dempsey i am going north very far north and what may ye be going north for if i make bold to ask i am going to the lady i love and i am taking her beautiful presents of jewellery the two rough fellows exchanged glances and it is easy to imagine how dempsey was induced to let them have his diamonds so that inquiries might be made of a friend round the corner regarding their value after waiting a little while dempsey paid for his bread and cheese and went in search of the thieves but the face of henrietta brown obliterated all remembrance of thieves and diamonds and he wandered for a few days sustained by his dream and the crusts that his appearance drew from the pitiful at last he even neglected to ask for a crust and foodless followed the beckoning vision from sunrise to sundown it was a soft quiet summer's night when dempsey lay down to sleep for the last time he was very tired he had been wandering all day and threw himself on the grass by the roadside he lay there looking up at the stars thinking of henrietta knowing that everything was slipping away and he passing into a diviner sense henrietta seemed to be coming nearer to him and revealing herself more clearly and when the word of death was in his throat and his eyes opened for the last time it seemed to him that one of the stars came down from the sky and laid its bright face upon his shoulder end of the clark's quest chapter 10 of the untilled field by george moore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian almsgiving as i searched for a penny it began to rain the blind man opened a parcel and i saw that it contained a small tarpaulin cape but the several coats i wore made it difficult to find my change i thought i had better forego my charity that day and i walked quickly away eight or nine hours a day waiting for arms is his earthly lot i said and walking towards the river and leaning on the parapet i wondered if he recognized the passing steps if he recognized my steps and associated them with a penny of what use that he should know the different steps if he knew them there would be anticipation and disappointments but a dog would make life comprehensible and i imagined a companionship a mingling of muteness and blindness and the joy that would brighten the darkness when the dog leaped eagerly upon the blind man's knees i imagined the joy of warm feet and limbs and the sudden poke of the muzzle a dog would be a link to bind the blind beggar to the friendship of life now why has this small blind man with a face as pale as a plant that never sees the sun not a dog a dog is the natural link and the only link that binds the blind beggar to the friendship of life looking round i could see that he was taking off his little cape for it had ceased raining but in a few weeks it would rain every day and the wind would blow from the river in great gusts will he brave another winter i asked myself 
Iron blasts will sweep through the passage. They will find him through the torn shirt and the poor grey trousers, the torn waistcoat, the black jacket and the threadbare overcoat, someone's cast-off garment. Now, he may have been born blind, or he may have become blind. In any case, he has been blind for many years, and if he persists in living, he will have to brave many winters in that passage, for he is not an old man. What instinct compels him to bear his dark life? Is he afraid to kill himself? Does this fear spring from physical or from religious motives, fear of hell? Surely no other motive would enable him to endure his life. In my intolerance for all life but my own, I thought I could estimate the value of the great mockery, and I asked myself angrily why he persisted in living. I asked myself why I helped him to live. It would be better that he should throw himself at once into the river, and this was reason talking to me, and it told me that the most charitable act I could do would be to help him over the parapet. But behind reason there is instinct, and in obedience to an impulse, which I could not weigh or appreciate, I went to the blind man and put money into his hand. The small coin slipped through his fingers, they were so cold that he could not retain it, and I had to pick it from the ground. Thank ye, sir. Can you tell, sir, what time it is? This little question was my recompense. He and I wanted to know the time of day. I asked him why he wanted to know the time, and he told me because that evening a friend was coming to fetch him, and, wondering who that friend might be, and hoping he might tell me, I asked him about his case of pencils, expressing a hope that he sold them. He answered that he was doing a nice bit of trading. The boys about here are a trouble, he said, but the policeman on the beat is a friend of mine, and he watches them and makes them count the pencils they take. The other day they robbed me, and he gave them such a cuffing that I don't think they'll take my pencils again. You see, sir, I keep the money I take for the pencils in the left pocket, and the money that is given to me I keep in the right pocket. In this way I know if my accounts are right when I make them up in the evening. Now where, in what lonely room, does he sit making up his accounts? But not wishing to seem inquisitorial, I turned the conversation. I suppose you know some of the passers-by. Yes, I know a tidy few. There's one gentleman who gives me a penny every day, but he's gone abroad, I hear, and sixpence a week is a big drop. As I had given him a penny a day all the summer, I assumed he was speaking of me, and my sixpence a week meant a day's dinner, perhaps two days' dinner. It was only necessary for me to withhold my charity to give him ease. He would hardly be able to live without my charity, and if one of his other patrons were to do likewise, the world would be freed from a life that I could not feel to be of any value. So do we judge the world if we rely on our reason. But instinct clings like a child, and begs like a child, and my instinct begged me to succour this poor man, to give him a penny every day, to find out what his condition was, and to stop for a chat every time I gave him my penny. I had obeyed my instinct all the summer, and now reason had intervened, reason was in rebellion and for a long time I avoided, or seemed to avoid, the passage where the blind man sat for eight or nine hours, glad to receive, but never asking for alms. I think I forgot the blind man for several months. I only remembered him when I was sitting at home, or when I was at the other side of the town, and sometimes, I thought, I made myself little excuses not to pass through the passage. Our motives are vague, complex, and many, and one is never quite sure why one does a thing. And if I were to say that I did not give the blind man pennies that winter, because I believed it better to deprive him of his means of livelihood and force him out of life than to help him to remain in life and suffer, I should be saying what was certainly untrue. 
yet the idea was in my mind, and I experienced more than one twinge of conscience when I passed through the passage. I experienced remorse when I hurried past him, too selfish to unbutton my coat, for every time I happened to pass him it was raining or blowing very hard, and every time I hurried away trying to find reasons why he bore his miserable life. I hurried to my business, my head full of chatter about St. Simon's Stylites, telling myself that he saw God far away at the end of the sky, his immortal hands filled with immortal recompenses. Reason chattered about the compensation of celestial choirs, but instinct told me that the blind man standing in the stone passage knew of no such miraculous consolations. As the winter advanced, as the winds grew harsher, my avoidance of the passage grew more marked, and one day I stopped to think and ask myself why I avoided it. There was a faint warmth in the sky, and I heard my heart speaking quite distinctly, and it said, Go to the blind man. What matter about your ten minutes' delay? You have been unhappy since you refrained from almsgiving, and the blind beggar can feel the new year beginning. You see, sir, I have added some shirt buttons and studs to the pencils. I don't know how they will go, but one never knows till one tries. Then he told me it was smallpox that destroyed his eyes, and he was only eighteen at the time. You must have suffered very much when they told you your sight was going. Yes, sir, I had the hump for six weeks. What do you mean? It doubled me up, that it did. I sat with my head in my hands for six weeks. And after that? I didn't think any more about it. What was the good? Yes, but it must be difficult not to think, sitting here all alone. One mustn't allow oneself to give way. One would break down altogether if one did. I've some friends, and in the evening I get plenty of exercise. What do you do in the evenings? I turn a hay-cutting machine in a stable. And you're quite contented? I don't think, sir, a happier man than I passes through this gateway once a month. He told me his little boy came to fetch him in the evening. You're married? Yes, sir, and I've got four children. They're going away for their holidays next week. Where are they going? To the sea. It will do them good. A blow on the beach will do them a power of good. And when they come back they will tell you about it? Yes. And do you ever go away for a holiday? Last year I went with a policeman. A gentleman who passed this way, one of my friends, paid four shillings for me. We had a nice dinner in a public house for a shilling, and then we went for a walk. And this year are you going with the policeman? I hope so. A friend of mine gave me half a crown towards it. I'll give you the rest. Thank ye, sir. A soft south wind was blowing, and an instinct as soft and as gentle filled my heart, and I went towards some trees. The new leaves were beginning in the high branches. I was sitting where sparrows were building their nests and very soon I seemed to see further into life than I had ever seen before. We're here, I said, for the purpose of learning what life is, and the blind beggar has taught me a great deal, something that I could not have learnt out of a book, a deeper truth than any book contains. And then I ceased to think, for thinking is a folly when a soft south wind is blowing, and an instinct as soft and as gentle fills the heart. End of Almsgiving Chapter 11 of The Untilled Field by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian So on he fares his mother had forbidden him to stray about the roads, 
and standing at the garden gate, little Ulick Burke often thought he would like to run down to the canal and watch the boats passing. His father used to take him for walks along the towing path, but his father had gone away to the wars two years ago, and standing by the garden gate he remembered how his father used to stop to talk to the lock keepers. Their talk turned often upon the canal and its business, and Ulick remembered that the canal ended in the Shannon, and that the barges met ships coming up from the sea. He was a pretty child with bright blue eyes, soft curls, and a shy winning manner, and he stood at the garden gate thinking how the boats rose up in the locks, how the gate opened and let the boats free and he wondered if his father had gone away to the war in one of the barges. He felt sure if he were going away to the war he would go in a barge, and he wondered if the barges went as far as the war, or only as far as the Shannon. He would like to ask his mother, but she would say he was troubling her with foolish questions, or she would begin to think again that he wanted to run away from home. He wondered, if he were to hide himself in one of the barges, whether it would take him to a battlefield where he would meet his father walking about with a gun upon his shoulder. And leaning against the gatepost, he swung one foot across the other, though he had been told by his mother that he was like one of the village children when he did it. But his mother was always telling him not to do something, and he could not remember everything he must not do. He had been told not to go to the canal lest he should fall in, nor into the field lest he should tear his trousers. He had been told he must not run about in the garden lest he should tread on the flowers, and his mother was always telling him he was not to talk to the school children as they came back from school, though he did not want to talk to them. There was a time when he would have liked to talk to them. Now he ran to the other side of the garden when they were coming home from school but there was no place in the garden where he could hide himself from them unless he got into the dry ditch. The school children were very naughty children. They climbed up the bank and holding on to the paling they mocked at him, and their mockery was to ask him the way to Hill Cottage, for his mother had had the name painted on the gate, and no one else in the parish had given their cottage a name. However, he liked the dry ditch, and under the branches, where the wren had built her nest, Ulick was out of his mother's way, and out of the way of the boys, and lying among the dead leaves he could think of the barges floating away, and of his tall father who wore a red coat and let him pull his moustache. He was content to lie in the ditch for hours, thinking he was a bargeman, and that he would like to use a sail. His father had told him that the boats had sails on the Shannon. If so, it would be easy to sail to the war, and breaking off in the middle of some wonderful war adventure, some tale about his father and his father's soldiers, he would grow interested in the life of the ditch, in the coming and going of the wren, in the chirrup of a bird in the tall larches that grew beyond the paling. Beyond the paling there was a wood full of moss-grown stones and trees overgrown with ivy, and Ulick thought that if he only dared to get over the paling and face the darkness of the hollow on the other side of the paling, he could run across the meadow and call from the bank to a steersman. The steersman might take him away, but he was afraid his mother might follow him on the next barge, and he dreamed a story of barges drawn by the swiftest horses in Ireland but dreams are but a makeshift life. He was very unhappy, and though he knew it was wrong, he could not help laying plans for escape. Sometimes he thought that the best plan would be to set fire to the house, for while his mother was carrying pails of water from the backyard, he would run away. But he did not dare to think out his plan of setting fire to the house, lest one of the spirits which dwelt in the hollow beyond the paling should come and drag him down a hole. One day he forgot to hide himself in the ditch, and the big boy climbed up the bank and asked him to give him some gooseberries, and though Ulick would have feared to gather gooseberries for himself, he did not like to refuse the boy, and he gave him some, 
hoping that the big boy would not laugh at him again. And they became friends, and very soon he was friends with them all, and they had many talks clustered in the corner, the children holding on to the palings, and Ulick hiding behind the hollyhocks ready to warn them. It's all right, she's gone to the village, Ulick said. One day the big boy asked him to come with them. They were going to spear eels in the brook, and he was emboldened to get over the fence and to follow across the meadow, through the hazels, and very soon it seemed to him that they had wandered to the world's end. At last they came to the brook, and the big boy turned up his trousers, and Ulick saw him lifting the stones with his left hand and plunging a fork into the water with his right. When he brought up a struggling eel at the end of his fork, Ulick clapped his hands and laughed, and he had never been so happy in his life before. After a time there were no more stones to raise, and sitting on the bank they began to tell stories. His companions asked him when his father was coming back from the wars, and he told them how his father used to take him for walks up the canal, and he told them how his father used to take him for walks up the canal, and how they used to meet a man who had a tame rat in his pocket. Suddenly the boys and girls started up crying, Here's the farmer, and they ran wildly across the fields. However, they got to the high road long before the farmer could catch them, and his escape enchanted Ulick. Then the children went their different ways, the big boy staying with Ulick, who thought he must offer him some gooseberries. So they crossed the fence together and crouched under the bushes, and ate the gooseberries till they wearied of them. Afterwards they went to look at the bees, and while looking at the insects crawling in and out of their little door, Ulick caught sight of his mother, and she coming towards them. Ulick cried out, but the big boy was caught before he could reach the fence, and Ulick saw that, big as the boy was, he could not save himself from a slapping. He kicked out, and then blubbered, and at last got away. In a moment it would be Ulick's turn, and he feared she would beat him more than she had beaten the boy, for she hated him whereas she was only vexed with the boy. She would give him bread and water. He had often had a beating and bread and water for a lesser wickedness than bringing one of the village boys into the garden to eat gooseberries. He put up his right hand and saved his right cheek, and then she tried to slap him on the left, but he put up his left hand, and this went on until she grew so angry that Ulick thought he had better allow her to slap him, for if she did not slap him at once she might kill him. Down with your hands, sir! Down with your hands, sir! she cried, but before he had time to let her slap him she said, I will give you enough of bees, and she caught one that had just rested on the flower and put it down his neck. The bee stung him in the neck where the flesh is softest, and he ran away screaming, unable to rid himself of the bee. He broke through the hedges of sweet pea, and he dashed through the poppies, trampling through the flower beds until he reached the dry ditch. There is something frightful in feeling a stinging insect in one's back, and Ulick lay in the dry ditch rolling among the leaves in anguish. He thought he was stung all over. He heard his mother laughing, and she called him a coward through an opening in the bushes, but he knew she could not follow him down the ditch. His neck had already begun to swell, but he forgot the pain of the sting in hatred. He felt he must hate his mother, however wicked it might be to do so. His mother had often slapped him, and he heard of boys being slapped, but no one had ever put a bee down a boy's back before. He felt he must always hate her, and creeping up through the brambles to where he could get a view of the garden, he waited until he saw her walk up the path into the house, and then, stealing back to the bottom of the ditch, he resolved to get over the paling. A few minutes after he heard her calling him, and then he climbed the paling, and he crossed the dreaded hollow, stumbling over the old stones. As he crossed the meadow he caught sight of a boat coming through the lock, but the lock-keeper knew him by sight and would tell the bargeman where he came from, and he would be sent home to his mother. 
He ran on, trying to get ahead of the boat, creeping through hedges, frightened lest he should not be able to find the canal. Now he stopped, sure he had lost it. His brain seemed to be giving way, and he ran like a mad child up the bank. Oh, what joy! The canal flowed underneath the bank. The horse had just passed, the barge was coming, and Ulick ran down the bank calling to the bargeman. He plunged into the water, getting through the bulrushes. Half of the barge had passed him, and he held out his hands. The ground gave way, and he went under the water. Green light took the place of day, and when he struggled to the surface, he saw the rudder moving. He went under again, and remembered no more until he opened his eyes and saw the bargeman leaning over him. Now, what ails you to be throwing yourself into the water in that way? Ulick closed his eyes. He had no strength for answering him, and a little while after he heard someone come on board the barge, and he guessed it must be the man who drove the horse. He lay with his eyes closed, hearing the men talking of what they should do with him. He heard a third voice, and guessed it must be a man come up from the cabin. This man said it would be better to take him back to the last lock, and they began to argue about who should carry him. Hulik was terribly frightened, and he was just going to beg of them not to bring him back, when he heard one of them say, it will be easier to leave him at the next lock. Soon after he felt the boat start again, and when Ulick opened his eyes he saw hedges gliding past, and he hoped the next lock was a long way off. Now, said the steersman, since you are awaking out of your faint, you will be telling us where you come from, because we want to send you home again. Oh, he said, from a long way off, the Shannon. The Shannon, said the bargeman, why, that is more than seventy miles away. How did you come up here? It was a dreadful moment. Ulick knew he must give some good answer, or he would find himself in his mother's keeping very soon. But what answer was he to give? It was half accident, half cunning, that made him speak of the Shannon. The steersman said again, the Shannon is seventy miles away. How did you get up here? And by this time Ulick was aware that he must make the bargeman believe he had hidden himself on one of the boats coming up from the Shannon, and that he had given the bargeman some money. And then he burst into tears, and he told them that he had been very unhappy at home, and when they asked him why he had been unhappy, he did not answer, but he promised he would not be a naughty boy any more if they would take him back to the Shannon. He would be a good boy and not run away again. His pretty face and speech persuaded the bargeman to bring him back to the Shannon. It was decided to say nothing about him to the lockkeeper, and he was carried down to the cabin. He had often asked his father if he might see the bargeman's cabin, and his father had promised him that the next time they went to the canal he should go on board a barge and see the cabin. But his father had gone away to the wars. Now he was in the bargeman's cabin, and he wondered if they were going to give him supper, and if he would be a bargeman himself when he grew up to be a man. Some miles further the boat bumped the edge of the bridge, and on the other side of the bridge there was the lock, and he heard the lock gate shut behind the boat, and the water pour into the lock. The lock seemed a long time filling, and he was frightened lest the lockman might come down to the cabin, for there was no place where he could hide. After passing through the lock, one of the men came down to see him, and he was taken on deck, and in the calm of the evening, Ulick came to look upon the bargemen as his good angels. They gave him some of their supper, and when they arrived at the next lock, they made their beds on the deck, the night being so warm. It seemed to Ulick that he had never seen the night before, and he watched the sunset fading streak by streak, and imagined he was the captain of a ship sailing in the Shannon. The stars were so bright that he could not sleep, and it amused him to make up a long story about the bargeman snoring by his side. The story ended with the sunset, 
and then the night was blue all over and raising himself out of his blanket he watched the moonlight rippling down the canal then the night grew grey he began to feel very cold and wrapped himself in his blanket tightly and the world got so white that ulick grew afraid and he was not certain whether it would not be better to escape from the boat and run away while everybody slept he lay awake maturing his little plan seeing the greyness pass away and the sky fill up with pink and fleecy clouds one of the men roused and without saying a word went to fetch a horse from the stables and another went to boil the kettle in the cabin and Ulick asked if he might help him and while he blew the fire he heard the water running into the lock and thought what a fool they were making of the lock keeper and when the boat was well on its way towards the next lock the steersman called him to come up and they breakfasted together Ulick would have wished this life to go on for ever but the following day the steersman said there is only one lock more between this and our last stopping place keep a lookout for your mother's cottage he promised he would and he beguiled them all the evening with pretended discoveries that cabin was his mother's cabin no it was further on he remembered those willow trees Ulick's object was to get as far away from his home as possible, to get as near to the Shannon as he could. "'There's not a mile between us and the Shannon now,' said the steersman. "'I believe you've been telling us a lot of lies, my young man.' Ulick said his mother lived just outside the town. They would see the house when they passed through the last lock, and he planned to escape that night and about an hour before the dawn he got up and glancing at the sleeping men he stepped ashore and ran till he felt very tired and when he could go no further he lay down in the hay in an outhouse a woman found him in the hay some hours after and he told her his story and as the woman seemed very kind he laid some stress on his mother's cruelty he mentioned that his mother had put a bee down his neck and bending down his head he showed her where the bee had stung him she stroked his pretty curls and looked into his blue eyes and she said that anyone who could put a bee down a boy's neck must be a she-devil she was a lone widow longing for someone to look after and in a very short time Ulick was as much loved by his chance mother as he had been hated by his real mother three years afterwards she died and Ulick had to leave the cottage he was now a little over thirteen and knew the ships and their sailors and he went away in one of the ships that came up the river and sailed many times round the coast of ireland and up all the harbours of ireland he led a wild rough life and his flight from home was remembered like a tale heard in infancy until one day as he was steering his ship up the shannon a desire to see what they were doing at home came over him the ship dropped anchor and he went to the canal to watch the boats going home and it was not long before he was asking one of the bargemen if he would take him on board he knew what the rules were and he knew they could be broken and how and he said if they would take him he would be careful the lockman did not see him and the journey began the month was july so the days were as endless and the country was as green and as full of grass as they were when he had come down the canal and the horse strained along the path sticking his toes into it just as he had done ten years ago and when they came to a dangerous place Ulick saw the man who was driving the horse take hold of his tail just as he had seen him do ten years ago i think those are the rushes only there are no trees and the bank does not seem so high and then he said as the bargeman was going to stop his horse no i am wrong it isn't there they went on a few miles further and the same thing happened again at last he said now i am sure it is there and the bargeman called to the man who was driving the horse and stopped him and Ulick jumped from the boat to the bank that was a big leap you took 
said a small boy who was standing on the bank. It is well you didn't fall in. Why did you say that? said Ulick. Is your mother telling you not to go down to the canal? Look at the frog. He's going to jump into the water, said the little boy. He was the same age as Ulick was when Ulick ran away, and he was dressed in the same little trousers and little boots and socks, and he had a little grey cap. Ulick's hair had grown darker now, but it had been as fair and as curly as this little boy's, and he asked him if his mother forbade him to go down to the canal. Are you a bargeman? Do you steer the barge, or do you drive the horse? I'll tell you about the barge, if you tell me about your mother. Does she tell you not to come down to the canal? The boy turned away his head and nodded it. Does she beat you if she catches you here? Oh, no, mother never beats me. Is she kind to you? Yes, she's very kind. She lives up there, and there's a garden to our cottage, and the name Hill Cottage is painted up on the gatepost. Now, said Ulick, tell me your name. My name is Ulick. Ulick? And what's your other name? Ulick Burke. Ulick Burke? said the big Ulick. Well, my name is the same, and I used to live at Hill Cottage too. The boy did not answer. Whom do you live with? I live with mother. And what's her name? Well, Burke is her name, said the boy, but her front name. Catherine. And where's your father? Oh, father's a soldier. He's away. But my father was a soldier too, and I used to live in that cottage. And where have you been ever since? Oh, he said, I've been a sailor. I think I will go to the cottage with you. Yes, said little Ulick, come up and see mother, and you'll tell me where you've been sailing. And he put his hand into the seafarer's. And now the seafarer began to lose his reckoning. The compass no longer pointed north. He had been away for ten years, and coming back he had found his own self, the self that had jumped into the water at this place ten years ago. Why had not the little boy done as he had done and been pulled into the barge and gone away? If this had happened, Ulick would have believed he was dreaming or that he was mad. But the little boy was leading him. Yes, he remembered the way. There was the cottage and its paling and its hollyhocks. And there was his mother coming out of the house and very little changed. Ulick, where have you been? Oh, you naughty boy, and she caught the little boy up and kissed him, and so engrossed was her attention in her little son that she had not noticed the man he had brought home with him. Now, who is this? she said. Oh, mother, he jumped from the boat to the bank, and he will tell you, mother, that I was not near the bank. Yes, mother, he was ten yards from the bank, and now tell me. Do you think you ever saw me before? She looked at him. Oh, it's you. Why, we thought you were drowned. I was picked up by a bargeman. Well, come into the house and tell us what you've been doing. I've been seafaring, he said, taking a chair. But what about this Ulick? He's your brother, that's all. His mother asked him of what he was thinking, and Ulick told her how greatly astonished he had been to find a little boy exactly like himself waiting at the same place. And father? Your father is away. So, he said, this little boy is my brother. I should like to see father. When is he coming back? Oh, she said, he won't be back for another three years. He enlisted again. Mother, said Ulick, you don't seem very glad to see me. I shall never forget the evening we spent when you threw yourself into the canal. You were a wicked child. And why did you think I was drowned? Well, your cap was picked up in the bulrushes. He thought that whatever wickedness he had been guilty of might have been forgiven, 
and he began to feel that if he had known how his mother would receive him, he would not have come home. Well, the dinner is nearly ready. You'll stay and have some with us, and we can make you up a bed in the kitchen. He could see that his mother wished to welcome him, but her heart was set against him now as it had always been. Her dislike had survived ten years of absence. He had gone away and had met with a mother who loved him, and had done ten years hard seafaring. He had forgotten his real mother, forgotten everything except the bee and the hatred that gathered in her eyes when she put it down his back. And that same ugly look he could now see gathering in her eyes, and it grew deeper every hour he remained in the cottage. His little brother asked him to tell him tales about the sailing ships, and he wanted to go down to the canal with Ulick, but their mother said he was to bide here with her. The day had begun to decline. His brother was crying, and he had to tell him a sea story to stop his crying. But mother hates to hear my voice, he said to himself, and he went out into the garden when the story was done. It would be better to go away and he took one turn round the garden and got over the paling at the end of the dry ditch, at the place he had got over it before, and he walked through the old wood where the trees were overgrown with ivy and the stones with moss. In this second experience there was neither terror nor mystery, only bitterness. It seemed to him a pity that he had ever been taken out of the canal, and he thought how easy it would be to throw himself in again. But only children drown themselves because their mothers do not love them. Life had taken a hold upon him, and he stood watching the canal, though not waiting for a boat. But when a boat appeared he called to the man who was driving the horse to stop, for it was the same boat that had brought him from the Shannon. Well, was it all right? the steersman said. Did you find the house? How were they at home? They're all right at home, he said, but father is still away. I am going back. Can you take me? The evening sky opened calm and benedictive, and the green country flowed on. The boat passed by ruins, castles and churches, and every day was alike until they reached the Shannon. End of So On He Fares